Hello and welcome to the UAN 2022 Year End Update. This is Trina Martin and presenting with me today is Robert Walter, Christopher Gath, and Alex Komarowski. And the rest of the UAN team is of course back answering phones and emails like they do on any other day of the week. But we're here to get you through the year in training today. So without further ado, let's begin the UAN Year End Update. Uh, this is our rough schedule for the today. Uh, we're going to be doing, this is your welcome and introduction. This is it. And then we're going to do a short version 2023.1 uh, overview plus talking about things that are important to year end. Just a quick short uh, update on those things. And then the rest of the day we're going to spend going through the best practices. Uh, the best practices is the list of things to do in order to close your year. Uh, so for those that are new, and we've got over 100 new fiscal officers this year that have never closed a year and several who have only closed one year and it's a blur <laughs> it was a year ago so we've got a lot of newbies uh, on the line as well as some seasoned veterans uh, you newbies recognize that our seasoned veterans log in and either watch the webinar attend live or watch the video to refresh their memory about what to do at year end you do this once a year. It is not, you don't remember the whole thing each year. You do want to use the instructions and the training each year. All right. Every year we choose a theme. Uh, the purpose of the theme is not to waste your time. It's to keep you awake. I'm afraid governmental fund accounting is not all that exciting to listen to for six hours. So we found that if we have a theme, it makes you uh, laugh, it keeps you alert, and it does not waste your time. We just do a little transition uh, between our speakers that uh, will liven you up. So uh, this year in June and July, we start talking about the theme we're going to use for this presentation. And we decided we wanted a destination theme. You know, everything's all about destination. So we thought, let's find a nice place we can take everybody for the year in presentation. So it'll be more relaxing. And while we were looking for destinations, we found this island in the South Pacific that was for sale so cheap, Bob, Christopher, Alex, and I pulled our money and we bought this island sight unseen. I mean, there were some wonderful pictures. The price was low and we bought it. Well, come to find out, it's Gilligan's Island. And the reason the island had never sold is because every time somebody went out there to see it, they got stuck there for 10 years. You know, that three-hour tour time warp thing where nobody could get you off the island. Well, we don't have to worry about that. With the magic of year-end, we can get you to UAN Island and back in the same day. You won't even know. You left your seat. You don't pack. Everything you need will be there on the island. So let's sit out on the beach and take a look at year-end. So we are at the year-end resort. We have uh, our nice, cool uh, drink non-alcoholic of course because we're going to be talking about year end we'll have some iced tea or some lemonade delivered any minute now by some helpful uh, person that uh, came with us and we're going to sit in the dappled shade looking at the beach with our sunglasses on so you didn't even have to pack sunglasses and go through these year end so i want you to think of all of these things we're going to talk about today as items on our resort itinerary so while Christopher is going to take you down the zip line to the beach to do some snorkeling, he's also going to be talking about installing 2023.1, opening temp mode, entering your revenue budgets. And then later today, Alex is going to talk about printing your W-2s and 1099s, but he's also taking a group of people out to the coconut grove so you can climb a, you're going to learn this, you're going to climb a coconut tree with a machete in your teeth and then you're going to uh, use that machete to harvest those fresh coconuts and then learn how to slide down that tree safely and use that machete to open those up and then we're going to take those coconuts over to Mary Ann's hut where she used to bake those wonderful coconut cream uh, uh, pies uh, we're getting a lot of questions about people saying they can't see me you're not going to see me. This is this is your year-end software. You you don't need to see me. I'm not worth looking at. So I want you to just look at the slides. That's where the important information is going to be and use your best practices 
to follow along where we are. Um, uh, let's move along. Okay, we're going to have question slides avail uh, coming up in each section. So I'll, we'll do a little bit of talking about some things and then we'll stop and pause for questions. Please keep your questions on task. Listen to the whole section. If you think you might have a question that won't be answered, write it down on your tablet. You, are, you should be at a comfortable desk or a place where you can write that. And if the question is not answered, when we get to the question slide, send it through. Because we'll get about 15 questions at the beginning of a section and find that every one of them were answered in that section. So please wait until the end. If your question was not answered in the presentation, send it through. And keep those questions on task. Uh, we're not going to read a question that is off topic, uh, simply because the whole audience has to listen to something they didn't sign up to watch. So please, let's keep our questions about year end. The support line, email, and phone is going to be open for any questions that we can't answer in the webinar. All right, I have an announcement for UAN libraries. Uh, folks, the state of Ohio libraries have more to do this upcoming beginning of year than anybody, any other type of entity. So we want to talk about what they're facing. They have to change their whole appropriation account structure. Uh, they are eliminating uh, some program codes in the next year. So we have to have, the libraries have to understand what it is they're facing. Now, as we told you back in September uh, and October, all 2022 existing accounts that will later be eliminated are going to be available in 23. So when you open temp mode and you log into 2023, all your account codes are still there and you'll be able to use them. That is not a problem this year. So you get this extra year. All right. In 2023, you're not going to be able to add any new appropriation accounts with a 100 or 200 program. These are being eliminated, so you can't add them. They won't be on a drop-down list to add new. The good news is that's fairly rare. Most people don't have to add a new appropriation account uh, every single year. So if you have a need to add a new appropriation account in 2023, you're going to have to use one of the detailed program codes that we're moving into uh, for all libraries. And I want to point out that LGS is still on track to release those detailed program code descriptions early in 2023. So libraries, let's talk about that deadline. Remember, what I'm talking about now only applies to, to libraries. Uh, libraries, if your county requires the filing of a tax budget, there's your deadline. You have to be prepared to add your new appropriation accounts in the UAN software so they will pull into the 2024 tax budget. So libraries that are associated with a school district file their budgets two months before everybody else. So libraries, if you're associated with a school district, you have got to have those account codes figured out uh, so that you can add them and they'll be in the 2024 tax budget. Those that have the July filing date, uh, like deadline like everybody else, that files the tax budget, uh, you're going to have to have that done before you add the budget worksheet for your July uh, filed budget. Now, counties that don't require the filing of a tax budget, libraries, if you're in one of those counties and you're saying, I can wait till this time next year, please don't. Year-end is busy enough without sho shoving something that difficult into the mix. So what I would like you to do is please just use maybe September 30th as your deadline to get that figured out. You don't have to add those account codes at that time. You can. The software will let you add those new account codes at any time and continue using the current account codes through the end of the year. Uh, but you need to, when you're ready to open up uh, temp mode, for 2024, we're talking about a year from now, you're not going to see any of those old accounts. You won't be able to carry anything over on those. You have to plan how to deal with that, and we'll be happy to work with you on that process. All right, let's talk about the 2020 through overview. All UAN updates have an overview describing the changes in the software. We find that a lot of our clients don't look at that, so they don't realize something has been updated or a new report has been issued. So the overview is going to say something like, all clients have to install version 2023.1. Please do that as soon as possible. Um, it's, it's an install of a version update. It, uh, you can't do anything about year end until that's installed. 
you might as well get it done. And you have to be on version 2022.3 in order to install 23.1. And for those of you who have kept your updates up to date, you already are on 23.1. But remember I said we've got about 100 new fiscal officers. Some of them have been appointed in the last month. They haven't looked at their version yet. So I want you to look. When you're in the UAN software, across that blue banner across the bottom, uh, down the along the right hand side, you'll see this little banner, and it'll show you the version number you're on. You should be on 22.3. That's the current version of the software. If you see 22.1 or 22.2, you are missing some updates, and you won't be able to install 23.1 until you get each of those updates. Uh, in place. So we want you to know that right now because that's something you can take care of right now. Uh, Chris will talk about uh, contacting us and letting us know whether you need a disk or the download and we'll get that to you. But you need to install these uh, so that you're ready for 23.1. Now the 2023.1 overview is always installed on your computer with all the other year-end documents. Uh, so during this presentation we're going to get a whole lot of questions of people saying where do I get the year-end documents? Where do I get the year-end documents? Well, they're installed on your computer as soon as you install the version update. Uh, we also put those on our website. But the overview, as well, will be on our website under software in 2023.1. You cannot download a version update from our website. So you are either going to have a disk in the mail, because you, that's what you're signed up for, or a download email. Uh, is going to come and it will tell you uh, to the instructions to download and install. All right, again, the year end documents are all going to be installed on your computer after you install 23.1. Go ahead and click from your desktop on UAN Tools and then double click on Version Documentation and you will see in that folder a 2023.1. Folder. In that folder are all your year-end documents and the UAN schedule for the entire year. Uh, is that handy? Yes, it is because it will show you our extended hours in January and a little bit of February uh, for both uh, the, the software and the tech. And it will show you all the days that we aren't working in 2023. So which days are holidays, which days uh, we there's a couple days we have half half a day like we end at two instead of five so you want to take a look at that you can print that and keep it handy um, I always put it on the inside of one of the credenza doors so that I could pull open that door and look at that schedule uh, to see if I was working a holiday on a weekend um, there was no uh, support that time so it's going to be right on your computer. The best practices is your handout today, and it is not the complete steps to close the year. This is just a short list of steps to follow in order, uh, because we found that fiscal officers get to year end, and you don't remember. Well, do I have to do I have to have POs closed and reduced before I do that, or do I do I have to put in revenue budgets before I put in appropriations? So we thought we'd put together this list of things to do in order to keep you out of trouble. Because if you do things out of order, skipping around the best practices, you could generate reports with incorrect figures, and sooner or later that's going to cause problems. So we want you to follow these things in the best practices so that you stay on track to doing things once instead of having to do them over again. Now, your best practices also has items with star symbols. And you're at your desk, grab a highlighter, highlight the star symbol items. What those star symbols mean is you better get some advanced work done before you get to this point in time, or you will not be able to complete that step until you stop and gather that information. So please take close look at those star symboled items. Uh, we'll be talking about those today. You'll understand that revenue budgets aren't just going to put themselves in front of you and temporary appropriations aren't going to get adopted by the board unless you have prepared them to be adopted. So there are things that need to be done to be ready for year end. 
The full instructions for year-end are the year-end procedures. These are the in-depth instructions for each step. Now I get a big yellow use the table of contents. So the the year-end procedures are written in such an order as if you are you know what you're doing and now you're ready to close the year. So we found that that was uh, not an intuitive process so we've given you the best practices. So what you want to do is go through the best practices one at a time checking off each step as you go and if you get to a step and you don't understand, remember our newbies that have only done one or no year-end closings in UAN, you're going to be using this. So yes, print the whole 130 some pages. It's necessary. You need it if you're new. Our, our best fiscal officers in the state still print these things that go through and highlight and mark things off. You should do the same. So if I come across a step on the best practices and I don't understand what that step is, I come over to the year-end instructions, the full year-end procedures, and I use the table of contents to find the page number, and I go right to that page number and read the full instructions. Now, you, if you print these out, and I recommend you do, uh, you can print them two-sided. But what you want to look at is right after the cover page, you're going to see a couple of pages that say, read this first. Please read that first. <laughs> Please read those first. These are the most common mistakes people make. So if you read those first, you know in your mind, these are not the things I'm going to do. I'm going to be aware of the traps not to fall into. So wonderful for that. But then put the, I would staple the table of contents right to the top because that's how I'm going to find my page number. So I'm going to find my subject on the table of contents, go to that page, and then read those full instructions. So there is no shortcut to closing a year in a government. It is a process that needs to be carefully considered. So keep your year in procedures and best practices uh, next to you at all times. All right, printing the 1096 and 1099s this year. Uh, we're going to print them just like we always have. You have to purchase the forms. And we always test a variety of vendor forms that are on the market. Uh, they advertise themselves as IRS certified or IRS approved. But we found this year, more than any other year, they're not lining up. <laughs> so UAN is actually printing within the UAN uh, the IRS required guidelines. We have not made any mistakes in that, but what we found is some of the vendors, the IRS did change the form to not be year specific. So you could buy a big package of 1099s and use them for several years as long as the year be begins with two zero <laughs> and you're going to put the last two years in. Uh, it's what's going to print from the software. So we found that more than any other year, you're going to have to customize the layout option so that you're moving the items that will print inside a box. So uh, some people have bought from the same vendor for many years and they've never had to do that. Others have bought uh, from many different vendors and they find that sometimes they have to. But this year we have found lots of them, lots of vendors had. Uh, they're not quite within the IRS guidelines. So we've got instructions how to customize that layout in the year-end procedures, and we have a video on our website Alex is going to talk about later. Now, you have to if you have to send the 1099s, you've got to know whether you need the 1099 miscellaneous and 1099 NEC. UAN can't help you decide. Uh, so that's either a phone call to the IRS. Download the instructions. You can go to the IRS website and download the instructions so you understand the difference between the two. And then purchase the forms for laser printers. Laser printers. This is what UAN has provided is a laser printer. So some of our seasoned veterans keep telling the new fiscal officers, you can order them free online from the IRS. Well, it's hard to find. And we're glad about that because the free ones are tractor feed printer carbonless forms and they don't work with laser printers. You have to take the tractor feeds off and then you have these onion skin very thin paper that will not feed right through a laser printer. Please don't fall into that trap. And we've got so the seasoned veterans say, well I just type them on my correcting Selectric typewriter. Folks, everybody doesn't have a typewriter and they don't want to do more work than they have to. So please purchase the right forms. You need laser printer style. Now they might still have 
an edge on the side that'll be torn off, but that's just to make it feed through the printer as an eight and a half by 11. So if it says it's a laser printer form on the package, you've got the right one. So make sure you're buying the right forms. When you close 2022, all of 2015 year prior year data is going to be purged from the software. Our seasoned veterans know this happens each year. So there's no question that's going to happen. Uh, this year it's the same thing. 15 is going to drop off as we move forward into 2023. And it's not going to happen with temp mode. It will happen when you close 22. So if you you are the fiscal officer that was there in 2015, you ought to know whether you printed those reports already. It's not a question. But everybody who was new since then, you really need to check and see if the former fiscal officer printed the 2015 reports before you ignore this. Because you are going to have to acknowledge, you understand, that there are, <laughs> you are going to lose these records, the ability to print them again. So uh, if you don't want to climb into the storage area with the spiders and uh, dig through the, the boxes that have years of dust on them, then print the 2015 reports before you close the year. Uh, the re refer to the year in procedures for details instructions about retrieving prior year reports, especially you newbies have never had to do that. Uh, you'll need to follow those instructions and use the, the recommended report list we provide uh, for this year for the 2015 reports. So if you don't want to climb in there, just print the things and then put them in a box and stick them in the storage with 2015 year in reports marked on it. And then you will know. And this happens every single year. The oldest year drops off. So this is something that will happen each year. Uh, the 2023 federal and state tax tables have not been changed yet. It's my understanding. Now, you know, everybody doesn't tell me everything that's going on. So it was my understanding those had not been changed yet. The federal and state governments simply do not pay attention to these items until the last minute. And we've already put together and tested this tax tables as they are. Now the fact is, there may not be a change. We don't know until they make that decision. So if either the federal or state or both change the tax tables, we're gonna, we're gonna program that, we're gonna program that into the software, test it, to make sure that everything's working fine, and then we're going to issue an email to every UAN client that has the download and install instructions if the tax tables are changed. And that's an if. We don't know it's going to happen. Now, don't delay posting wages in the new year. I talk to somebody every year who's doing this. Don't delay posting wages in the new year. Your, your government knows they're waiting to the last minute. What that means is they understand that all across the country, that federal tax table affects every single payroll software on the market today. And they know they're doing this at the last minute and payroll softwares have to program it and then issue a release, every single one of them. So don't delay posting wages in the new year waiting for a change because it might not happen. If there is a change, there is nothing to fix. So wages posted before a tax table update don't have anything that need to be fixed accept the change as of the install date. Uh, you could put a stub note on those first wages after the uh, update and say federal or state tax tables changed. You may see a slight difference. Um, other than that, there is nothing to go backwards and fix. The wages posted at that time with the tax table in place are fine. Uh, new in the UAN software, we have added an email field to the user screen. So if you are the only user in the UAN software, then could, do you have to come in and put an email there? No, you don't, but you could. Uh, moving forward, if you add an assistant, some people are laughing because they do this all by themselves. When you add a new user, you could put an email in, but there is nothing required to make you go in and edit those uh, at this point in time. It is only an informational field. See, it's not green. It's not going to be required. It is something you can have if you want it. New regulations for Social Security, W-2 filing for 2022 W-2s. Uh, they warned us this was coming last year. We warned you in the year in uh, last year. Uh, the 10 or more W-2s have to be filed electronically with the Social Security Administration this year. So I know we've had several of our clients who heard this last year and they have already uh, called in and asked some questions and then they got registered and uh, 
figured out how they're going to do things this year in. They are prepared. If you have 10 or more, you have to be to file electronically. Now, some people have four W-2s. Can you file electronically? Absolutely. But you don't have to. It's the 10 or more that have no choice this year. You have to file electronically. Now, if you do not already have a login for the Social Security Administration uh, Business Services Online, that's their SSA BSO website, you need to register now. This is not a moment of registration. It is a period of time for registration with a verification. So you need to get on this. If you are a new fiscal officer, please look in the documentation uh, given to you by the former fiscal officer. They could have been uploading social W-2s for five years. So if they give you a login for the Social Security Administration uh, BSO website, you are already in there. You want to log in. You might have to change the password. Uh, there may be information to complete uh, to correct things, but you will be ready as long as you've got a registration. All right, UAN can help you create the W-2 file for upload. It's a very simple process. Alex is going to talk about that uh, this afternoon, but we can't help you with registration on the SSA BSO website. You're going to have to do that on your own. You're going to have to acquire your BSO number. We can't help you with that and we can't help you with the upload process. We can help you with the UAN software in how to create that W-2 file to upload. So you're going to need to get on this. So the reason I say you want to get on this quickly is registration requires waiting for a code in the mail at your last known address. So if you just took over for a former fiscal officer that has been using their home address on all their communications, then it's going to go to their home address. You're going to have to talk to them. So there is a process for waiting for a code in the mail. Then you have to log back in, put the code in, because they have to verify that's really you, uh, that you are the fiscal officer of that entity. So they, you haven't already registered, get this done immediately, because the whole country is dealing with 10 or more W-2s have to be uploaded this year. It's not just a small little Ohio. Everybody in the country is under these regulations, and it's changed this year for 10 or more. So please get on this right away. Oh, we see some storms coming, and that is bad weather on the horizon because you have unidentified errors entered as an adjusting factor on the bank rack. Now, these things don't go away. If you've been entering an adjusting factor for receipt not in UAN since February, why haven't you posted that receipt? Because that would allow you to clear it and the mistake will be taken care of. So it is not that difficult unless you've been stacking up a bunch of errors, the unidentified errors keep adding on and you haven't reconciled for a long time. Now is the time to get get this fixed. I know some of you new fiscal officers have inherited unreconciled books and you just want to make sure that you're not making any additional mistakes. If you can find and fix the 2022 mistakes, that's a wonderful thing for your audit. If you can't, don't go out of balance anymore and if it's something as simple as receipts not in UAN or payments not in UAN, find out whether or not uh, you can identify that payment. Sometimes there's very good notes about what it is. Uh, we do have some housekeeping videos on our website for folks that can't call into the support line during the day. Uh, under accounting and payroll training, you will find a housekeeping section. And you could go down, let's say, a February, you made a deposit of $2,500, but you only did receipts in the amount of 2000 That means $500 should have been posted, but it wasn't. That's a simple matter of either adjusting a receipt that was posted for the wrong amount or posting the $500 receipt that was left out. And then it gets cleared on the bank reconciliation. So I know a lot of you have already posted your November bank recs. Some of you have not yet. You want to clean up any of those adjusting factors with a November date so that you can clear them and come into December with a fully reconciled balance. All right, do we have any questions? Um, and we've already talked about where the year-end procedures are. They're, they're going to be installed on your computer as soon as you install 23.1, and we will also have them on our website, 
and we depend upon the ID, IT department of the Auditor of State's Office to uh, make those uh, available. So make sure you know, okay, we're not talking about filing online with the IRS yet uh, for the 1099s. Any questions about the uh, registration with the IRS FIRE website, what information is required, you'd have to address with them. Uh, it's not something UAN could help with. So that while it's a good question, uh, Joyce, I don't know the answer. So UAN can't answer a question about what's required when you uh, set up the IRS FIRE website. So 1099s can be filed electronically. It doesn't mean you don't have to buy them and print them uh, on uh, printed forms. But it does mean you can file electronically. Uh, Christopher will be talking about the uh, version update, when that's going to go out the door. Uh, there's a question. Please confirm everyone needs to register with the BSO even though we pay into OPERS. Well, uh, Laura, even though you pay into OPERS, you issue W-2s. W-2s get filed with the Social Security Administration. So it doesn't matter whether everybody pays into OPERS. You still have to issue W-2s, and they have to be filed with the Social Security Administration. If you have 10 or more, you have to file through the BSO website electronically rather than putting them in the mail to the Social Security Administration. Uh, do we have to print the 2015 reports? Linda, uh, if you don't want to print the 2015 reports, that's on you. If you want to save them as PDF, uh, those are supposed to be records kept per your retention schedule. So if your retention se schedule says that you can save things as PDF, then save them as PDF. If it doesn't, you need physical records. Uh, it doesn't matter whether the auditor, auditor requests PDF, you are the fiscal officer of a government type entity and you are required to keep records according to your retention schedule. So it isn't about what UAN will let you do, it is about whether you are keeping the required records. Uh, we are not issuing the slides as handouts today. We found too many people were using the slide handouts as their instructions for year end and we don't do it anymore. You need your best practices and you need your notes and then you will use the real UAN procedures for the full instructions. Again, questions about registering with the Social Security Administration. Is this, do I, do I need this? You have to ask those questions of the Social Security Administration. Uh, most office supply stores sell laser print 1099s and 1096s. You want a package that contains both and of both types, the, the 1099 miscellaneous. Um, every office supply store carries them. Uh, I would think you, I know I used to buy mine at uh, Sam's Club. Lots of vendors have 1099s, but the fact is as you get closer to the end of January, they're hard to find. So snap up those packages uh, as early as you can. Uh, how can I find out what other people signed up for a CD or email? Uh, you're going to have to ask around with the entities in your neighborhood. We, we're, we don't keep that information where it's public. So um, I wouldn't be able to pull up another entity and tell you what they have filed. I'm looking through some questions. If we have less than 10 employees, we don't have to register with the BSO. Well, you don't have to. That's correct. If you have less than 10 employees, you can still mail the W-2s to the Social Security Administration. Or 10 or, you have nine or less, you can uh, mail them. But some people with less than 10 still do the upload because you're sending a lot of secure information through the mail and that's just not a lot of safety these days. So uh, you can mail them. Uh, W-2s will print to paper. We will talk about that during the year-end presentation uh, today. So I'm going to go ahead and move ahead to Chris. Uh, Chris should be preparing to get that zip line uh, ready to go down to the beach. Hey, Chris, are you ready? Yeah, Trina, already here. We've got some great diving set up. I'm hoping to find the remains of the SS Minnow. Excellent. Have a good time, Chris. Okay. So we do see a number of questions on when the 2023.1 is going to be available, and that's going to be available this week. The emails have not been sent out yet, and nothing has been mailed yet. So, of course, with the mail, you're going to have to be a little bit patient this time of year, 
and just because it's a big process on our end to get that many items out. So then with the year-end update, there are two ways of getting it. You can get it through via the disk, or you can get it to download and be able to install. So what happens if your disk does get lost in the mail, a couple weeks go by, it just hasn't arrived? Well, you're going to call or send an email, verifying your entity, of course, to UAN support. Always provide your correct mailing address. Also, even if you do sign up for disks, you can still get a link from us. So all you have to do is request that if you do have the sufficient internet bandwidth. And we'll be able to send you that so you can be able to download it. The disks are not entity dependent. So if you do happen to know a village or township locally that has already received their disk, you could borrow from them. Or if you happen to be the fiscal officer at multiple entities and one of them gets the disk, you can take that disk to your other UAN computers and get it installed. If you do find that you are missing one of the past updates, again, just call or send us an email requesting it and we can either get it out of the disk and mail it to you. Just remember to verify your mailing address or again, we can send um, download links and instructions for those as well. So for the year end update, of course, if you do get a disc, you must make sure that you have a working DVD drive or sufficient internet bandwidth. Those are the only two ways to get the update. You can locate the install instructions and those are either going to be included in the DVD packet that's mailed out to you, or if you get the download link, they're included in the email. Please read and follow the instructions. We get many calls asking what's the password. And the password for all our updates is exactly the same. Now, what are you going to do if when you put in the disk, it doesn't start up automatically? Well, you're going to locate your file explorer. The file explorer looks like a manila envelope. And it's going to be in the taskbar, which is going to be in the lower middle left in the computer. When you click on that, it's going to open up and we're going to be interested in the column down the left hand side. You're going to go down to click on this PC and that's going to bring up your drives and then you'll be able to click on your DVD drive. When you double click there, it's going to pull up install and setup. You're going to be double clicking on the setup exe and that will start the install. Now, the setup program that we use is the same one we've used for many, many years. So you're going to see a date that looks old. And that's going to be perfectly fine because we never need to change the program. We use the same program. It's just the information is going to be new. Now, if you downloaded the link and you're not too sure how to find it after you download it, once again, you'll go to your file explorer. But this time you're going to be selecting your downloads folder. And then you're going to be double clicking on your 2023.1. And then it's going to look exactly the same. And again, you're going to want to set up EXE to start the install. Now, after you get 2023.1 install, temporary mode does not open automatically. So you're going to have to go into the system and just go into your general maintenance year end and then go to your open temporary mode. Now, when you open temporary mode, it's going to bring up this year, and this is the only time that you can rename any withholding names. So you'll want to pause at this screen, double check everything, make sure it's spelled correctly, or if some of the names might be better or possibly have had a little bit of a change. So you'll go into that revised column, make any corrections that are needed, and then hit save. Once you hit save and move past this, you got to wait another year before you can rename them. So that's why we say pause and make sure that you spend a little time on that. So some system messages will always come up. We encourage you to read them. And so this is going to talk a little bit about what 
temporary mode is the ability to log into 2022 and 2023. Of course, not at the same time. So you'll just be working in one year at a time. And whenever you need to work in a different year, you have to log out and log in under the new year. So you'll notice that when you log in, you'll be able to select a different a year to work in. And so in this case, we're going to be selecting 2020, 2023 to work in, even if we're still in December. So we are logging into 2023 and we're in December, which allows us to add new accounts. Now, this isn't something most of you are going to need to do, but we want to make sure that you're aware. If you do, if you are aware that you're going to be getting a new grant and have to add a new fund, a new appropriation accounts, a new revenue accounts, you'll be doing that on in these different sections. You also might have some new vendors for the new year, in which case you're going to be going to your general maintenance, vendors and payee, and add them there. Now, the most important thing, of course, for the 2023 is getting in your new budgets. And again, we can do this still in December, so that way you can have all your budgets ready to go come January 1st. Now, you're gonna to have to wanna to make sure that you know what your budget numbers are. We're gonna to get to that in a minute. So you might take a little while to gather this information. Also, again, we can do this in December. This is what, one of the things that makes temporary mode useful. So we can log into 2023 and get everything set up. This also, depending on how many funds and revenue accounts and appropriation accounts, this can take a little bit of while for all the data entry. So you want to make sure that you allocate enough time and to know that you don't have to do everything all at once. But once you do start a particular fund, you do want to get that completed. So we're going to start with showing you revenue budgets. So what is your revenue budget going to be? Well, that's going to be based off of the 2023 budget that was prepared. So you might already have a printout of that, but just in case you don't, you would be going into your budget transaction into your financial worksheets. And then there you would select your 2023 budget. Now, if your budget was created outside of UAN, then you're just going to have to locate with whatever you used for it because we really can't help you with anything outside of the program. Now, in UAN, when you select your 2023 budget, you don't just want to print. You want to make sure that you include the account codes. If you don't select those account codes there, it's just going to list all your funds and what the budget of the fund is without the breakdown of all your different revenue accounts. When you're ready to add in your revenue budget, you're going to go to accounting, maintenance, revenue budgets, and then you're going to hit add. The system message is going to come up telling you that you can only add it once per fund and that any other changes have to be supplementals. And all this means is once you bring up a fund, you just have to add in what the revenue budget is for all those revenue accounts all at once. And then if you save it without finishing it, you're just going to have to do some type of supplemental budget to get additional numbers in. So after we hit the add revenue budget, we're going to go choosing one fund at a time. In this case, we're going with our gasoline tax. We're gonna enter in the numbers for the two revenue accounts that we happen to have. And then you're gonna be effective date. So your effective date will be January 1st. So temporary appropriations. Now we know not everyone uses temporary appropriations, but most of you do, and your board should be adopting these in December. Any temporary appropriations will take for, take effect in the first January 1st. Temporary appropriations are just appropriations just for the first quarter of 2023, and they're to set up before you get the full year's appropriations done, so that way you can still be able to do payroll and pay all your bills come January 1st, even though you might not know what your full year appropriations are going to be at that time. So to do this, we're going to go to accounting, maintenance, appropriation budgets. And then once we hit add, when you hit add, you'll have the options of selecting temporary appropriation or permanent appropriations. Again, if you one of those 
entities that don't use temporary appropriations. You would just select permanent appropriations here, but most of you will be selecting temporary appropriations. So again, a system message comes up once again, very much like the revenue budget, appropriation budgets can only be entered once per fund. So any additional numbers that need changed after you've saved the fund have to be done either through a reallocation or supplementals. And so just like the revenue account or revenue budgets, we're going to be doing the appropriation budgets, select one fund at a time, and then you're going to be able to enter in what your temporary appropriations are in that column. And so if your appropriations are adopted in December, you're going to be using January 1st. However, if appropriations get adopted at a January meeting, you're going to want to use that date as the effective date. Now, once you get your revenue budget and your appropriation budget set up, you'll be able to start doing your purchase orders. So you're going to be doing accounting, transaction, purchase orders. Now you can do add if you want to add in one at a time, but if you happen to have a lot of blanket certificates or purchase orders, you might want to use the duplicate function. And that's what we're going to look at. So in the duplicate function, you can see there in the upper left, you can organize this. We're going to start by organizing this with your BC regulars and take a look at the both open and closed items. And then we're going to look through these and based off of what was going on last year, we might know what we need and what not. So you're just going to be selecting the ones, enter in your dates, just like you would creating any blanket certificate or purchase order, select the ones that you want to copy over, and then hit OK. Now, the same is going to be true with your um, purchase orders. Again, you're going to select purchase order regular in this case, and we're once again looking at our, both are open and are closed. Always, of course, enter in your dates. And then if you want to, you can select all of them. But some of these you might notice are either going to change or maybe you don't have an EMS contract anymore. It might have expired or maybe you finally paid off that loan. And so you just want to double check these to make sure you're not just automatically keeping the same purchase orders year in and year out because they might not be needed. Once again, you're going to hit OK. Now, when you duplicate, you want to understand this is just a starting point. This is going to be using last year's numbers. It's going to put these numbers in batch so that you can edit them. So make sure that after you get these all saved in batch, you go over the numbers and you adjust them as you need, because perhaps you need more office supplies if more people are going to be in the office this year, or maybe the office has got shut down as you guys sold it off or something. So you just want to take a look at that and look at your own circumstances. So with New Year accounting, that will allow you to do a lot of things in December. So that way, when you go live in January 1st, you're going to be able to have everything set up and be ready to pay your bills, pay your employees, and not have the pressure of getting all your budgets jammed in there in time for that first payroll. So that's one of the things that makes temporary mode so great because you can do things in 2020 in December here, 22, before 23 calendar rolls around. So we're going to take a look and see if we have any questions um, dealing with this section. And so once again, on the 2023 updates, those are going to happen this week, and we're going to get them mailed out this week. So hopefully, depending on how far away you are from Columbus, you will might see it in the mail late this week or possibly early next week. Okay, so we've got a question on changing vendor names. Um, you can't edit a vendor name within the system. You basically have to just add in a new vendor. And then you would edit the 1099 to combine the two if the name is changed. And that'll be covered in a little bit. So yes, you can post and print the 2023 POs in December that are dated January 1st. Yes, you can do that in December with the January 1st. That's the purpose of temporary mode, to get those ready so that way you can start using them immediately. 
So yes, a question, uh, temp- can I use temporary mode, but enter my permanent and appropriations? So temporary mode is just what we call it when you're able to log into 2022 and 2023 and be able to use both years. So, and we know temporary appropriations, some people kind of link the two together, but they are. So yes, you can go directly into your permanent appropriations if that's what you do. Uh, can the temporary mode be tested in training mode? Um, training mode allows you to do everything in the training mode that you can in your live UAN. So once you've updated and opened up training mode in your live UAN, you'll be able to go into temper, you'll be able to go into the training mode and to do everything you would want there. That's a very good question because we really like that training module. Our purchase orders, blanket certificates and super blank, Blanket certificates all able to be duplicated. Yes, they are. Is adding appropriations in 2023, is this where we can add in the new codes for libraries such as payroll? Yes, that is how you would add in and where you would add in the new codes for the libraries. Can you modify the name of a purchase order when you duplicate it? Yes, it'll go into batch and you'll be able to edit it like you normally would. Can permanent appropriations be entered in temporary mode? Yes. All temporary mode is, is the ability to log into 2022 and 2023. Temporary mode goes away once 2022 is actually closed. And more than likely, your permanent appropriations will be set up before that. Does temporary mode become permanent mode on January 1st? No. Uh, Temporary mode, once you open it, only goes away once you close calendar, once you close your 2022 books. And that can happen um, well into 2023. I think Bob is coming back from the huts where he's been experimenting with coconuts. So we're going to be passing this off to him. Hopefully you're ready, Bob. Oh, yeah. Yeah, Chris, let me just climb down from this tree. Uh, it's it's getting kind of i just hit alex on the head with the coconut he's uh, let me wake him up here okay yeah i think we're ready to get started um so chris talked a lot a lot about um what you can do now if uh, in uen or as soon as you install the program and you get temporary mode open for accounting and that's great um by the way if you're following along with the best practices um, handout, a little eight-page eight resource we have for you there. Um, you can turn to page two. We're in the center, page two. And I'm going to cover that section, the, la- the second half of page two in the best practices. You don't have to have that printed out or in front of you. The slides will cover it. it but it's something that we suggest you use uh, when you're actually doing the year end, So, as, as Trina mentioned. So, you know, just like it says here, just like with accounting, while the calendar year may be in December 2022, like it is now, and once you get all that installed and ready to go, well, you can update payroll for 2023, get the ball rolling. In this case, it's a uh, putt-putt ball uh, for a miniature golf, and it's really blazing fast. And So it's amazing what Alex can do when he swings that putter. Although we do have a pile of... Um, uh, like a sand, a sand dune pile of putt-butt balls on the shore, so we got to be careful with that. But you can move ahead with payroll, and this is why temporary mode is so great. You can do it with accounting right now, work in 2023, and with payroll. I'm going to show you five um, areas that you can start working ahead in 2023 by using temporary mode. So take advantage of that, and that's the section we'll cover here at the bottom of page two. But first, a reminder, if you're, you know, this whole, uh, for you new folks, this whole closing process, when you close the year, do not think of it, uh, as we mentioned before, as a one-day thing. This is something, uh, you know, as soon as you get it, the software installed, we encourage you to open temporary mode and start using it. It'll be a process that you're going in and out of uh, the old year and the new year throughout December maybe all the way through January. And some of you, if you have to wait on some information before you close out the fiscal year, maybe you'll be even using it in uh, early February. So temporary mode is something that um, is 
initiated when you log into the software. So say if you leave for lunch and you're working in 2023 and quit the software and come back, when you log in, you just have to remember it's going to default to the old year. So if you want to do work in the new year like we do now, then you're going to need to make sure you log in to 2023. So we'll do that right now. Click that little button, type in our credentials, and away we go. So our first section on page two is uh, to add new earnings or leave benefits, if that's something that we need to do for our employees going into the new year. So to do that, you would go to payroll, maintenance, earnings, and leave, and then you would jump over there and click on the add button. Now, um, this would just be a first step. This would actually be a first, a two-step process. You can see my uh, sample um, earning and leave list uh, part of it um, in the, the list area there. And you, you can see some of those items are not really part of uh, the default set of earnings or leave that we provide to you, uh, you know, as a basic when you start UAN. So some of those things are customized. For instance, a couple of years ago, our fiscal officer um, realized they needed to add a new emergency call over time. And the default is just overtime, but they wanted to have double time for those employees that qualified on emergency call. Um, and, and that was something that's part of our policies. So they added that earning. So that is a possibility. So, um, but I, I'll be honest with you, it's not a really common new year activity as far as from our perspective. We don't get a lot of calls or questions about how to add this. It's usually something that happens throughout the year on different schedules. Things come up and you might need to add another earning or new leave benefit. For the, so for the purpose of our demonstrations today, I think I'm just going to scrap that and move on to the next point, which is a little bit more common adding new withholdings, a little more common at, at the beginning of the year. And um, this is a two-step process, as we'll see a lot of things here in this section. Honestly, it's about maybe a three-step process, depending on what you have preset ahead. But I'm going to call it a two-step process, because for many of you, that may be all you need. So the first step is to add the withholding to your main list of withholdings, the overall list that would possibly be applied to anyone. So payroll, maintenance, and then withholdings is going to show you your overall list. And if it's a brand new withholding that no one at your entity has ever withheld, and it's not in our preset list, like it's not Oprah's government or, you know, like maybe you've never had someone with had Social Security withheld, but now that's a situation where you would, then it's already there. But if it's not an existing withholding that any of your employees have, or it's not in our preset list, then you would click on that add button and that would get you started. And so um, this is gonna open up your add withholding form. And I've just showing you a zoom in of the top part of the form. And remember, this is the main list. So it's not, it doesn't apply to any particular withholding yet. You're just getting it into the UAN system. So this has three, um, things at the top here, you would put in the name of the withholding, that's going to be what's going to show up on their pay stub, the process group, and then the payee, in other words, the vendor that when you withhold money, where do you pay it? So you're which vendor? Now, I'd like to focus here on the process group, because I know a lot of you may saying the new folks, well, you know, what, what is the process group? I've never heard of that. Well, let me tell you, it is these five different items at the bottom of our list. And a process group is going to um, tell you how you, you know, tell UAN, the UN software, what effect your withholding will have on tax reports and if it provides your employee with any tax benefits. So remember, this is not a preset withholding. UAN already knows how to handle federal and state taxes and how to, you know, report those on the W-2 and on all other reports already, this is a custom withholding that you're adding that may be unique to your entity or, you know, it's certainly just not something that we provide in our preset list. So the software needs to know how to handle that. As you can see in these five categories here or process groups, um, I guess maybe not as you can see, but uh, the fact is that these are not provided by UAN. We don't, or I say, we, we didn't make these up. Our programmers didn't make this up. This is from the IRS 
um, from their publications. We renamed them a little bit to make them a, a little bit more clear uh, and relevant to our customers. But they're basically, this is categories in which the IRS says this is how you would handle, this is how this should be uh, reported for taxes and um, affect your employees. So I'll start and explain these, uh, start with the most obvious one, I think at least, uh, the G001, that's for school tax. So that's always going to be an only for school district income tax. It's got a few unique things like your school district four digit number that you would, imp it's going to require you to input that in so that it will pull into the employee's W-2 when they have that school district income tax withheld. So that's school district income tax. Now any other type of look, local tax that's not a school district income tax is going to be the local tax, you know, like I said, pretty obvious. So any other local tax but school district, uh, city tax, village income tax, township tax, that's going to be your local tax. You'll pick it for that. And that has a few unique fe features and it'll tell the software how to handle it. Right above that is deferred compensation, non-Roth. So, uh, Deferred compensation is specifically for IRS qualifying deferred retirement plans, such as with the Ohio Deferred Compensation Agency. We had to add non-Roth to the title a few years ago because the Ohio Deferred Comp Agency started offering Roth plans, which are actually not tax deferrals. So you wouldn't use this for a Roth plan, no matter what you know agency offers that. Um, as a retirement plan because it's not a tax deferral on your wages right now. In other words, you don't get a break on your taxes now and pay later. It's a Roth plan would um, require is post-tax. So that brings us to the l bottom uh, item on our list, which is, which is miscellaneous withholdings. Um, if an employee's withholding is a Roth contribution, that's post-tax, then you would add miscellaneous type and name it something like, I don't know, Roth contribution. And that, because of, you would do that because um, it does not affect their taxes one way or another. It's a Roth contribution. Uh, in other words, um, it's deducted after taxes have been calculated on the gross wages. We call that post-tax deduction. Because of that, you might use miscellaneous withholdings for uh, withholdings like if you have union dues that are withheld from employees, child support, other type of court garnishments, those would all be post-tax. Another common reason you might use a miscellaneous withholding is if you have post-tax insurance premiums, the employee side, that would be withheld. So I'm not saying that you always use miscellaneous for insurance premiums, but if they are calculated after taxes have been considered, there's no tax benefit on those insurance premiums, then miscellaneous would be their choice. Now, if you kind of zoned out on me, uh, I want you to sit up straight, pay attention, look forward, because this is really important. And, uh, you know, uh, so I know this is a tax talk is like easy to zone out on, but focus on uh, right now, especially if you're new, um, with insurance deductions, you must determine whether it should be deducted as a cafeteria plan, the one at the top, or miscellaneous withholding. There, uh, those are only the only two options that you have available for insurance premiums that are deducted. Okay, and the cafeteria plan provides a great tax benefit to your employees while the miscellaneous provides no tax benefit at all uh, to the employees. It's just withheld, it's post-tax. So cafeteria plans do provide a great tax benefit. However, it's not really your choice. Hey, I wanna make my employees happy, I'll just make a cafeteria plan. That's not your choice. It has to qualify. Uh, and there are two, uh, two criteria. You should only set up an insurance premium deduction if as a cafeteria plan, if it meets these two criteria, number one, you need to confirm it qualifies as a Section 125 CAFE plan per the IRS, uh, so that they're saying yeah, this is insurance premiums would be pre-tax. Uh, 
your insurance ag agent should be able to answer that question for you, and they also should be able to provide you with documentation that, yes, indeed, this qualifies as a 125 cafeteria plan. If, if they don't know, then you would definitely, or not, if it's not clear then, then you would check with a, check with a tax advisor on, on that subject. In addition to that, that's not by itself, that's not good enough. You, the board needs to legislate um, this as, you know, adopt this in legislation, that plan. So, um, you know, and, and that's, they, the board can't just legislate it without it being a qualified 125 plan. It has to meet both criteria. So if it does, then it would be a cafeteria plan. Otherwise, set it up as miscellaneous withholding. If you set it up the wrong way and discover it six months later, it's a real mess to clean up uh, beyond UAN, with dealing with all the agencies and, and the employees and so forth. So just a, a big warning there. Um, but yeah, this is, uh, you know, you'll have to make a choice at this point. It's required field. And so that's what those are all about. So we'll move on from there. All right, so our example today with Buckeye Township, I already filled it out, is deferred compensation non-Roth. And so um, you can see that I filled out a meaningful name. That's a good name for this one. We picked the process group. It's very specific for deferred comp. And the um, payee or the vendor is Ohio Public Employees Deferred Comp. So this is the one where people, one that people get caught up for one reason or another, they get stuck. And, you know, we got a lot of these blue guys running around UAN Island. Remember, it's kind of a magical island. And, I mean, you know, out there in nowhere with the Gilligans, right? I know they never had it on the shows, but, I mean, think of what happened on Gilligan's Island. How did they do all that stuff? They had to have some, blue, some little helper somewhere. I mean, a phone line at some point. It was crazy time at, at Gilligan's. So we got these, these little helpers to help us do some magical things. But you might be scratching your head thinking, like this guy thinking, um, you know, what can I do if the payee is missing when I'm adding a withholding? Uh, yeah, so there might be a number of reasons why the payee is missing. So in other words, we click on this list and we're not seeing Ohio, um, de what, Ohio deferred compensation. Uh, we're not seeing that. And uh, so we can't continue because you can see it's a required field. Well, the first thing it might be is you need to remember that withholdings need payees. If you never set up, this is new to you, but withhold, you have to, the first step is to add the withholding first. That's right, buddy. Every withholding needs a payee, pal. You remember that silliness? Maybe it'll, it'll you know, stick in your brain like it does with mine. So every withholding has to have a payee first. And it has to set up. Now, you might be thinking, well, I did just, and we get calls like this, I did add the payee. I know it's in my vendor list. Well, let's double check that. Could be a couple of things. First, if you ha did set up Ohio Deferred Compensation in your vendor payee list under general maintenance, vendor payees, then you want to, you know, if you run into this dilemma, you want to check the edit that, uh, edit it and check this setting. In the right-hand side of the vendor payee form, whether edit or add, you're going to see a section called available in. And for this vendor to show up as a payee under payroll withholdings, under payroll maintenance withholdings, you have to check mark, make it available in payroll withholdings. Now, we could, if we think we have like some special one-time administrative fee, we could also mark this as make it available in accounting purchases and payments, right? At, you know, at the top of the list, and have it set in both. That would be perfectly fine if we thought that was a possibility. The other um, possibility is that, you know, if this is a brand new, like I said, it could be three steps. If this is a brand new withholding, you've never dealt with Ohio Deferred Compensation as agency, then you might need to just add the vendor first. So that always has to come first. So you click on that Add button, and the same thing in the ad screen, you're going to make it at least available in payroll withholdings. So it shows up on your list to pick. Ah, and then their withholdings and payees are best friends forever. Isn't that cute? And it's only going to be best friends forever if they're linked up in withholdings and if you add the payee first. Then when you're adding your withholding, you just pick that payee. No problemo. All right. So 
We've gotten through step one, adding withholdings to the main list. The second step is adding the, um, going to payroll maintenance employees, editing one or more of your employees, in this case just one, and adding the withholding to that employee's custom list of what's with deducted from their checks. As I mentioned before, you, you may not need to do step one if you, like if we pretend that we had deferred compensation with another employee, let's say we add this this year, and then three years later, we get a second employee that says, yes, I want to, you know, they filled out the paperwork or they want to elect to have deferred comp taken out. Well, step one's history. It's already been done. It's available. All we need to do is complete step two, editing that additional employee that, that wanted deferred comp taken out to add the withholding that already exists. All right, so let's pull that over right now. You go to payroll maintenance employees. And that'll open up your employee listing. I've got Robert Build here that we're, is going to get deferred compensation. So I'll mark his ID and click on Edit Advanced. Edit Advanced. If you're never doing that, don't use the guided um, button. Use Edit and then choose Advanced. Now, this will open up the specific employee form. Now, I've jumped through this already. There, are, you can see it's got Robert Build's name on at the top. That's um, who we're dealing with here. And it's got about six, seven tabs going across the top of the page below his name. I've clicked on the withholdings tab, and that's going to show me the, a list of his custom withholdings that could be deducted from any of his his paychecks. So you know he has Oprah's withheld. He doesn't have Social Security, right? So this is his custom list. And a lot of people miss this. It's right above the withholding list. It's a little add button. So that's where I can add new withholdings that are set up in our main list to this particular employee. So I click on the add form and it opens up a third screen, the add employee withholding form. I've already filled that out on mine. And you can see I've picked deferred comp from our withholding list in the form. It's filled out a reasonable description that I'm going to keep, and then I've uh, entered in an amount at the bottom left-hand corner. Now, that seems like that would be enough, but you'd be mistaken, and I have to say, a lot of people make this mistake. They click save, and they get some message. They say, oh, it's just a message, got confirmation. They click OK to that. They move on, and they don't realize that they haven't completed the setup. We have, I'd say, years ago, I put this on the top five list. I'm going to move it down to, like, the bottom of the top ten list. But we get this call a lot. As the title of the slide says, don't forget to attach the new withholding to an earning. So we're going to do that by clicking on the earnings tab. And you see he's got, it just lists a preview of his earnings. And what we're doing here is we're telling the software when you pay him this hourly wages biweekly, make sure to deduct deferred compensation. And the reason we have you do this is because you're the, the computer that in some situations people have multiple jobs, different withholdings are not always deducted from every uh, position that they they get paid for. So we need to tell the software, you know, what, whatever the case may be, at least one earning should have this, this deducted when they are paid wages. So that's what has to be done. If you fail to do that and skip past the messages, then it's just not going to be withheld. Um, it won't cause any problem on wages, except your, the 50 bucks won't come out. All right. So that is... Um, our first section, our second uh, point here, or I guess third, is updating withholding rates. So this is something typically you would do for multiple employees. And it's, it's fairly common to do around the beginning of the year if you need to do it. A rate or amount change for withholdings effective in January. So that's what we're going to demonstrate. And um, some examples of this might be insurance premiums where the, the flat amount for, you know, single and married, uh, what may, may go up uh, effective in the new year. It doesn't always coincide with the new year, but in some cases it does. And then tax rate changes. So you have a school tax uh, that is uh, determined in November, but then you, you know, it doesn't become effective, let's say, until the first payroll of January. So, that's fairly common school or any other type of tax. So 
this is another great reason why, why temporary mode is so great. Think about it. Here we are in early, once you get everything installed, at mid-December, if you have a rate change, you can update that now without affecting 2022. So at our Buckeye Township, we still have a payroll at the end of December that we're going to be paying, but we can update the rate for uh, one of our taxes for 2023 without affecting our last wages in 2022. So temporary mode is really an excellent feature for this. It'll save you that time. You don't have to camp out after that last payroll in December and, and remember to change the rate. You could do it as you have time this month, as long as you remember to log in to 2023. All right, so it's a two-step process to update the weight rates. We're going to update the withholding list again, and then we're going to with the, the new rate and the withholding list. And then we're going to update the withholdings assigned to the employee. Now, if you're familiar with going through that, you know, boy, if I've got 50 employees, that's going to be a lot of work, edit, clicking this, and editing in advanced, and, you know, and over and over again. Well, we've got a great shortcut that I'm going to show you that will save you a ton of time if you've got a lot of employees to update the rate on. But what well, first comes always first, and the first step is update the rate in the withholding list under payroll maintenance withholdings. Uh, my example is Buckeye Village Income Tax. That's going to be going up next year. So I'm going to click that and then click on Edit. And that will open up my um, Edit Withholding form. So here we have Buckeye Village at the bottom. Well, that's our old rate for 2022. Still going to apply, apply to that last wage in December. But I can change it here since I'm logged into 2023 to the new rate of 1.5% and then save that form. And I'll move on to step number two. So here's our shortcut. It's the withholding editor. It's the last thing on your maintenance list under payroll. And that'll open up the withholding editor form where I will pick my withholding for Buckeye Village Income Tax. It'll list all the employees that have that withholding and, uh, you know, on, in their setup. And then we can see that they're even though I updated the main list, that doesn't automatically change each employee's setting for it's still set at 1%. And so I'm going to use this, I'm going to first select all my employees and then go down to this middle section where it says change to, and I'm going to change my rate to the new rate for 2023. Because again, I'm logged into work year 2023. And let's click on that save button. And voila, we've got our new uh, rate for 2023. Easy peasy. Uh, take advantage of that. It's a really great shortcut. So now that we've seen that, let's pull the curtains to another great shortcut in UEN, which is the Skip Calendar Editor. And that will help us to update withholdings that you skip on certain paychecks. Now I'll explain what that means if you're unfamiliar in a minute. But first I want to point out that this only works if you have employee withholdings that have a skip option already active in their employee setup for that particular withholding. That's a setup demonstration that's really something we don't have time to go into all the nuts and bolts for today. It's, um, so we're going to leave that. If, you have any, if you've never done that before, if you're unfamiliar with this, if you think it, it might be beneficial, give us a call at the support line about setting up those. And we'll be happy to explain, hey, you know, I need to under just say, I've never uh, set up a skip calendar for a withholding. How do I do that for one employee? And we'll demonstrate that you once you've done it for one employee for the withholding, um, then it's easy enough to do that for the other ones. It is a, you know, if you've got 50 employees, it's going to be a lot of initial setup, but it makes life a lot easier as you go forward year after year with that um, skip calendar. So regardless of whether you have a skip, a reason to skip a deduction, um, we always recommend that you lay out a, a new year payroll schedule. It's beneficial for several reasons. A couple of them I'll show you in our demonstrations today. So let's turn to an example of a payroll schedule laid out in an Excel format. And this is our bi-weekly pay schedule. This is one that would probably apply the most often to a skip deduction scenario. Um, but you would lay this out for all of your pay schedules just to have it you know, a clear thing. So 
Um, notice the first three columns we have here. We have the uh, pay period, starting and ending date, and then we have the pay date. So that's kind of your basis, and you're going to lay that out, you know, well, in, you know, if you haven't done so already, you do this in December and get it ready for next year. Now, obviously, for a monthly pay schedule, that would be easy, right? You just have your, your pay date is going to be the date, or, or monthly or biweekly or whatever, your pay date is going to be the date that they get the check. The, um, or if you have direct deposit, the day that it will be direct deposited into their bank account. So that's the pay date. The pay period starting and ending date is when the employees earned their money for that paycheck on the pay date. So um, with our biweekly, just at our township here, an example, uh, if they earn the money for the January 6th check, or will earn it, when they work December 10th to December 23rd. I want to point out, I forgot to mention that uh, if you're newer, biweekly, in, in UN terms, we have biweekly and semi-monthly. Semi-monthly is when employees get paid twice a month, every month, no matter what, how the calendar falls. So they're going to have a date, let's say it's you know, the 15th and the 30th or 31st, that, that they get paid um, for you know, half of that month, roughly half of the month. So that's biweekly, 24 pay, I'm sorry, that's semi-monthly, 24 pay periods a year. Biweekly, you're getting paid every two weeks. So basically the calendar is, you know, every 14 days you get another paycheck. Well, because we have a 365-day uh, infraction year uh, calendar, when you count out 40, 14 days, it's not going to give you 24 even uh, checks a year. It's going to give you 26 paychecks a year. And so therefore, as you can see, as we've laid out on our calendar, we've identified the months, March and September, for our example, in which we're going to have a third paycheck. And so this, and I've, so I've highlighted them in green and orange, um, the third, and, and then, so these are the months that we have a third paycheck under pay date in orange there. For our this is useful for our example because for our township insurance, we deduct it, we deduct um, insurance twice a month. And this is fairly typical uh, if you have insurance premiums, deduct it if you have, and biweekly, deduct it twice a month in a set amount. So let's say for uh, you know single, it's a hundred bucks um, every every you know two weeks typically. And then, you know, $200 a month withheld for employees for their side of the premium. So that would be, a, you know, an, the amount that we would owe $200 uh, for that employee uh, each month. And so if we, on those three paycheck months, you're going to end up, if you don't skip the deduction on that third paycheck, well, in our example, you'd owe, withhold an extra $100 incorrectly from the employee and possibly go forward and pay, overpay the insurance agency by an extra $100. So you don't want to do that. That causes a messy situation. You have to end up you know, maybe doing a wage adjustment or something like that. It, it gets kind of messy. So you want to be careful with that. And the best way to do that is set up a skip calendar for the employee. Like I said, that's a process that you initially do. Uh, the first time you set it up, it's a little bit of work. But after that, you just need to adjust the calendar each year because your calendar changes every year. So here we've identified the dates to skip. Now, I remember, i got to back up. This is an example. Uh, your third, it's not going to always be March and September. We get that sometimes. It just depends on when your biweekly schedule is started and the date, where the dates just happen to fall. I mean, here at Otter State, we have a three paycheck month in December, you know, so that's a great month. It just happens to fall this year in December where we have a three paycheck month at Otter State's office. At Buckeye Township, in our example, it happens to fall in March and September. Yours may be completely different if you have uh, biweekly. But we've identified the dates, the specific dates of the wages, March 31st and September 29th of the wages, where we do not want to have that insurance withheld. And so um, we, this is a good, good tool for us to do ahead of time. It'll help us with preparing our calendar, skip calendar, as well as other things. You've seen I've added 
other helpful reminders, for instance, November 24th next year is, uh, you know, it's the day after Thanksgiving next year, so our board likes to, you know, get the Black Friday deals and uh, blow all their money on that day. So they don't really want a meeting. So I may add a little note to that, you know, in, J- in January next year, we're going to figure out an alternate date for that that meeting. So add your extra notes here. It's a great thing to do for multiple reasons. But for the skip calendar, let's turn back to our, our um, slides here. Now, uh, in this new uh, presentation format we have this year, uh, realized right beforehand that this, uh, I had a little video here that shows you the menu path. So uh, that, for some reason, is not running. So let me just tell you that this, how to get to the skip calendar is in the, on page two of the booklet. It's, um, I mean, the year in best practices under updating withholding, uh, updating withholding skip calendars, the fourth item down. It tells you to go to payroll maintenance skip calendar editor. So that's how you're going to get to the area that we need to get to. And then it'll open up this skip calendar editor form. So payroll maintenance skip calendar editor. It opens up this list. Now, if you've never used the skip calendar before, the editor before, then the only row of information you're going to see here, if you want to have a blank list, you'll have one row that says deduct from every pay period. And guess what? You can't really do anything with deduct from every pay period. It's just kind of making it kind of blatantly clear to you. Yes, the default setting for any kind of calendar is deducted from the withholding from every pay period, unless you add a new calendar with specific criteria. So can't do anything with that. On our example, we already have a skip calendar because years ago, our fiscal officer set up a, a skip calendar and named it something very meaningful. As you can see, it's hard to, this is not a default name uh, that's listed here. This is something that fiscal officer typed in. And I suggest you do that too for whatever the purpose is of your skip calendar. So it's hard to miss the point of biweekly skipped, skip third paycheck. We kind of know exactly what that should do based on the description. So we'll click that, click on edit. And that will open up our skip calendar. Since we're logged into the new year, it shows us the new year calendar. And if we were logged into 2022, we'd already have skip dates selected because we've been using it all year. So in the new year, this is where we're going to select our dates to skip. So sure, I'm going to go to March 31st, like we saw in the calendar. And oh, wait a minute. Here's my, uh, I've got a trusty assistant. It's nice at our little township that we have an assistant. Uh, you know, we spend a lot of time on the beach in Ewing Island, so we've got lots of assistants here. But he says, yikes, you're about to skip the wrong paycheck. Well, what do you mean, little guy? I call him Skippy. What do you mean, little guy? We, oh, I need to read the directions. I don't do that all the time out of me. Select any date within each pay period that the withholding should skip. Huh, I'm still not getting it. Select any date within. Let's look at our calendar. Okay. Okay. I get it. You're saying I got to I gotta skip March 33rd first, right? No. Oh. Oh. So the instructions say using this shortcut, the skip calendar editor, I've got to select March 17th so that on the pay, because that's just how the skip calendar is written. So I've got to select a pay period within the pay period in which that check is going to be paid for. So March 17th is a pay period ending date. I should mark that on the skip calendar so that it skips my insurance deduction on the third pay check, which is March 31st. Okay, that is, yes, I'm glad you clarified, little guy. Uh, we don't need you anymore, but thank you very much for you. For your help. Oh, we're still trying to hang on. Get out of here. Okay, so we've got our skip calendar. We appreciate the clarification. I can go back and select the pay period date of the withholding to skip. And in this case, the third paycheck pay period date is the 17th for March and the 15th of September. And then I'll just click on save, and it gives me a little confirmation message. Now, uh, in the software itself, I've highlighted every, you know the the save message in yellow, but in the software itself, it real ac- actually will s- highlight the dates that you select in a yellow font. So you know these are the dates I've selected to s- for of the period to skip. So we'll click on um, close, 
and that'll bring us back to the the listing area. It's nice that it shows you that you've done some work there, the two dates that are skipped. But your work is not done. All this does is set up the calendar. You need to tell the software, well, okay, what biweekly um, withholding should this affect? Because maybe you have different policies for different withholdings. The software doesn't know. You have to apply that. And so we click on the Apply button, which is right next to the Edit button at the bottom of your list. And that'll open up the Apply Skip Calendar form where we pick the of the, of the earnings with the withholdings that we want to skip. So we're going to go with bi-weekly because our calendar is pretty clear from our calendar. That's what we're working with now. And then we're going to select our, whoops, click the right place. We're going to select our withholding. We've got three of them. I'll just show you one example for dental insurance, but uh, at our place we'd apply it to all three um, one by one. And so that's going to list all of our employees that have that withholding uh, set up and the um, skip calendar is activated for them. And so we'll select all of them, click on the Save button, and that's going to take care of it. I would, of course, repeat that step from either two withholdings in which I want to skip. But that's all there is to it. It's a, a great feature. It's a once-a-year feature. And so now when I get to March and September, I don't have to stress about, you know, finding some other way to not deduct that those insurance withholdings and not overwithhold. It's all set in place early in the year. In fact, the year before, because we're in temporary mode. So we set it all up for the new year, and we're, we can live stress-free. All right, so let's, this brings us to our last point in my section, which, which is evaluating leave balances. And, well, we've got a little, you know, a few little mini islands here in the uh, in a UN island. And here's one of them. It's a sunny day. Um, it's sunny because we may need to, we can get our new year leave adjustments done ahead of time or at least plan on it and have a good understanding of where we stand with the new year. Now, as I mentioned, we have a, you know, at UEN we brought it pretty good. Sure, we got a small township with a small list of employees, but we got lots of assistants and we got an assistant um, since we can, it lets us spend a lot of time on UEN Island. We've got assistants. Her name's Bernice, and she's an administrative assistant here. And she would love to go on vacation, maybe in December or um, January, at UN Island with us. But she just doesn't know if it's available to her. Oh, there she is, trying to trying to come out, but she's not really sure whether she can make it. So, oh, there she goes. We we need to evaluate our leave balances so that we know whether you know, where we stand so we're not, you know, just operating in the dark, especially if you're new. So you need to determine, and, um, if you don't have a handle on this, um, you know, you just don't want to rely on the board to say, okay, you know, make sure you give so-and-so some leave. Determine if and when to adjust leave. Now, some of you have no need to regularly adjust leave if you've got policies in which your employees accrue a little bit of leave, you know, every paycheck. That would be in a leave accrual and it wouldn't automatically require any kind of leave adjustment. Uh, you would only, in that case, you'd only use adjustments for error corrections, okay, or maybe initial, setting up an initial balance for someone who transferred or something like that. But um, a lot of folks get, um, give their employees lump sum adjustments. Hey, we get, you know, two weeks of vacation every year if you're in this pay category, or three weeks, or whatever the, the case may be for those who have leave benefits. So you know, you also need to know when to adjust the leave benefit. Um, is it uh, something that by your policy is due uh, at the, is it due at the uh, beginning of the year at a certain point, or is it due on the employee's anniversary date, like their higher anniversary date? When, when do they qualify for that new amount of leave available? And can they carry that leave over into the new year if they don't use it? These are all questions that you need to have answers to so that Bernice doesn't get caught uh, caught in the water. Oh, Bernice, I hope you make it. I don't know. Uh, we'll, we'll, we'll check back with her. But this is, this is not really something that UEN could answer for you. And that's why I emphasize this. It's a, a policy decision for each local government. I mean, there may be certain rules for 
libraries or special districts that I'm that aware of that you know are statewide. But but it's definitely not something that the UN staff would be able to say, yeah, this is how much you should, this is what your policy policy should be. No, we we that that can vary, and most of the time that can vary from local government to local government. That that's a policy that you should have in place, and you should have a written policy. I mean, it ideally in an employee manual, an employee handbook, but if not somewhere in the minutes, somewhere it should have been legislated. It should have been determined what your policies are for different pay categories, for different people have different benefits, for whatever leave type. Um, if that's not the case, I would encourage you to make a point of it, you know, with your board. If you have nothing written, because this has consequences, um, as we'll talk about in a moment. And, um, you know, it, it will be scrutinized by audits. And also the timing of when, when and you don't want your employees to get mad, you know, if you're this one employee in the same category gets their benefit before the other one or something like that. So you want to be consistent and have a clear policy. And so and know when it is available to each employee. All right. So hopefully um, you can get that in place and Bernice will know exactly when she can take her paid leave and come out here and relax at UN Island like she does now. So hopefully your employees will be in the same situation. So let's get on with the nuts and bolts of it here of doing a leave balance adjustment if you need to do so. And so this is how you would enter in specific adjustments, not an accrual, but adjustments to your leave under payroll utilities leave balance adjustment. And that's going to open up an important message. Supporting documentation should be retained for all leave balance adjustments. It's a warning. This is cash. This is cash money. Oh, here we go. This is cash money, people. You got to be careful. This is like taking away or giving your employees cash. That's essentially what leaves benefit leaves are. If they take a vacation day, that's paying them for not coming in for work, right? So it's like handing out cash. Make sure your policies back it up because there can be findings and recoveries against you, your board, if you're just handing out leave that really isn't backed up by policy, right? Uh, so, or a, um, or maybe an employee can, you know, have a case for, hey, I was due this leave and I never got it, right? Or you took it away from me for no good reason. So be careful. Once you're sure, click on OK, and you'll go into the form, post leave balance adjustment form, and there are two options. Clicking, clicking the keyboard here instead of the mouse. There are two options, which um, either one is fine, which is by, you can adjust by employee or just by leave. So we'll start with uh, an example of adjusting by employee. Here we've selected our employee, uh, Henry Hero, our fire chief, and he's got four different leave benefits. I've zoomed in a little bit here. You can see that he's got um, zero balance for a few of them. Then for sick and vacation, he's got an ongoing current balance. And then to, to the right of that, he's, we have an adjustment field. Well, this is great if you, you know, to use by employee, if you've got a few employees with leave benefits, now you can just kind of see all of the information all at once and make your adjustments wherever you need to be, need it to be. So perhaps you, he might have uh, three weeks, you know, on a certain time following your policies in which is granted a lump sum amount. So 120 plus his current 28 hours and a half hours, that would, you know, make 148. So you type in that adjustment and it would update when you post it. You could also use this for negative adjustments. If you, this is a good time of year to look at your leave detail reports and just kind of scan over, just check for mistakes. We all make them. And if you find that there was an error made, you can document that in the purpose and, and say, hey, uh, this on such and such check back in June or wherever, uh, this mistake was made and, made and we're making this correction now. That's a great uh, way to, you know, a great tool to use for that situation. Um, but, you know, I think what's more common, a little bit easier to use when you have a lot of employees with leave benefits is, uh, we'll, we'll flip to it now, which is adjusting by leave type. That's where you just pick the leave and it'll show you all your employees. So we're going to use personal leave for our examples for this. And so at Buckeye Township, um, let me explain our policy for personal leave. 
we get our employees get three days of personal leave. That's 24 hours a year, and we use when you do adjustments, you enter them in by the leave by hours. So 24 hours a year, they get leave that personally they can use any time throughout the year, um, as long as they use it that year. It's a use it or lose it policy. So this is an example of use it or lose it policy. And here we are in December, and we're looking at our list of employees, and they're all, they've all used their leave except for, well, poor Barry Deceased, our cemetery sexton. Not only um, is he got an unfortunate name, but he has forgotten to use one day of leave. And with our policy, I guess it looks like we're going to have to reduce that to zero, and he's not going to get that benefit because he, you know, that's our policy, use it or lose it. And then we could type in, you know, a justification for that. We'll put in the date. Um, remember, we're in temporary mode here, so the new year. We're saying, you know, a meaningful message for auditor. And the key thing is here to refer to your policy so they can say, okay, yeah, this matches up with our, our policy. But you still got to be careful here. You might miss the mark. We do a lot of archery on you, Aon. And Island and, uh, you know, Alex, let me tell you, he's missed the mark a few times. But you got to be careful because if we just go and post this, have you really checked your policy? Uh, I guess we really haven't. I, we assume that, yeah, it's, the end of, it's December, he hasn't used it, but hmm, and, and what's, the, what's, what's our policy? Why don't we go back to our biweekly pay schedule and take a look? So this is just an example, remember, of our Buckeye Township use it or lose it policy. So for our personal leave policy at Buckeye Township, in just our example, our policy isn't, when I look that up in, the, in our manual, it isn't that they, he can just use, uh, the he has to use the personal leave by the end of December 31st. It's that he can, he can use the, um, let me say, he can use personal leave um, all the way up to December 23rd's pay period. Or I should rephrase that. I said it all wrong. Let me start over. Buckeye Township's policy is that um, he needs to use the personal leave for the old year by the time, uh, by his pay period, the last pay period ending date of that year. And the last pay period ending date is actually paid in in our situation for bi-weekly employees. It's paid January 6th. So we haven't gotten to January 6th yet in the, the real calendar. And you know, our, our employee still has a chance to use to take that day off. So we're friends with Barry. We can give him a call and say, hey, Barry, you got a day left. What's going, you know. I don't want to have to take this away from you, right? So uh, we've got time. Now we're going to pretend for the purpose of this demonstration that we're move, moving forward in the real-time calendar. And it's no longer December. It's January 6th. We just posted the final payroll. And we're going to check our leave reports, maybe look at the adjustment screen, and see where do our employees stand. You know, because we got all these assistants. They did the payroll for us. And... Uh, we see that, ah, great, Barry took a day off. In fact, I should know that because Barry was out there playing putt-putt with me on UAN Island. So that was his paid day off for personal leave that he took. I don't know why he's using a driver. He's really, I guess he likes those blazing, fast putt-putt ball, balls like Alex. But uh, there he is. So he took that day off. There's no need to do the adjustment because they've all been able to follow the policy and use their hours. So that rules that out. That's good that we checked our policy before we did that. So now let's look at personally for a different purpose, which is you know, our policy for the new year, since we're logged into the new year in 2023, is they do get 24 hours, and that's uh, within the new year. And since they're all at zero balance, we can safely give them their lump sum increase for the new year. So we'll just type in 2424, 24, really easy when you do that by leave, type in their, their balance and putting in a meaningful explanation in the purpose for our auditors. Now, um, I know with our policy, I should have made that January 6th, so j just give me, uh, you know, 
some uh, break on that one. But the key th point with this is that we put in a meaningful explanation. It doesn't have to be long, but that you're referring, referring to your backup, your policy that supports this. All right, then all that remains is to click post, and you are, you know, you've complete the process. All right, does anyone have any questions bouncing out around there about uh, all these topics I've talked about with, with payroll? All right, we've got a few. Okay, so even if I don't use UEN for payroll, could we use this pay schedule so we have noted when we have three pay months, spe uh, special pays for certain departments, et cetera? Well, yeah, we don't have any kind of like, uh, th this is just a sample, our, our pay schedule. Um, you can feel free. Um, you know, basically, we just prepared this with an Excel spreadsheet. You can do this by hand. Uh, you could do this uh, in any way you prefer if, in, in Microsoft Word. We just find Excel is easy to do that because it has some features to allow you to extend You know, some formulas you can use. But you can always type that out. Uh, yeah, if you don't have payroll yet. I'll encourage you to get payroll when the time comes. Um, all right, another question. Okay, so someone in, uh, they're talking about a wage rate increase. Um, if they have a, a wage rate increase effective January 1st, can we enter that, that ahead of time? Or do we need to wait until after we pay the December hours on our January payroll? Okay, well, so what this person is saying, it depends on how, what the question, you know, that they're, I would answer this differently depending on how they stated. The way they stated the question was that they have a December payroll um, for December payroll hours we pay in the first of January. I'm not really sure if you're if the new rate happens after your January paycheck date, then no, you would not use temporary mode yet to update the the pay rate until after the payroll. So basically. Um, if it's just it's confusing the way you, you phrased it, but if you're you can use temporary made to update the pay rate in the new year, any wages that you post in the new year are going to be at the new rate. But um, if you have lots of first paycheck, if, it's, if you're talking about well the first paychecks for the period in December, and so that's going to be at the old rate, then no, you would wait until after you post the first paycheck because that's still going to be at the old rate and then you could um, so you can't schedule them within the year the, these rate changes um, you can you know if your first of the year the rate changes for the payroll and that's going to be your first paycheck then yeah you could do that ahead of time but otherwise you need to wait until after um, that the checks are posted for the old rate uh, when you're talking about within the same year Okay, uh, a few other questions. All right, someone says if you're a uh, user not using temporary mode, could you still process 2023 payroll? Um, no, the temporary mode allows you to operate in both years at the same time. So you would have to close 2022. Now, that's the whole point of temporary mode, is that it allows you to um, it allows you to move into the new year and do activity, uh, but if you don't choose not to use temporary mode, which you don't advise, then um, you would you'd be stuck not being able to use UAN for that purpose. Okay, so someone said, if I just add, add if we just add to personal leave and accrue, what is left over in 22 will be added together? Well, again, if your policies determine whether you carry over, you know, our example was use it or lose it, right? But if you have a policy saying whatever whatever type of leave it is that, hey, if if you the employee doesn't use the leave, um, then there's no need. So like you say, someone gets two weeks a year and they have one day they didn't use. So if you do nothing and they've got that eight hours at the end of the year, then that eight hours will carry over to the new year. Um, and you say, okay, here's your 80 hours for the two weeks. But then it's going to be 88 hours when you give them that. Well, actually, and if it's accrual, then it's just going to continue to accrual, like you're saying. If it's a lump sum, then you would just add, like I showed you in the first example, we added 120 hours. There's three weeks, and he already had I don't know, something like 25 hours. So it just would add to that amount that carries over. If it's accrual, this, you know, a little bit each paycheck, it's going to continue to accrue. 
And if you don't do any adjustment, then that's fine if that's your policy. So I think that answers that question. Um, let's see. Can we, add, can we add personal leave effective January 1st, 2023, and new vacation hours effective date of employment? Yeah, so this is not all, uh, you know, each leave is independent. So um, you can make adjustments, you know, if you have a policy for vacation leave that's different than personal leave, then you can follow your policies. And so if a personal leave is by their anniversary date, I mean, so I think you said vacation leaves by their anniversary date, then um, you would enter that. Did I read that right? Text one. New vacation hours effective date of employment. Yeah. Then you would do that on the, the person's, uh, you know, anniversary date, whatever the case may be. Now we are going to be moving on to steps to close the fiscal year of 2022. So if you are following along in the um, year-end best practices, we are going to be at the top of page three. So it's very important. You can't close 2022 until the calendar year 2022 is over. So you have to do this January 1st, 2023 or later. Now, there is no award for filing first. In fact, we do get many questions of people who file too quickly and then call us saying, hey, um, I need to get back into 2022 for something. Well, you can't. Once you've closed it down, you've closed it down, and we just have to work with you to kind of help and do the best we can and get everything posted then in 2023. Now, you don't want to take too long because if you don't have 2022 closed by March 1st of 2023, the next time you log in, you're only going to be able to go into year 2022. The system is going to force you to basically get everything closed before you can continue in 2023 once we're past March 1st. So before you close 2022, you want to make sure that you complete all of the 2022 transactions. You're going to want to use temporary mode to toggle between the two years to make sure you post the items in the correct years. So that way you can make sure that even when we're in, you know, it's mid January and everyone's cold and shoveling, but you can still complete your 2022 transactions by working in year 2022. But make sure you're not going to post items in 2022 that are paid in the calendar year of 23. We do want to make sure that we are in the correct year and posting the items at the exact time that they were paid. However, while we're doing all of this and we're caught up in year end, you do not want to forget to do your December and fourth quarter withholdings and reports. So we also we do want to take a look at carryover withholdings. So we're going to do this by going over to your payroll reports and statements here withholding reports. Now, when you look at your withholding reports, you're going to want to organize them by original post date and select everything except OPRs and OPNF because, of course, they work differently. So you want to change that to your pay period end date because that's what OPRs and OPNF go by. So when you run the reports to get them accurate, make sure that you have it selected correctly. So your carryover withholdings are going to be unpaid withholdings that are carried over in the new year. These are withholdings that were withheld in calendar year 2022, but are not going to get paid until 2023. So on all your reports that you run as of December 31st, they are going to look like they're unpaid, even after they were paid in 2023. Because those reports that are run in 2022 are not looking forward to any in future information. All they know is, as of this date, they were unpaid. So in 2023, they start as unpaid. And then when you do pay them, note that the employee shares are going to be that carryover encumbrances, where your employer shares are going to be using the brand new 2023 appropriations. 
Okay. Now, when it comes to clearing unpaid withholdings, this is something that's rarely done. However, we are covering it because it is included in the year and best practices. But this is probably going to be one of those items that you're just not, that's not going to apply to you because, of course, not everything in the best practices applies to everybody. So, if you are find that you do need to clear some withholdings, you don't want to do anything that's going to get paid in the new year. You're not clearing those. Only clear withholdings that never will need to get paid. The most common example is um, some types of insurance where you're holding some for the employees, but it's paid on the accounting side, including your employer shares that's not withheld properly. So you just are paying that all the time on the accounting side and the payroll side. It just kind of builds up for the year. So at the, you want to make sure that that gets cleared out. But again, like I said, this is pretty rare and not many people will end up doing this. Now you do want to look at closing and reducing purchase orders and your blanket certificates. So to do this, we're going to go to your accounting utilities purchase order utility. So the first thing you'll want to do is, of course, select everything, but then just select everything with a zero balance that hasn't been closed. These are just items that were used up. So you just want to make sure that you close them and it just kind of cleans up the paperwork. You'll enter in your close date and then click OK. And remember, this is going to be in the calendar in the working year of 2022, even if we are in the calendar year of 2023. So you're going to look at your purchase orders and see what you might need to adjust. So you want to select and click adjust. So why are you going to be reducing purchase orders? So in this particular instance, our fire equipment inspectors, we had a purchase order of $1,650. But now that we are in January, we see that the final invoice is only $450. So we may want to make sure that we are only carrying over that $450 because extra encumbrances carried over just tie up your resources. So just make sure that all your purchase orders and blanket certificates are reduced to what you'll actually need to pay those invoices come 2023. You'll, of course, enter in your purpose. Your adjustment date is going to be December 31st, because even though we are in the calendar year of January 23rd, we're working in UAN in 22, so we're just going to be posting these things as of December 31st. So once again, make sure you're just entering the amount you don't need to carry over. So you may need to wait until final statements and invoices are received. This is one of the reasons that you might not want to close 2022 so quickly. Just take a few weeks and make sure that your amount reserved is exactly what you need. And so we want to see if there's any questions on that section. So first of all, I do want to reiterate <laughs> that it has been confirmed that the email for the 2023.1 update will be released, sent out later today. You'll obviously want to check your spam folders or your trash folders in case you accidentally deleted it. If you're not seeing it, you also the people who are going to be receiving copies of DVDs, you'll want to make sure they are going to be created today and mailed out. So wait a few days to a week. And then if you still haven't received it, you can obviously contact us. If you are expecting a download email and you haven't gotten it by tomorrow, you can obviously contact UAN support and we can send you out an additional copy. And if you didn't sign up for the updates to be downloaded, but you changed your mind and you want it downloaded, even if you make that change, you won't get the email immediately. You'll need to contact UAN support requesting it. So as we look at some questions, is it necessary to adjust POs? I generally close open POs with balances. You'll only want to 
keep POs open for bills that still need to be paid. So if all of your 2022 bills come within and you get them all paid on 2020 in 2022, then no, you do not need to adjust and keep any purchase orders and you won't need to carry over anything. However, we all know that that rarely happens because things linger month to month. And just because this happens to be December to January is rarely any different than, you know, things carrying over from May to June. Can you still reduce purchase orders in 2022 after the first of the year? Or does it have to be done before the new year? Yes, you can adjust purchase orders in calendar year of 2023 when you're logged into 2022. Can you use 2023 appropriations for an invoice received in 2023, or does it have to use 2022 for a 2022 purchase? So more than likely, you'll want to carry over because it was purchased in 2022, so you appropriated for it in 2022. You're just not paying for it until 2023. So more than likely, that would use your 2022 carryover purchase orders. Uh, if you have a purchase order for $3,000 that you're carrying over for 23, then that 3,000 has to be included in your temp appropriations, right? No, the carryover pur purchase orders are still using the little bit amount from 2022 that resources are already tied up and factor in. So you do not need to include them in your 2023 budgets. Does it matter if we adjust or close the purchase orders we no longer need? Um, if you adjust them down to zero or just close them, it effectively does the exact same thing. We are now going to start looking at your W-2s. So you're going to want to verify your W-2 and W-3 information. So edits to the employee name, address, and social security numbers for your 2022 W-2s should be made in the calendar, in the working year of 2022. You'll want to go to payroll, maintenance, employees. And in our case, we're going to be selecting Sally Bay. So Sally Bay had a December marriage. And we know now that her last name has changed and her address has changed. So we want to make sure that we get that accurate here so it will feed accurately in our W-2. You'll also want to be verifying your local and school withholdings for your W-2 IDs. So while working in 2022, you'll want to review your local and school district in school tax withholdings for proper W-2 abbreviations. The W-2 abbreviations are what is going to appear on the W-2, and you don't want any of your employees to look at their W-2 and read a line and go, I have no idea what that is. Then they're going to call you and they're going to ask what this means. So you just want to make sure that these are the proper names or proper numbers for the school districts. So to do this, we're going to go to payroll, maintenance, withholdings. You're going to look at the column that says the W-2 ID. And so as you can see here, we've got our Buckeye Village, we've got Little Village, and we also have East School District and a West School District that all have taxes. And that, what we see in the W-2 ID, is what it's going to look like on the W-2. Now let's say we do decide that we need to edit this because perhaps we've entered in the school district number incorrectly. So we would select it and hit edit, and then the school district is going to look like this, and then we can see that we need to enter the school district number there in that box highlighted by the red. Now, maybe you don't know what the school district number is. You're going to want to hit that blue question mark, and it's going to give you a link that's going to take you over to the Ohio Department of Taxation. And on their website, you'll be able to find a list of all the school district numbers for all the school districts in the state of Ohio. So if you ever need to edit one of the local taxes, it's going to look like this. And again, where we've highlighted in red is where you're going to put in your W-2 abbreviation. So you want to ver in verify your own entity tax information. And this is the federal and state tax IDs and your entity address. So to do this, we're going to be going to general maintenance entity setup 
And then here is where you're going to see where your own Ohio tax ID, federal tax ID are for your entity, as well as the current address. Next, you want to take a look at some of your vendors. So to verify your vendor 1099 information, we're going to go to general maintenance and vendors and payee. So you can use the filters, as our little friend says. As apparently, Bob's guys are infiltrating everywhere. So we're going to take a look at where it says 1099 required and W-9 needed. So if, they, if a 1099 is required, but we also need a W-9, it means we don't have quite the information that we need from the vendors. So when we go W-9 needed... This is going to bring up, in our particular instance, Acorn Tree, Tree Services. So we're just going to select it and hit Edit. We see where it says W-9 needed, but once the W-9 has been returned and we do get that tax ID from them, we unclick the W-9 needed and then put in the, w, the 1099 required after we've entered in their tax ID. So it's also important to know that with these 1099s, you'll want to double check their addresses because as we've experienced last year, only what's here in address line one is going to print on the 1099s. So you'll want to just double check those and make sure it is accurate. Then you want to take a look at your W-2 report. Do that as you see, as that went really fast, we are going to go to payroll reports and statements down to your tax reports federals. And then we're going to use the drop down there to go to the W-2 report. You're going to be selecting all your employees and clicking print. And so when you add and you're going to print, now I'm just really talking about the adding here. Alex, once he gets out of some of these coconut trees, is going to be talking more specifically about the printing. You should have verified your employee information, posted and distributed all wages that will have a post date in 2022. Now, remember, we're just worried about the post dates for the W-2s, the pay periods. You might still be posting for the pay periods of December and January. That's perfectly fine because anything posted in January is going to go on the 2023 W-2s. You also want to make sure you've reported and paid all your quarterly and fourth quarter, all your December and fourth quarter taxes, as well as reviewed your W-2 report and verified that all your 2022 reported taxes agree with the W-2 the W report. So the W, the 20, the 2022 W-2 and W-3s can be added and printed in either work year. So before 2022 is closed after all the wages for 2022 have been posted, you can generate the W-2s and start working on them. Or after you've already closed 2022 while you're in the working year of 23, while in calendar year of 23, you can still be able to add and edit all the W-2s for 2022. So the, for all the W-2s, you are going to have to see this print notice, and you're going to make sure everyone gets a notice along with their W-2s. Alex, who's in a different coconut tree, he can move. So he's going to be talking about that, though. So when we're adding our W-2s, you're going to be clicking Add there, and it's going to give you the system message that only one W-2 may be added per employee, and that once you have one added, the existing ones can be added and deleted if necessary. So once you hit add, you're going to just be selecting every, wait, it's gonna have one of these little dots for click more information. So these are always going to be important to take a look at. And in this case, our note says that W2 report tax amounts withheld, not amounts remitted so that the W-2 wages also typically will differ from gross wages for many reasons. And by clicking on that question mark, we get more information that tells us why, what we're talking about. What we're talking about here is different items have will, have, will exclude or be reduced by uh, different withholding types. 
So your federal Ohio and school district income taxes, they don't exclude any of the non-tax earnings, any of your fringe bent benefit, any of your fringe benefit of your OPRs and OPNF. It can be reduced by your, any salary reductions, cafe plans, or deferred comp you might have. Whereas Medicare, Social Security, and your local income tax items work differently. So they deal with, they just exclude your fringe benefit OPRs and OPNF and are just reduced by your cafeteria plans. This is important to understand because you might have employees who look at the W-2 and they're questioning why they have different amounts in different areas. And they might look at their taxable wages and go, but I made more money this year. And they did make more money than that. It's just, it's been reduced because of different withholding options that you might have. So when you're adding the W-2s, you'll just want to select everybody and click save. Now, all these information on the W-2s can be edited, but you only want to edit it if you're required to, because most of the times the computer's just going to do all the calculations that you need, and we don't want to just be editing things willy-nilly and messing them up. So why would you might want to edit it? Well, perhaps you converted to the UIN payroll this year and you decided not to use the conversion wages posting option. Um, there could have been some errors in payroll posting that did require manual edits throughout the year. You are required to add additional information in box 12 and box 14. Now what that is, we can't really advise you on that or whether that applies to you. You'll need to take a look at some IRS manuals to see what might go into those boxes. And you could be having some, one of your employees could have third party sick pay. Did you have third party sick pay? Well, you would know that because you'd be have deal, dealt with a lot of the forms throughout this year. So it's not going to come as a big surprise if you have that. Now, if you need to edit multiple W-2s of, for box 12 or box 14, you can go and use the W-2 editor or you can edit them one at a time. In this case, we're just gonna edit Steve Friendly. So we're gonna select him and click edit. And then again, another system message comes up. It's important that to edit any of these sections, you have to select the override part of that section to be able to enter anything in. And that if you have selected the override, what's there will be printed out versus the regular. And we're gonna look more closely at what that looks like. So this right here is the edit of the single W-2s. So you'll notice that where we have circled is where you would need to select to override something. And then once you have overrid that section, you'd be able to edit it. Also at the top, you'll notice that your state and box 12 and local and box 14 are their own tabs. So if you do need to edit anything at the state in the box 12, you would select that tab. And again, those are the areas that you would select to override. And then once you select the override, it would allow you to enter in new information below that. And the same is going to be true for your local in box 14. So now let's take a look and see if we had any questions on that. If I deposit in 2023 payroll taxes that were withheld in 2022, they would be a 2022 expense. If they're withheld in calendar year of 2022, then they're a 2022 expense, but the employer portions of that are a 2023 expense. It can get a little confusing, confusing. And if you need a uh, more thorough explanation on that, please call the UAN support line. Now we've got some complicated questions uh, that came over uh, that are not normal. So let's, let's cover a couple of those. Um, Somebody asked if we had retro pay, would they have to edit the prior year W-2? No. Taxes are based on paycheck dates. So if you have to do, and we've had a lot of retro pay calls this year, the 
the taxes are as of the retro pay date. The only thing that goes backward is OPR and, OPRs and OP&F. You have to manually report those in the months they're earned. Uh, you're going to have one retro paycheck that generates the taxes and the total retirement required, but then there are manual OPRs and OP&F reports that have to be filed. And those folks that had a lot of experience helping people with that, uh, filing those retro reports, uh, penalties are involved. So uh, you want to not do that on your own. You always, if they're an OPRS member, call OPRS to understand what they require and whether this uh, is going to be considered retro pay or whether it's a, it's being paid retroactive because you missed the raise. They are not considering that an, if a real retroactive pay raise because retroactive pay raises mean, for example, in July, the governing board adopted new legislation saying we're going to give everybody a raise retroactive to January 1st. It's very different than missing a raise and having to pay retro pay the next year. So taxes are always based on the paycheck date of the retro pay. No problem with taxes. OPRS and op &F have to be reported by month earned. So those can get uh, very dicey. Um, uh, we can't show pre previous slides again, so you can call the support line with any uh, questions that you have. Uh, why would you need to edit the taxes withheld? I think Chris said it's going to be pretty rare, but we have folks that make mistakes during the year. For example, they added the wrong school tax to an employee, they caught it, and then they switched. That's going to require uh, that odd manual edit on the W-2, but 90% of you are not going to edit your W-2s. They will be exactly what was withheld, but we do have people that make very complicated mistakes that will involve complicated uh, manual edits. It's not normal to have to do manual edits to your W-2s. Um, do 22 W-2s include amounts that were paid in 23? No. Taxes are based on check dates. Always have been, always will be. So if your first check in January has a December ending pay period, that only affects OPRS and OP&F. Those are January taxes. They don't belong on the 2022 W-2, and the software handles this beautifully. So if your pay date is January 2nd, for a pay period that has a date, either starting or ending in December, those are January taxes that don't belong on the W-2s. The software will still put them on the December OPRS report. It does handle it beautifully. We're ready for Alex to begin. All right. Thanks, everyone. I was uh, stuck out there for a while. I was scheduled to take a three-hour tour, and it just felt like it took forever. So we're going to talk about printing W-2s now. Uh, as Chris said before, 2022 W-2s can be added, edited, and printed from either work year. So if you're in 22 and you haven't started 23, that's fine. You can set them up, add, edit. And if you've closed out 2022 and you need to do a change, um, you can do that and edit in 2023 also. When you're printing your W-2s, you print the form out on plain white paper. UAN produces the whole form, so you don't have to buy a W-2 form. You do have choices if you'd like to purchase perforated paper. You can do the two per page or the four per page option. Um, that's your choice if you want to. Otherwise, you could print them, print them on plain white paper. When you're printing your W-2s, everyone needs a notice. So when you send your W-2s to the employees, do not forget to print the notice. And I'll show you where to do that next. So when you're printing your W-2s, you're going to go to payroll, reports and statements, external forms, W-2s, and W-3 forms. Here later, you'll be on the screen a few times. We could print our W-2s, W-3s, or e-file just to bring your attention, and we'll cover all those topics. But first, let me draw your attention in the top left corner to where it says print notice. That's where you're going to print your notice. It's going to be the same notice for everyone. It's not individualized, so you can print all your notices at once. You could print one, print one notice and take it to the photocopier and make as many as you need. So uh, if you're doing the notices, you can take care of those all at one time. <clears throat> After you select all your employees and you're ready to print their W-2s, you'll click the Print W-2 option. 
once you do that, you're going to see this screen. On the left side, you're going to have the employer share, uh, the employer section in blue. And on the right side, you're going to have the employee section in green. Starting with the employer section, uh, copy A is going to be M when you're printing and mailing. Copy A is going to be your federal required copies when you are filing by mail. So you're going to have to take care of those. Copy D, you're going to print for your records, either the two-part or the four-part. And if you choose the four-part, it'll be four employees per page. Copy one, you're going to print each state, city, or local tax in the format required by the withholding agency. If you file electronically with the state, so that's if you have 10 or more employees, then you don't have to include a state copy. You want to contact your local taxing agencies to confirm that the format that they would like, either the two or the four part, if filing by paper. When you're electronically filing, there's no need to print a federal copy A or state copy one. Let's jump to the employee section. So that's the green half of that prior slide. You have two choices here. So first, you can do the two part, which prints two employees per page. You'll print each copy, and then you'll have to manually cut and sort those with a notice to distribute to the employees. We recommend printing the four part. Uh, that's one employee per page. You print it once, and you distribute it with a notice. So a little less actual paperwork on your end there. Printing your W-3s. Uh, so it's going to be in the same place as we printed our W-2s. We're going to select everyone and click on Print W-3s. Now this takes a little while because it aggregates all the W-2 information into the W-3. So once you hit that, it's normal for it to load slowly. Once it loads, you're going to see this screen, and the first question is going to be, which kind of employer are you? UAN can't help you with that, but what you can do is see how the entity previously filed if you don't know, and that'll give you that information. On the bottom, on the right side, you're going to see income tax withheld by third-party sick pay. So if you've had third-party sick pay through the year, you know that. You've been manually keeping up with that all year and entering it, so this will be more of the same. If you haven't been doing that all year, then you don't have third-party sick pay, and you can move on and not worry about that field. From here, we'll click the OK button. And now we're going to talk about <clears throat> filing our W-2s and 3s electronically. So the federal copy is going to be uploaded to the Social Security Administration, and the state copy is going to be uploaded to the Ohio Business Gateway. You'll select everyone and then click File on the bottom right. And again, it may take a little while to load because you're doing all the W-2s at one time. You'll see this screen come up next. And the BSO user ID number is provided to you. You'll see it here on the top left of the screen of the slide. That's provided to you by the Social Security Administration. And it's required when you file electronically with the Social Security Administration. If you have 10 or more W-2s, then you have to file electronically. So if you haven't contacted the Social Security Administration to get your BSO number because you're going to file electronically yet, then you're going to want to take care of that right away because it is a lengthy process. And UAN can't assist with that. That's between the entity and the Social Security Administration. So first thing you need to know is kind of employer. Second is, am I filing electronically with the Social Security? And what is my BSO number? Going down on the left side, <clears throat> this is going to be the employer information. And then the email will be for your fiscal officer and contact number. Moving over to the right, we've got the third party sick pay, which we touched on before. If you've been entering that all year, you'll put in your total here. If you haven't, you'll ignore that number. The most important part of this screen is the very bottom where it says file type. So you're going to have different file types. When you're filing your federal form, you want to make sure it says federal on the bottom of the screen. And it says SSA because that's going to go to the Social Security Administration. That's the only place your federal is going to go. Once you have that set, you're going to click on OK. <clears throat> and then it's going to save you down an electronic file. That's going to be on your C drive or your computer under UAN eFiles folder. And from there, you're going to upload that file to the Social Security Administration's website. We're going to do the same thing for Ohio Plus Schools, but it's going to get uploaded on the Ohio Business Gateway. So slightly different for the state side. <clears throat> 
If you note here, there's no BSO number in green at the white box, so that means it's not pertaining to the state side. On the very bottom, you want to make sure when you're filing your state copy that it says Ohio plus schools. That's how you know it's the state file and not the federal file. After that, it'll be the same process. We'll click OK. We'll save down that file to the uh, C drive under UAN eFiles folder. And then you're going to upload that to the Ohio Business Gateway website. As you may or may not know, this year there have been some changes. And the Ohio Business Gateway, if you have the old link saved, now redirects you to Ohio ID. So here's a look at that. The Ohio Business Gateway is still active, but it operates under Ohio ID. If you have the old website saved, it will redirect you here. It's going to be the same login, slightly different look. Deadlines to remember. So January 31st is your deadline to distribute the employee W-2 with notice and mail or e-file with the Social Security Administration, your W-2s and W-3s. So everybody kind of knows January 31st. If you're not sure, you want to check with the state, school, and local deadlines for their W-2 filings. You're going to complete the corresponding W-2 transmittal form if you're filing by mail. And UAN does not produce the state or local transmittal forms for you. Additional reporting for tax withholdings. You can go to payroll, reporting, tax reports other, and then you're going to select the Ohio tax report. You're going to mark the year and click print here. This is going to help you with your annual reconciliation for Ohio tax withholdings. You're also going to see the school and local tax reports. Same place, payroll reporting, tax reports, other, school or local, and then you'll select your school or local, select the year, and hit print. If you must complete an annual reconciliation for local, then you use the local and the same for school. This report you're going to use to complete your online or paper form for state, local, and school. All right, at this point, we're going to talk about uh, some questions we've got on the printing of W-2s. So what do we have here? Let's see. What kind of notices need to be printed? Uh, we went over that before. Um, it's just the W-2 notice. Um, when you go to print the W-2s on that screen, uh, it says notice, and you'll just print that out, and it'll be for your employee. Uh, kind of employer, we can't help you with that one. Uh, can you upload the W-2 to the gateway even if you have less than 10? Uh, yes, you can. So um, the state and federal government are pushing uh, you towards the electronic filing. So there's not a threshold to where you can't electronically file. Um, and they would prefer that you do electronically file. But they're forcing everyone who has more than 10 um, they can't send the paper side. So if you have fewer, you could absolutely e-file those. BSO number, is it the same as it was last year? Uh, the IRS doesn't change it. UAN can't help you with what that is because uh, we don't have a, we don't take part in it. But if you have last year's number, it does not change year to year. So that's uh, the number you're going to need with the IRS. 1096 form, we're going to go over that next. Um, I haven't gotten up to the 1099s and uh, 1096s yet. But uh, it's the aggregate, so it's similar to the W-3. We'll touch on that. Uh, if you did not use UAN for payroll, uh, do you need to worry about registering with Social Security? So if you're going to file your W-2s with Social Security, um, that, yeah. So you do, if you're going to e-file with Social Security, you're going to have to register with them if you're on UAN or not. Um, in this presentation, we've shown you how the e-file is created through UAN, and the rest of the process takes place on the Social Security website. So um, whoever you are using for payroll, you're just going to want to see how they plan to file. Uh, like I said, if it's 10 or more in the payroll, then they're going to have to e-file. So you want to contact them and then um, get with the Social Security Administration so you can get that BSO number. Uh, do we have W-2 digital file upload for Rita? We do not. Um, so the on the local tax level, they're not all standardized the forms. So um, we couldn't produce uh, a local tax 
W two form for all the entities inside the all the taxing entities inside of Ohio. So uh, we do not have the digital upload for Rita. Uh, will we be going over getting a BSO number? Uh, we will not. Uh, it's not a UAN process. Uh, you're going to want to contact the Social Security number, uh, Social Security Administration, uh, on getting a BSO number. Um, so UAN really isn't uh, any part of that, but we just note that you need to have one from Social Security so you can e-file. Uh, will Social Security let you know if you have a BSO number already? Um, you'd have to contact them. Uh, I assume they would, but um, I'm not sure. Do we get the BSO number from Social Security IRS? It's Social Security um, when you're uploading those, so you want to contact them. Now we've covered printing your W-2s. Now we'll talk about printing your 1099s. And the form has changed for this year on the 1099s. So UAN does not print the full 1099 like we do the W-2s. Um, and you'll have to purchase 1099 forms. We'll go over that. But I just want to draw your attention to where it's highlighted in yellow. The new form now says for calendar year, Two zero, and then you're expected to fill out the 22, 23, et cetera, going forward. So hopefully there are not changes to this form and you can keep using it for the future. If you have old forms that you wanted to reuse, but they have the year on them, then they're at a date. So you don't want to go with those. Purchasing your 1099s and 1096s. Uh, if you're going to buy these, they need to be compatible with a laser printer, and we strongly recommend that you do purchase these. Um, office supply stores carry these forms. Uh, many have been approved by the IRS to work on a laser printer. Um, there could be some editing that needs to be done manually, and we'll go over that later. But you're going to want to buy these forms. Um, Carbon-backed and tractor feed forms, so the very old school that either work with a typewriter or a tractor feed printer, they will not work. And on the bottom right, we've got an image here of the tractor feed. So if you're getting a 1099 form that has the perforated sides and the holes, um, that's not going to work on your modern printer. Um, so that's not the form you want. Also, you want to be aware of the difference between the 1099 miscellaneous and NEC. That was a big deal last year, um, so it should be okay moving forward now that uh, the change is in effect. But I just wanted to highlight it because it's not that old. So you want to brush up on the differences between the miscellaneous and the NEC if you're not sure there. You can contact the IRS or a tax advisor if you have questions on which form you should use. 2022 1099s and 1096s can be added and edited and printed from either work year. So similar to the W-2s, if you're still in 2022's work year, you can add, edit, and print. If you've closed out 2022 and you're now working in 2023, you'll still have all those options to work on the 1099s or W-2s. All right, so getting to the 1099 or 1096s, you're going to go to General Reports and Statements and year end. If you have any questions on this, you can contact the IRS and you want to be sure you're selecting the correct form. So either the NEC or the miscellaneous, UAN can produce both. So you just want to make sure you're working on that. There will only be one 1099 form per vendor. All right. So after you select the 1099, so in our example here, we have the NEC, you'll see this screen. You're going to confirm the year as 2022, and you're going to click Add. And now we're going to get into sorting by vendors. Um, I know we had some questions before on this. So when this is when you're adding your 1099s to be created, it's not running the report. But here's where you have some sortability. So first options are 1099 required which is a check mark box when you're setting up the vendor. So you'll do that in your vendor setup and we'll show you that in a second. And then there's the option for all vendors. You wanna make sure your year's on 2022. And let's take a look how that looks here. Jumping to entity or your vendor uh, setup screen. Um, in red here, we have the 1099 required. If that box is not checked, then it doesn't work when you're sorting your 1099s and you check the 1099 required box. So you may want to flip to everyone on that. 
again, it's a check mark for your vendor. So when you're setting up your vendors for the first time, you want to make sure you're checking that appropriately. Going back to creating our 1099s. So on the left on the top here for our filters, we have the 1099 required or all vendors. Those are your two choices. And then on the right side, we can do by amount. So you want to set a threshold for $600 as your minimum, or you can select any amount, and then you would hit the update grid. Now, anybody who converted to UAN this year, you want to be careful with this because if you had uh, a 10, uh, if you had a vendor payment that was prior to conversion to UAN, it's not going to be captured here. So you're going to want to flip to 10. You're going to want to flip to all vendors and any amount, and make sure that you are manually calculating how much was paid before you converted to UAN and factoring that in. So again, that's only for our entities who joined UAN this year. Everyone else, you can use the at least 600 and then find all your vendors that you need a 1099 for. So once you've sorted, you're gonna hit select all, then you're gonna click save and close on that. That'll create our 1099s here. And then I'll show you how to edit the override fields in case you have to make any changes. So you're going to want to select your uh, 1099 or the vendor who you need to edit. And you'll click the edit button. And you'll get a screen that looks like this. So why would you have to edit a 1099? Sometimes you have a vendor where you're making payments to a company under a doing business as. So you want to make sure that your payments and your 1099s are sent to the correct place. Um, you could also have a vendor where a name was changed in the middle of the year. Maybe there was a misspelling or something like that. And the vendor you have set up in the system twice. So that's a common occurrence. Um, every vendor just gets the one 1099. So you would add those totals together and you'd manly, manually override if that was your, uh, if that happened to you this year. Once you're done with your edits, you're going to click save and close. And now you'll be ready to print. So we talked about the 1099 forms that the IRS approved that you could purchase. Uh, not all those forms line up perfectly when you're printing out the 1099. So before you print to your forms, you're always going to want to do a test print. And that's going to be on plain paper. So when you're ready, you're going to test print three 1099s and you're going to load in plain paper. And this is how you do it. You'll select your three and hit print 1099. And then you're going to want to hold that paper up with one of the forms you purchased. It's just to see how everything lined up for those vendors in the appropriate boxes for all three vendors. If everything looks good, you'll load in your purchased forms for the 1099s and hit print. If they are not lined up correctly, you're going to go to general, maintenance, entity setup, and forms. We're going to touch on more, more of that later, but that's just the path you'll have to follow. And we're going to have to do some custom edits on those forms. 1096s, you're going to want to do the same thing when you're ready to print. You don't want to waste your 1096 form. So you're going to want to load in your plain paper and print out a test. So you'll select all your 1099s and click print 1096 if it's aligned correctly. So you're going to hold up the 1096 form in front of the plain paper printout that you have. Hold that up to the light. If all the boxes line up, then you're going to want to load in your purchased form and hit print 1096. If this is not lined up correctly, we're going to go to that same path, general maintenance, entity, entity setup, and forms. That's where we'll be able to do some custom editing, and I'll show you that shortly. So adjusting alignment, here's our path, general maintenance, entity setup, and forms. You're going to click on the forms button here, and you'll get this screen. So the standard layout is your standard default. So you're going to want to click on use custom layout if those boxes didn't align correctly. So you'll have to click there. And then you're going to click on the design button. You're going to want to make sure your year is showing as 2022. And then you're going to click the design, the 1099, miscellaneous, NEC, or the 1096. It all works the same if it's not lining up correctly. On our website, I'm not going to take you through how to do it now because there's a lot of 
testing and dragging the boxes, but we do have a video on how to do this. And it walks you through it really quick. Bob created it from the Professor Shack, so it's really good and informative. Um, you want to go to UAN link under training, year end. And on this slide, it does say scroll to the bottom, but we put the video on top just to confuse me a little bit. So as soon as you go to UAN link, training, year end, and you'll see 1099 form designer custom layout video right on top there. A very quick video shows you how to edit if you have to drag any boxes around that don't print perfectly uh, to your 1099. So printing on those plain papers is a test. You don't want to waste those forms. 1099 and 1096 deadlines. January 31st. You have to mail in your vendor and IRS copies by January 31st. So you don't want to forget that one. Questions on printing the 1099s and 1096s. Let's see here. Uh, can you use regular paper? You can you twos, you cannot for 1099s and 1096s, but you want to print the 1099s and 1096s on regular paper as your test print. So you have to buy the forms, but when you test print your 1099s and 1096s, you want to use regular paper for that. How do you know if a 1099 is required for a vendor? So um, the checkbox of 1099 that I'm required uh, there. That's just in vendor setup. So if um, you know they're required and you check that box, it will filter by that option. If you're not sure if it's required, then um, that's where you'll have the threshold. So this $100 depends on how much you made to that vendor in payments this year. Uh, you can always check with the IRS if you're not sure there. Explain again the difference between the 1099 miscellaneous and the 1099 NEC. Um, for that one, you're really going to want to talk to a tax professional. Um, the IRS made a distinction distinction last year. Uh, basically, the miscellaneous, they moved to miscellaneous income. Uh, most folks are using the NEC, but uh, you're going to want to talk to a tax professional or the IRS on that one. Uh, I looked at the BSO site, and they want personal info, not of the village. Is that correct? Yeah, so um, when you're uh, getting the BSO number with Social Security, they do want to mail a copy of a registration key to your home address. So um, if the previous fiscal officer has that and you don't know the BSO number, then you're going to want to uh, contact the IRS and get that updated. Um, so they are asking your personal address as the fiscal officer where they can mail that confirmation to. That's correct. Can you hand print the 1099 on purchase forms? Um, but the, uh, write them out. Uh, that's your choice if you'd like to, but then you wouldn't be using um, you know, the print feature in UAN to do that. Um, but I have seen them typed. But it's much easier to load in the purchase forms into UAN and print them out there. If a vendor holds stone only, do I need a 1099 NEC? Uh, if you made a payment to that vendor for over $600, then you're going to need to do a 1099. Uh, if you're not sure, you could always ask a, a tax professional, uh, anything like that, or it's, uh, if I should make this payment. Alex, if you're finished answering the questions that are on topic, we can take some questions that uh, we've gotten that were with subjects earlier this morning through now uh, to make up the time. We're going to take lunch at 1130. Are you ready to hand that over, or you want to stay on the line in case you want to answer some of those questions? Yeah, that'll be perfect. I'll, uh, I'll, ha I'll be available to answer any questions on topic. And if you want to go through anything else, Trina, that came up, that would be great. Okay. I'm going to start with some of these that came in earlier today, but after that section was already uh, presented. So, and the question slide was passed. So we, we passed that down to take up uh, time here. So question, where do I go to see if I signed up for a disk or a download? That's a very good question, but uh, you are too late to make that change for the year-end release. But you can uh, take a look at it and see if you want to change that for later. So you have to have good, strong internet to download those releases. Those are huge files. We got a lot of outlying townships that can't. They just don't have strong enough internet. But if you know you've got the strong internet and you've never signed up for downloads or you can't remember, then I want you to go to our website, uanlink.ohioauditor.gov 
and click on the profile login button in the upper right corner. Uh, you're going to log in and that is your UAN four digit ID and your Auditor of State customer number uh, to log in. You want to go down to release delivery and it will show you what you're currently signed up for. And if you would like to change that, uh, let's say you signed somebody before you signed up for downloads and you have not got the internet strength to do the download. You can switch back to disk, uh, but you're going to have to shoot us an email that says, yeah, I just found out uh, I'm going to need the disk mailed to me. Uh, I can't download. Please send me a disk too and make sure you're identifying your entity and give us the uh, address to mail it to. That makes it quicker because if you don't give us the address, we've got to send an email back that says, please confirm your mailing address. <laughs> so uh, we've had a lot of turnover in fiscal officers this year and a lot of times the mailing and the shipping addresses are not being updated with the new fiscal officer so we're going to require you to give us that shipping so log into profile login look at what you're set up for if you're making a change you still have to let us know because that release is already going out as of the setting uh, earlier uh, in December so that there's a cutoff date for that so I need you to check to see what you're registered for. And if you needed to change that, do so and let us know how to deliver. Um, what about my pennies from OPERS? Now, that was an interesting uh, uh, question because on the W-2, you will not see OPERS employer share. You only see the amount withheld in the fiscal year. So for paychecks dated January 1st, 2022 through December 31st, employee share. Those won't line up with the OPERS reports, especially if you've got bi-weekly employees or if your monthly employees are paid for the prior month. Remember, the W-2 is based on paycheck dates. Your OPERS reports is based on pay period end dates. So the rounding difference on an OPERS payment has absolutely nothing to do with the W-2 because the W-2 will only show the employee share, not the employer share. And your OPERS voucher should always exactly match the online payment that included those rounding differences. All right, let me think. Um, we've got some, some questions about just basic things, about what dates do you put on a PO. We're, we're not going to cover those at year end. We need you to contact the support line. That's going to be a conversation that is not going to uh, be related to year end. Um, is there a budget report that shows the July budget amount and the current year actual? No. So if you print your budget financial worksheet showing your account codes, you can uh, print the revenue status report, lay them side by side, and look at the differences. Uh, uh, so that tax budget is somewhat isolated. It's not, it's a plan. It is done in July. So a lot of things could change in that plan. It's not going to show with live things. Uh, Okay, if you know you will be getting a new grant in 2023, but it was not included in your revenue budgets, how do you get the temporary appropriations related to get spending included? Uh, that's a whole thing that is all about I got new money after my amended certificate and after appropriations were adopted. Uh, so when that happens, you want to make sure you understand. So we had... Um, uh, we've got a, a webinar on our website under accounting and training, how to manage your current year operating budget. A lot of times that is going to depend on what your county will certify on your amended certificate uh, at the beginning of each year. So some counties don't allow you to put in a revenue budget for money you haven't got yet that was not included with the tax budget. You have to know your county's policies with regard to getting that new revenue established. So uh, supplemental appropriations, of course, would have to be adopted if that spending is going to have to be uh, managed. So uh, all of those are isolated things that have nothing to do with the actual year-end process, but things do crop up at the beginning of the year that were unplanned. So it's always a call. Always find out the steps to take care of it. 
uh, withholding I'd like names. to jump back in here real quick. Go ahead. Go ahead. Um, so we had some questions on the 1099s and how to e-file those. So guys, if you have questions, um, you want to remember that anything I couldn't cover is going to be in the year-end procedures. A uh, very long document covers how to e-file the 1099s, so you can go over that. Um, also, if you have questions on how you filed something last year and you're not sure, um, so going back to either 1099s or the W-2 section, if it's the uh, type of entity, because um, I've seen a lot of questions on that for the W-2s, you can always look back through prior years in, U in um, UAN. Now, we could see how you set it up. We can't tell if you filed that way. We're assuming you filed. You would know that. But you can always look up prior year filings in UAN when you're doing uh, the 2022, it's the same path. You would select 2021 or a different year sooner, and you could see how those forms, what was selected on there. So that's a good thing to note. And if you have uh, 1099s or W2, W2 questions, again, um, the year-end procedures, it's going to be very lengthy, and it covers a lot of those answers. So um, this was like the, uh, the overview, uh, maybe the high-level view, you want to say, and that will get you down into the weeds. So... Uh, just keep it keep an eye on that this is your best procedures outline and the year-end practices really goes through everything for you thanks alex that was good i'm glad you jumped in and got that out of the way because you just taught that subject okay i've got some ones uh, again from earlier today withholding names can only be edited each year when you open temp mode once you're past that screen you can't edit the name of a withholding so that was very clear. But can old withholdings used in the past and prior year be removed? Absolutely. You can do that right now. If you, if you go to payroll maintenance withholdings and you still have active withholdings that haven't been used by your employees, if you try to remove it and it tells you that they're still attached to the employees, you'd have to edit the employees, go to withholdings tab, you might see it on the withholdings tab with a zero, so it's not actually being withheld. Or you might have to look at the inactive list of withholdings to see it there. If it hasn't been used in the current year, the software will let you remove it. So it would have to be removed from each of the employees' inactive list before the main withholding could be removed. But it can always be deactivated. So from that main list of withholdings, you can deactivate anything you're not going to use again. Or for example, if only one employee had that school tax and now nobody else has it, you could deactivate it. And then if you get somebody back in as an employee that needs it, you would just reactivate it and check and verify the, the rate is correct. Good question. Um, we've still got five minutes. I'll keep going. Um, and here's a good question. When we have entered temporary appropriations, when it's time to do our permanent appropriations, do I consider the temporary appropriation amount? No. Well, what your, your question's a little convoluted, so I'm just going to state it the way it may sound easier to understand. When you adopt permanent appropriations, the amount is for the whole year you don't reduce your permanents by the temps. The permanents have to be at least as much as the temps. Uh, so if you, you the permanents are backwards to January 1st and forward to year end, temporary appropriations are only for that period of time before the permanents are adopted, but that has to take place before March uh, 31st because April 1st, if there's no permanents in that software, you will not be paying bills <laughs> your current year. Um, with libraries having to change uh, codes from the 100 to 200 programs to the detail, uh, can you change codes if you duplicate POs? Well, we're a year from that happening, Jennifer, but it is our understanding that those duplicate POs will not be available if they had a 100 or 200 program. Now that, I mean, we're a year out. But, uh, and that could change, but I think there, that it's just not going to be there. Anything with a 100 or 200 program. So this year, you just definitely want to make a list of uh, the purchase orders you need. And then once you've established what that new account code number is, you're going to uh, make yourself a note of on a crosswalk 
So when January rolls around, if those are not available to duplicate, you'll be able to add them in quickly. And then from that point, you're back on the duplicate path. Three minutes. Uh, here was a good one. Do remaining balance and appropriation accounts carry over? No, they don't. So only purchase orders carry over to the new year. If you have uh, $50,000 in, uh, you kind of mixing up the subjects. Uh, if you have appropriations in 2022 for $50,000 and you only spent 10000 of that, January, that, that account code is wiped back to zero. Appropriations that are unspent and unencumbered don't carry over to the new year. Each year's, year's appropriations are fresh. If you have a purchase order for something you purchased that was ordered in the current year and it's carried over uh, to the new year, you will pay your bills off that prior year purchase order, those 2022 uh, appropriations. I had two minutes left. Uh, last year's year in procedures recommend we not enter permanent appropriations in temporary mode. Uh, that's not quite what it says. What it says is you want to be careful adopting permanent appropriations before you have your first amended certificate. Uh, we get folks that do that every year and then they carry over POs and they that reduces the resources available and they get an amended certificate for less than what they've adopted as permanent appropriation. So we don't recommend that you do that. Now that's going to affect our clients that um, mostly affect the clients that appropriate 100% of their money, uh, their resources. Uh, you're not going to have that wiggle room. But folks that leave uh, some resources not appropriated, it's really going to depend on the time involved. If you're sitting in December and you haven't closed any of your 2022 purchase orders, the software is not going to let you enter permanent appropriations because you haven't done things in the proper order. So it is, uh, if you want to discuss that more fully, please call the support line so we can have that one-on-one -on -one conversation. So it's not recommended, but there is, we're not going to stop you from doing it, but you might have problems entering it in the software. Uh, slide 169 in our setup. I don't know whether you can see that. It's like slide 34 on the screen. And we're going to talk about the year in checklist. So if you look at the best practices, uh, that's that group right there in the middle of page four, work through the year in checklist. So the year in checklist isn't going to be available until you install the release. Uh, so if you looked at it now, you could look at what's in there from prior years, but you're not going to be able to add the year in release, the year in checklist for the current year. So this is after you've done the install. Now the year in checklist is one of those things that has, there's at least three starred items in there that you're going to need to get some advanced work on in order to know what to put in the system at that point. Um, so you want to take a look at it. And there are some very easy slides you can get under your belt in here uh, that I'll talk about in that in within the checklist that you could do something about pretty early on. But then remember that the year in checklist is the part of the software that has the button to close the year. So you can't close the year until the minimum requirements are met. And that will give you the overall green check mark. So let's talk about the year in checklist. Uh, remember, folks, uh, that if you're new, if this is your first year, you are probably going to have to read through the full year in procedures to understand this. But I'm going to give you an overview and explain what these tabs are. So when you go in your system to general maintenance year end and year end checklist, you will see all the prior years closed in UAN. For every one of our clients that is brand new this year, uh, you're going to see nothing there because you don't have any prior years in your software. Uh, but folks that have been on the software, like our fake Buckeye Township, you're going to see all the prior years closed. Now, to open the current year, year in checklist, you're going to click that button. And even once it's in uh, the list, once you've opened it and saved it, uh, it will keep everything that you set in it. And uh, some things won't save, so stop trying to get that those check boxes. I'll talk about those to save until the end. Uh, but you'll be able to click the current year button to reopen the current year. 
uh, the button works both ways. So <laughs> one and two are kind of a, we give you a couple of green check marks. All you have to do is breathe and you're going to get those two green check marks because number one is you have to have installed 23.1. Well, the fact is if, if you hadn't installed 23.1, you can't get into the, to the, uh, 22 year in checklist anyway. So I think that they decided that she, we got to give you some green so you don't completely flip out when you see this. This is, this can be very intimidating. And number two, the date, the computer date has to be in December. Well, the release wasn't issued until after December 1st. So you couldn't have, uh, done that. You couldn't have installed the release before December 1st. And we had that just by breathing. We've got that one. Now, number three is different you have to open temporary mode. So we emphasize that more than once uh, during the presentation because without fail, we will get questions uh, on the support line that say, why didn't temporary mode open? Remember, Christopher showed you earlier today, you have to open temporary mode when you are ready to start getting work done ahead of time in the new year. Take advantage of that option. It is a big deal giving you that early access to the new year. Why wouldn't you take advantage of that? All right. Now, let's talk about the things that you have to do something about. Well, tabs A, 4A through 4H all have to be green before you can close the year. And yet, some of those can't be green until you are just ready to close the year. The others could be filled out and green for quite some time. But you have to understand, if you install the year-end update later today and you open temporary mode and you open your year-end checklist, some of the information you're going to see is not relevant to closing the year. You simply haven't done the things in 22, such as complete 22 year transactions. So you're not ready to close the year. It's not relevant at that time. But once you get into January, the things you're looking at should be more relevant. Now, this is one of those years where December 31st falls on a weekend. It's a Saturday and it matters because the bank reconciliation in UAN has to be dated 1231. So you're not going to be able to close the year if your bank reconciliation is dated 1230. And many of you are going to get bank statements that say as of 1230 because they don't clear anything on the weekend. They always uh, issue their statements on the last working day of the month. I kicked my cord. Let me make sure I haven't unplugged my my speakers and get that out of the way. Sorry about that. Um, so the bank reconciliation has to be dated 1231. And the problem is you can't add a bank. So let's say it's December 30th and late in the evening and you've downloaded your bank statement. The software won't let you do a 1231 bank rec. So please, 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 you can add it as of December 30th. But then the next day, you will have to advance that date. There's a way to do that in the software. You can call the support line if it's necessary. It's not something that everybody needs to do. You just have to add your bank reconciliation as of 1231, or you will not get the green check mark on this five bank reconciliation. It has to be December 31st. I'm going to nag about that again. It must be 1231-22. And I know a lot of you folks, it is December 5th, and you have posted that November bank reconciliation already, and that's that's not a bad thing. But the December bank reconciliation is different. It's very different. Because you know that when you posted that November 30th bank reconciliation, you locked down every date of the year up January 1st through November 30th. Nothing else can be dated in your transactions backward in that time. has to be dated after the bank rec. So when your bank rec is 1231, you've locked down the whole year. You have locked down the whole year. So what we want you to do is, yes, reconcile as soon as you can. There's nothing wrong with that. But save your bank rec and don't post it. The software will leave that sitting in the bank reconciliation batch you're not doing anything that's going to throw you out of balance. It's going to sit there and you'll say, well, wait a minute. I have to take my meeting is January 4th. I have to take my December bank reconciliation report to the governing board. Well, the software will let you print a batch 
bank reconciliation report that will show you are reconciled. Let me show you. If you go to accounting reports and statements, bank reconciliation reports, you can see that screenshot right there. You want to click on the options tab because when you're producing a bank reconciliation report from this area, the box include cleared is automatically checked. You don't need a list of cleared items. So when someone's trying to look backwards at a, a bank rec earlier this year to see the cleared items because they haven't reconciled in months and they're trying to see what was cleared incorrectly, the cleared report is important. But when you're just doing the batch bank reconciliation report to take to your governing board in January, it's not necessary to include the cleared items. You can uncheck that box and uh, print that report and let them know it's a batch because when you post the December 31st bank rec, it locks the year down. You want to be able to adjust those POs. Now remember, on the best practices, by the time we get to this point of ready to work through the year and checklist, you should have already adjusted your POs and BCs to the exact carryover balance. There should be nothing surprising. But folks, do come in the work through the year and checklist section early and get some things done. There's nothing wrong with that, but you don't want to lock your year down until you've got these earlier things checked off your list. I've done it, okay? So save but don't post and then print the batch report. And then when you actually get to the point in the year in best practices, which is later down that page four, you'll see complete the December 31st bank reconciliation. When you get to that point, then you know you're locking down the year you're ready to print your AFR reports, get your notes done, you've got final figures, that's when you're going to come back to the bank reconciliation and transactions, check a market, edit and post, and go post that bank rec. So December is just different than every other month because you can't, if you jump ahead and lock down the year and then you have to do one more thing, you have to void the bank rec. So the December bank rec is the only one that can be voided. And again, it has to be dated December 31st. So nag, nag, nag about the bank rec. I hope that sticks in your minds. All right. Outstanding adjustments on the December 31st bank reconciliation are automatically forced to be cleared on that December 31st bank rec. And you can't uncheck them. Why is that? Because if you posted them, they are carrying over as if they were cleared. And if you're new and you see this, you're going to freak out because it'll probably throw you out of balance and there's someone's made these adjustments when they shouldn't have. Uh, you may have, let's say, audit adjustments from April and those audit adjustments don't net to zero. Sometimes that's the case. And when you clear them, they'll throw you out of balance. Well, that should have been discussed with audit a long time ago, back in April, when I posted my April bank reconciliation, those should have been cleared. And then I could have addressed that with audit. So if that's been shoved down the road, this is where these conversations have to come from. So if you don't know, uh, you're new. We've got lots of new fiscal officers. This is be your first bank reconciliation doing your November bank rec. You want to look at the primary adjustments tab in the bank reconciliation. Uh, you get a pop-up that says, I think I have that in there, outstanding adjustments exist. They have to be dealt with. Uh, otherwise, the software is going to force them clear whether they throw you out of balance or not. You're going to have to deal with them then. So we highly recommend that you look at your last posted bank reconciliation and see if there's an outstanding adjustment list. It'll be the last page of your bank reconciliation. If you have no outstanding adjustments, this is not going to be a problem for you. If you do, you need to identify those, see if they need to be reversed, or see if they do need to be cleared. All right. Oh, we got a couple of tourists who pulled up on the island in some, some jet skis, and now they can't get off. That three-hour time warp. Um, we will direct them uh, over to uh, Gilligan's Hut, and then we'll take them with us when we leave the island today. Uh, we don't want them uh, lost for 10 years. So let's talk about these group four tabs. These, are, these can be very confusing. I want you to make notes about which items can be done ahead of time and which items have to wait until later to finish. So you could be on this section, work through year-end checklist quite a lot. Uh, remember, year-end is not one day. 
it can go on for two or three weeks as you go into 22, out, into 23, out, and you're getting things done in uh, the years that are required. So you think of this as I have access to both years to get whatever needs done when it should be done. Uh, it is a wonderful out, uh, opportunity to uh, take a more relaxed approach to year end. All right, so group four, I'm going to guide you right through it. 4A is batch transactions. Now, if you look at these today, <laughs> you can have receipts, payments, purchase orders, wages, or withholding payments in your batch in 22, and those are relevant to right now. You're just like, well, I've got wages I've got to post for payday and withholding payments that need to be made today. Okay, but that's not relevant to closing the year, right? Because those are going to be posted and not no longer in batch before December 31st. That's that's what those are about. But let's say it's January 5th, you're done with transactions in 2022, and you accidentally logged into 22 instead of 23, and you put a receipt in batch, and of course the software is not going to let you post it because you're trying to use a 23 days. You just need to delete that out of the batch and get into 23 and post it where it belongs. If it was deposited in 23, it needs to be posted in 23. So that's what that's looking at. So it's going to be relevant to when you're trying to close the year. That's when it's more meaningful. So if I'm sitting on January 15th and I really am ready to close the year, I need to have green check marks on these items that I've uh, highlighted. Now, if you want to look at your year end checklist early, uh, folks that do direct deposit but don't upload the electronic file, this is going to be relevant to you. So their banks may not offer uh, the upload uh, file process, and they may not be processing that EFT batch all year long. So we highly recommend that you process the EFT batch even if you don't need the file. Uh, number one, it produces a report that shows the total of individual net paychecks and the total for all of them, uh, which is nice to use on your bank's website to put in uh, the net paycheck amounts. Uh, but it also groups the direct deposits together on the bank reconciliation, making it very easy to clear that batch payroll. Uh, but if you have today 43 EFT batches unprocessed, that means you have not been, or the former fiscal officer has not been processing that EFT file, and you need to go to payroll transactions EFT and create the batch file for every single one of them until you've caught up. Now, are you going to do anything with that file? No, you're just going to permanently delete them. Whether you print the report for the batch is up to you or not. It clearly did not get posted back then. You are certainly not going to upload those to the bank because they weren't necessary. These are the old EFT batches you did not process. So you should be processing that every time. Folks that do the file upload, are automatically creating that file and uploading it to the bank. So they're not going to see those uh, unless they've made some mistake they haven't corrected. So folks that do manual typing in on the bank's website for direct deposit, you will need to process the EFT batches. Uh, this one is what you want to look at if you've got the payroll software and you've done wage adjustments this year. These only come from wage adjustments. So you may have withheld something that had to be refunded if it was a pre-tax item, it was then taxed, creating new taxes, and those have to be used, either the credits or the new taxes, have to be paid before December 31st. These things can't carry over to the new year, even if you need them to. So folks that have done wage adjustments in December, we should have been telling you, you've got to take care of these before December 31st. They won't carry over. So the IRS and the state doesn't care if you make two tax payments in the month. You just simply can't carry these things over to the new year. So if you need to know, let's say you're new in the last couple of months and uh, you want to know whether these are going to be a problem for you. Today, if you went to uh, payroll reports and statements withholding reports from the drop-down list, dun 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 dun, dun. From the drop-down list, very much at the bottom there, you'll see withholding adjustments unpaid. If you get no data to report, this is not something you have right now. It's not going to pop up and stop you from closing the year. If anything is listed, you need to select those items, print the report, and figure out what those are. 
So if they're from earlier this year and you didn't use these adjustments as you should have, we need to get that taken care of. So sometimes it's something you can just add to your next tax payment, but not always, not always. So if you don't understand what that is, please call the support line. Let's help you figure that out uh, before December 31st. All right, moving on to tab 4B. This is a starred item, so there's information to gather before you can complete this tab. And the little jumping to says there's really two parts to this page, so we want to look at them a little one at a time. So I'm going to show you the top portion first, and so we can see it nice and big on your screen. So the first thing you're going to do is choose your submission type. And submit through UAN is default because that is the easiest thing for you guys to do is just submit through UAN. It means you have to finish your notes to the financial statement, save them as a PDF and add them into UAN. And then when you close the year, and Alex is going to show us that process, the notes are inside the software and it files a complete file to the Hinkle system and we have your file for audit. So if you are filing regulatory or ACBOA, you should not be opting out. And notice it doesn't say opt out. There is nothing there to choose opt out. Folks that are filing uh, GAAP or FASB, GAAP or FASB financial reports, and some of our cities, uh, libraries, large villager townships are filing GAAP or FASB, you have to mark complete these requirements online. Uh, the Hinkle system emailed us about this time last year and said, we want you to take a look at this list of people who said they were filing GAP and FASB and find out why they're doing this because they're actually filing regulatory. So <laughs> we would say a very high percentage of the folks that opted out to file GAP and FASB ended up filing regulatory. There is absolutely no reason to do that. I know some of those uh, were villages who have a mayor's court who are not running mayor's court through their books as they should. So they are actually paying somebody to rewrite their financial statements to include mayor's court. It is not difficult to run mayor's court through your books. So why not do that so you can save some money and have your financial reports produced by UAN? If that is the only thing missing from your financial report, it's very easy to include in that financial statement. Uh, we had a lot of folks that said they were filing GAP uh, and filed regulatory through an IPA auditor. Uh, so you've contracted with your IPA auditor to do your notes, and then they want the control to file. They're, you're not supposed to be doing that. If somebody else is, you're contracting with someone to type their notes, you should be, t you send them your annual financial reports, uh, which is coming up. Uh, Bob will run you through how to get your financial reports. You save them as a PDF, you send them over to the person writing your notes, they'll write your notes, send you back the PDF document, you add them into UAN and submit through UAN. There's no reason to opt out just because someone else is typing your notes. Um, so please only use that requirement to submit GAP and FASB for submitting GAP and FASB. Uh, if you are submitting GAP and FASB and you click uh, complete GAP and FASB, you're going to get this uh, system message. Yes, there's the red box, Trina, but there's the system message. So uh, the the Hinkle system thinks that folks think they can get a an extension to file if they're filing GAP and FASB. You don't. Um, it's the same deadline. So choosing GAP and FASB is not going to give you any additional time. There is no extension of temporary mode in the UAN software. So while you might request and receive an extension to file your annual financial report, the UAN software is not going to extend temporary mode. 23 will shut down until you complete and close 22 if you are after the deadline to file. So using this option is not going to give you that any extra time. So be planning to file uh, through UAN. If you are contracting out your notes, you tell them you want those notes completed and back to you before the deadline to file. Uh, we get a lot of calls on those last few days. Now, if you are filing GAP and FASB, you should be emailing the Hinkle system and requesting the opt-out code. And they will ask, you know, you want to tell them you're filing GAP or FASB, and they will send you an opt-out code that gets entered in UAN right here. So GAP and FASB folks, 
when you click this button say okay you're going to enter in the opt-out code and save and what that means is you'll be able to proceed and close your year and file through UAN but it won't go to the Hinkle system so audit will still have your complete file UAN will have your complete file for billing purposes and the Hinkle system will be waiting for you to manually type in that report uh, so you still submit through us when you are filing GAP and FASB reports it just doesn't go to the Hinkle system all right additional reports are automatically included in this file it's another reason why you don't want to pretend you're opting out is because when you get audited uh, they're always sending you a list of all these reports they want for the two years they're going to be audited and you're going to send all those PDF reports for two years well submitting through UAN the software is automatically going to create these PDF reports we've been doing this for a couple of years so you won't have to when they load your file into their audit workbench software they will already have access to these reports and you shouldn't get such a long list um, if you do get a long list anyway I'm afraid you need to respond to them uh, but those auditors that are using the workbench software as they should will be able to produce those reports without asking you to do so uh, so you don't want to turn that could you say do not include these additional reports well I do know some people like to work a lot harder that would be the only reason to choose do not include these additional reports it's it's uh, to your benefit to do so all right this is the lower section of tab 4b and this is where you're gonna have to gather this information so these two boxes are gonna automatically fill out for you yay because the software already knows you've put in the total permanent appropriations Ta-da! and then the software already knows your unrestricted general fund carryover cash balance based on what you've done in the software it automatically is going to produce that number if you don't know where that number is coming from uh, print a fund status and look at your carryover encumbrances um, perhaps that is uh, you haven't closed out purchase orders that have to be closed before you close the year so uh, that number is going to be fluid until it's absolutely determined this is exactly what my unrestricted general fund cash balance is but the software will do those two numbers for you now townships villages and libraries have all this information you see but villages and libraries have a couple more questions such as how many utility customers you have uh, villages you'll have that one in libraries how many patrons it's other such uh, questions that are all about uh, libraries but for the most part you're going to have these core all three of those entity types are going to have these core special districts you don't have this so you if you go to tab 4b all you have to choose is how you're going to file and if you want to include those extra reports uh, but everybody else is going to have to fill this information out so let's talk about uh, the required field this is the one that's green right we all know green are required fields however that is the minimum requirement and everybody has more we can't make them green because everybody doesn't have debt and everybody doesn't have inside or outside millage so we have to make only the things that everybody has as a required field and you have to know what the rest of it is so population the census gives you your population um, on those rare occurrences when you pay for a uh, a population survey and you are allowed to use that as your official population that's the only time you're not going to get that number from the census and I think that's extraordinarily rare and most of you don't have that figure other than uh, the census so don't call UAN and say where do I get the census information you'd Google it just like the rest of the world does uh, that's where you this you'd look at the census the actual official census numbers now these three numbers are going to come from your county auditor the full tax rate per thousand inside and outside millage is a tax rate for example your inside levies perhaps could be 1.5 and your outside levies could be one it's going to be particular to your levies not anybody else's you can't call the neighboring township and say what numbers should I put here if these are your figures so if you don't know what they are call your county auditor these three numbers will come from your county auditors uh, figures and they probably have already given that to you in some way uh, earlier this year uh, but you might not know or you might not have been the fiscal officer uh, at the time so county is going to give you the inside and outside millage tax rate per thousand and then this third one is the total assessed property tax valuation that's a dollar figure it's not a rate 
That's the only one of the three that is a dollar figure. So those come from the county auditor. Uh, these down here at the bottom, you can't call UAN and say, what kind of loan do I have? We don't know the answer. We can't figure it out. If you can't tell from your loan documents, you're going to have to call uh, the bank or lending uh, agency and talk to them. What kind of a loan is it? And then perhaps call local government services and have that discussion with them. Where should it go if it's this? And the number they're looking for here in this box is as of December 31st, what is the outstanding principal? So it doesn't include all unpaid loans. If you have an interest-bearing loan, then it doesn't include the interest. It is the outstanding principal. And this is not the only place you're going to see debt information having to be entered at year end. So it's just one of the many places. And yes, you have to repeat information in some places. So you're going to have to find those figures. And this is why this has got a star on it. This is information that has to be gathered in order to put it in here. All right, that takes care of 4B. All right, 4C, uh, the big deal here, which has been the big deal for many years, is that little X I've just highlighted is not going to turn green until you type up your notes, save them as a PDF, and add them in the software. And Alex is going to show you how to do that later. So you could be almost ready to close the year and typing up your notes for about a week or so. Uh, some of you get a lot of advanced work done on those, and then you're waiting for the last few figures, and you finish them up, add them in, boom, 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 close the year. So on this tab, you're not going to get the notes done first, because a lot has to be done to get the final figures for the notes. So that X is not going to turn to a green check mark until almost last. But the rest of this information can be dealt with. So in this box, you are going to choose the type of annual financial report that you're filing. Now, you're looking at that going, I'm new in the last two months. How do I know? Well, remember when we we logged in to uh, this section. So let me see if I can show you without losing my place. <laughs> Remember when we logged into the year-end checklist and it showed me all the prior year filings? There's a clue. So this entity, fake Buckeye Township, has filed regulatory all the way back to 2015. I would say 95% of our clients file regulatory for one reason or another. Um, you want to be especially careful if you are new and you don't know the answer to what should I file. Because if your entity is under an IPA contract, that means you're not going to be audited by the state of Ohio. You are going to be audited by an independent um, auditor. Uh, so a lot of people are under IPA contract for more than one audit. And the language of that contract says you will file regulatory. So make sure, and I believe you can go on uh, the e-services account, remember UAN doesn't ha have access to e-services, so we can't see what you see. But I believe I have seen where uh, uh, we've seen in other trainings with the Honor State that you can go to, uh, log into your e-services account, and you can see a tab there for audit. And if you go there, you'll see your IPA contract. Well, you can look at that contract. Is it regulatory? Does it say you have to file regulatory, or does it say you have to file ACBOA? Somebody negotiated that contract. For something specific. So you can't, uh, and I've had this happen where I'm on the support line and a middle way through a year, a fiscal officer would call and say, I filed ACBOA and I just got a call from my auditor that said I had to file regulatory and that never made any sense to me. It's because they were under the IPA contract for regulatory. So that contract is going to say what you have to file. So newbies, you want to take a look at that contract. UAN can't help you with that. Uh, it's in your e-services account. So take a look at what's been filed in the past. That's your first step to figuring it out. Read the year-end procedures about the difference between the two so that you understand uh, those. And uh, let me get back to the slide where we were. And that's part of your decision-making pro processes. What shall I file? Um, if 
you are filing OCBOA. If your entity has filed OCBOA, you are audited by the state of Ohio, so you don't have to worry about an IPA contract, then you could still choose OCBOA. And you can see the difference between the two is there in parentheses. Depending on what your investments are, that's the type you're choosing. Now, if you are an OCBOA filer, there's a whole lot of things that have to be done to classify uh, information. Uh, remember, OCBOA is a, a more comprehensive annual financial report. It is recommended. However, uh, there are restrictions if you're under IPA contract uh, for regulatory, but it takes a little more time to do. Folks that have been doing OCBOA for years will tell you, it's not that bad. You just have to know what to do, and the year in procedures covers those steps. Now, so each one of those areas have to be visited to complete the OCBOA report. But when you choose regulatory, <laughs> you notice that all went away. So I I don't really wonder why 95% of our clients are filing <laughs> regulatory at all. Uh, it is an easier annual financial report. OCBOA is recommended. It is more comprehensive, but clearly less work. Uh, you still have to pay attention. Regulatory filers this means you met the minimum requirements. You may have requirements that need to be done, which is beyond the minimum requirements. So let's talk about that. One of those things, and some of you are out there and you know that you have to do this every single year. If you have a fund that needs to be mapped, it is something, you can't just set a fund to be mapped and it's that way all year. It is part of the year end process, manually done, each year end. You can't set it up to happen all the time. It's not supposed to be that way. It shouldn't be forever. Uh, the exception to the things we are allowed to tell you, and Bob's going to cover this again, we are allowed to tell you if you have an unclaimed money fund, it does have to be mapped every single year end, but it is a manual process. You regulatory filers, OCBOA filers as well, but regulatory, you see nothing's going to stop you. Uh, you've met the minimum requirements just by <laughs> marking the regulatory box and then all you have to do is add in your notes and you're done. But if you've got an unclaimed money fund, you have to go map it. Uh, the instructions are year in the year end procedures. Bob's going to cover that later. And you would do the mapping at general reports and statements year end AFR fund utility. So you can't call UAN and say, what funds should I map? Because the only one we're allowed to talk about is unclaimed money. And the fact is, we're only supposed to use that in this presentation. And now you have that information. It's, it's not something that we can tell you, you can map this other fund to this other fund. We're, that's absolutely not up to UAN to tell you that. You should be following your auditor's instructions. If they told you, you can map a fund, you can map it. Otherwise, you shouldn't be fighting with audit about funds that don't belong. And that's all I'm going to say on that. All right, tab 4D, entity and fiscal officer. This is so easy. I could sit in the shade while doing it. Well, I'm going to fill out this information. Uh, don't stress over the modem number. That one cracks me up every year. We are so far beyond the years where people had a modem number that you had to dial into that it cracks me up. So I, I don't know that any of you have a modem number. So don't stress over that one. Leave it blank. Uh, it, this is basically information the auditor is going to be able to contact you when it's time to do your audit. They will have that file. Remember, you submit through UAN. All this information is in the audit file. They will know who to call. Now, you have to type in those numbers. It makes you type in the numbers in the email address. Uh, this information down here is already in the software. So if you are looking at that, and that is not your name, and you are the new fiscal officer, you need to change this before you close the year. Uh, the fiscal officer name right there is what's printing on receipts and purchase orders. So if that still says the former fiscal officer name, that needs to be fixed. So you would go to general maintenance entity setup, where you can put the fiscal officer name in that box. Uh, but that's where that gets changed. It doesn't get changed right here. All right, 4E, hardware and mailing. Uh, this is one that you can get out of the way ahead of time. It's very simple. Uh, this is the address section. And it's asking you for the physical address of the state-owned hardware. And uh, we get folks who are 
really concerned about this question because they have a laptop and they take it home and they take it to the township. What address where I put it here? Where does it spend most of its time? I mean, we're really not asking you to give us hours and everything. Just give us where the majority of the time it sits as a physical address, and that's fine. Now, in my case, that is the township's office, and that is the same as our mailing address. We don't have a P.O. box. Mail is delivered to our door. So I could check the box down below for mailing address, same as the hardware address. But that's not going to be the same for a lot of you. Some of you have the physical address of your home, but your mailing address for the township is a P.O. box. So uh, make sure you're looking and filling in the correct information in those address fields. All right. Here is different. We need the Auditor of State inventory number. It's on a sticker on your computer, whether it's a desktop or a laptop. We don't need the printer, the monitor, the keyboard, the mouse. We need the computer is the only one that has that inventory number. So I need you, those big blue question marks, I can't click them here in the slideshow, but the big blue question marks show you a picture of the laptop and the desktop and what the stickers look like. So uh, I found a really neat tip, <laughs> as somebody may have mentioned in past years, that uh, the Auditor of State inventory number is not small. I think uh, most of us could see that, and I've got trifocals. But that computer serial number, <laughs> I have to take a picture with my phone and then uh, pinch to make it bigger so I can see those numbers. So that picture, again, will show you what the sticker looks like, what the number we're looking for is. And you can type those in. Now, what we're looking for, the UAN records will show there in that box. And if yours matches, you can check those boxes. So this is not a difficult tab. It's one that you can get out of your way, save, and it'll be a green check mark. And that's less to do when you're trying to close the year. Uh, let's go to the next slide. 4F, next year FO and details. Well, for those of you who are not going to quit and you are planning to get through this year in process, uh, come what may, then next year's fiscal officer is the same as the current fiscal officer. You're going to plug through and get this done. Remember, we're, we're on the support line to help you. Uh, call in when you've got questions. We will send you right to the instructions uh, that will get you through that section. We don't care how many times you call. You just keep calling back if you get stuck. Some of you, however, have let us know you're going to be retiring December 31st and you've been training your replacement. If that's correct, then we want you to check this dot, newly elected or appointed fiscal officer as of and the date they're taking office. Uh, so some of you have worked out a transition where you're actually retiring December 31st and then you are becoming the assistant and they are becoming the fiscal officer January 1st. In that case, uh, you're going to tell us the newly elected appointed fiscal officer as of January 1st would be and there's the new person. Now how about those of you who told your trustees months ago, I am retiring December 31st, you need to get on this and get someone hired and they're doing nothing about it and you are absolutely without question retiring December 31st. Well, in the date the fiscal officer is taking over, it would be January 1st, and the name would be to be determined. And I don't know what to tell you about what to put uh, in the phone and email. You might have to put uh, one of your trustees uh, so the audit would know how, who to call uh, for that information. Uh, so I know some people have had that problem that they have not found a replacement, um, and they are actually going to retire as scheduled because they gave him a lot of notice. All right, so what's the bottom section about? Well, we told you at the very beginning that 2015 is going to drop off your books, and you have to acknowledge that you've been told that, and you know it. So can we make you print those reports for 2015? Nope. Can we make you go in the closet and look and see if they're already in a box? Nope. But you will acknowledge that you understand this is going to happen, and if records end up missing, Right, it's on you. So you want to make sure that if you're not going to go look, get them printed unless you have a records retention schedule that you can preserve those as PDF. But if those PDFs get damaged on a flash drive and you can't retrieve them, you have some problems there. So a PDF is not always the answer to I don't want paper because you can actually lose those as well. Uh, you will be responsible for the choices you make. Okay, we get a lot of people that call in about tab 4G and the next one as well. This box is not going to stay checked. 
stop trying to make it look green. So we get people who I'll make him stop doing that because it's funny only once or twice. So what happens is we get people going in here in December, like today. You could go into your year-end checklist to get a lot of these things done. There would be po no point in acknowledging that you know you're carrying these over because you haven't done anything about your POs. It would show a complete list of all your POs. You are not going to carry those over. There is no point in acknowledging that. This is one of the last things you're going to check. And when you're looking at this, when you close the year, you better be sure you mean to carry these over because you can't reverse it. Once you close the year and you've carried $300,000 of purchase orders over by mistake, I'm afraid you have to live with it. So I, I need you to pay attention to this list. So if you looked at it today, it's not relevant. You don't need to acknowledge it and save it. It's not going to turn green. You don't need it to turn green until it's actually, I know this is closing and I know the results of carrying these over. Okay? This should be only the POs you're carrying over. Same with the unpaid withholdings, 4-H. If you looked at it today, these are not the final numbers. Um, lots of people still have payroll, two payrolls to post, uh, maybe even three payrolls to post in December uh, for different frequencies. So this is just informational until you get to the point where you really are ready to carry over. In that case, we're all used to looking at unpaid withholdings. Unpaid withholdings are not the same thing as carryover. So like Christopher said at the beginning, if they were unpaid as of December 31st and you carry them over and you've already paid them in 2023, this form is still going to show you as of 2022, December 31st, what was unpaid. Forever, it's going to show they were unpaid. You are acknowledging that is accurate. Unpaid is not the carryover encumbrance every single time. So anything that has an employer share is different than the employee share. So we all know unpaid means unpaid, and the payroll software would show you unpaid. But at year end, you look at it at a different view. You look at it as a carryover encumbrance or not a carryover encumbrance. Now, the part that's a carryover encumbrance is the employee share. And if you have fringe of Social Security, Medicare, OPERS, or OPNF, that fringe is also counted as the employee share and it is carrying over 2022 appropriations. However, the employer share of OPERS, OPNF, Medicare and Social Security is not encumbered until the payment is made. So if this was unpaid as of December 31st and I carried it over and I paid it in early January 2023, that means the employer share in this column hit my 2023 appropriations. But everything in the carryover encumbrance, the employee or friend share, used the 22 appropriations. So that's the difference between carryover POs. Everything on a carryover PO is carrying over from 22 appropriations. Withholdings, only the employee and any fringe is a carryover. Employer share needs appropriations. So for those of you who say, I don't do temporary appropriations, we just adopt our permanents in late January, but you try to make a federal tax payment January 3rd, and you have no appropriations for that 128.25 employer share of Medicare, you will not be able to post that payment. That has to have appropriations. This is why people do temporary appropriations so they can operate without hindrance with legal appropriations in place. All right, this is not going to stay checked. It doesn't mean you shouldn't look at this tab and evaluate these things as you move through the year in process, but you are going to check this box only right before you close the year. And you are acknowledging you really do intend to carry these over and pay them in the new year. If you see withholdings listed here that are from 2012, and yes, we have people that have those, and you know those are never going to be paid because they were already paid in prior years, they just weren't used for payroll, why aren't you calling to figure out how to take care of that? You don't want to carry over thousands in old unpaid withholdings that have already been resolved outside of the payroll software. So 
you want to make sure this is exactly what you intend to carry over and pay in the new year. All right, here we are now past the point of working through the year in checklist. We are now at the next spot on page four that says, this is the point in time when you have completed everything you can above. So what don't we have done? We don't have our notes done. So there's a red X on that box. We don't have 4G or 4H acknowledged. So those two are red, but everything else is done. Now I post the December 31st bank reconciliation and lock down the year. Remember, it's been sitting green in our batch until we got to this point. Now it's safe to lock down the year because we have final figures. Remember, if you're looking at the best practices, you should have already adjusted your POs. Now again, we're going to say just what Christopher says. Any PO you don't need to carry over, close it. Close it. The unspent balance goes back in your unspent appropriations, but those don't carry over. The cash carries over unencumbered to the new year. If you don't need them, close them. I would close the zero balance one so my reports are shorter and I'm not looking at 100 zero balance POs. So I would close everything except what I need to carry over to the new year. And some of those may need adjusted. But I'm past that point. When I get here, I've got that done and I'm ready to lock down the year. So remember, you're coming in, you're going out, you're logging into one year, finishing things, logging into the other year, completing new things. It's a process. So I'm now locking down that December bank reconciliation. Okay, do we have any questions about the year-end checklist? Okay, well, we've got someone who says, why not just do a bank reconciliation January 2nd? You can't do a January 2nd bank reconciliation. Uh, the auditor wants a December 31st bank reconciliation. So let's talk about that. If your bank statement truly does end January 3rd, cleared items, the things that cleared the bank January 3rd, then there are special rules about that December 31st bank reconciliation. Read the year-end procedures. But if your bank reconciliation actually ends on the 29th, 30th, or even the 31st, then you should be posting it in the software as December 31st. You cannot close the year without a December 31st bank reconciliation. So there are special circumstances for folks that don't get a year-end bank statement, that their statements might end on the 5th or 6th. It's just, it is what it is. There are things to do if that's the case. Uh, that would mean the last bank reconciliation you posted was December 5th, and the next one will be January 5th, for example. Those, I believe, are explained in the year-end procedures. I know I've read that before. I'm sure those haven't been taken out. So it's not just a matter of the fiscal officer gets to decide, I'm going to do a January 2nd or 3rd bank reconciliation. You've got to show you reconciled each month. So if December's bank statement ends on uh, December 30th, we just need you to do your bank reconciliation on an as-of date or the 31st because the software needs a 31st bank reconciliation. Audit has decided these are the things that are required, and we simply have that uh, in the software. I've got somebody who said, last year I hadn't closed out the books by February 1st, and her governing board received an email saying it was over 60 days since she completed a bank reconciliation. Uh huh. This is why I showed you that you can print a batch December bank reconciliation report, take it to the January meeting, and tell them, I'm giving you this in advance to show I am reconciled. No odd adjusting fact. I am reconciled, but posting the bank reconciliation locks down the year, and I'm not to do that until it's time to lock down the year, and I've still got some things to do before I can do that. That way, when your governing board gets an email that says you haven't reconciled for 60 days, they had at a meeting a batch reconciliation. You've already explained it in advance. So those are things you can nip in the bud ahead of time. And you also then, once you do post that bank reconciliation, you are going to take it to the me meeting and you'll have the batch signed bank reconciliation report and the actual post of bank reconciliation report, they ought to be identical. And there won't be any question. Uh, what's the difference between regulatory and ACBOA? 
uh, you're going to have to read the year-end procedures. You could have, you saw from uh, the screen where you chose them, ACBOA has more requirements than others. Other than that, I can't really go into more detail than that. Um, if we haven't posted the bank rec, can we date payments for December when we're in January? No, uh, don't. So just like Christopher said early, don't use temp mode improperly. If you are going online and making your federal tax payment January 5th, you should be logged in to 2023 and posting that payment for 25th or for, for the, <laughs> I don't know where 25th came from. Oh my goodness, the dates. So <laughs> let me start that over. If you made the payment on January 5th on the EFTPS website, then log in to UAN in 2023 and post the payment for January 5th. There is no point in backdating those things when you know they didn't happen until the new year. Uh, so it isn't, it really isn't difficult. Uh, I know that if you, if you're not really thinking about it, it's like, what year do I log into? Well, what date are you actually doing it? That's the date, the year you should be in. You can't sit there on January 5th and say, I wish I had post made this payment online December 31st, because you didn't. So don't falsify your records. Uh, it doesn't really look good. So you post it where it belongs, where you did make the payment, rather than where you should have made the payment. Okay, here's a here's a question I'm not sure I understand the full context. So let's say uh, this is about a carryover PO or blanket certificate. Um, so if somebody went out and bought a widget in December off of our 2022 operating supplies blanket certificate, and I know that is the only thing that was purchased off that blanket certificate because I'm, they turn in all of my uh, items. They turn in all the sales slips. I know what people have bought. I know what BC they're using because we have that kind of cooperative uh, working relationship. I know you're laughing, but it is what you're trying to get. And so I know I need to carry over only this amount. So the widget that they bought, and I'm making that thing up, was $23.99. And my blanket certificate is for $3,000. I don't want to carry over $3,000. I'm going to be in work year 22. I am going to reduce that blanket certificate to the $29.99 I need to carry over. And then in 2023, when it's time to pay the bills, I'm going to use that carryover blanket certificate to pay the bills. You cannot carry over blanket certificates from 22 and continue to buy new things off of them in January. That is a misuse of a carryover blanket certificate. All blanket certificates expire for spending in the year they were created. So while it can be carried over to pay the bills, it can't be carried over to buy more things off of in January. And I hope that answered that question. The UAN software automatically carries over all unpaid withholdings to the new year. The employee share will have 2022 appropriations that carry over. However, any withholding payment with an employer share has to be able to hit new year appropriations. But the software is automatically going to carry them over for you to pay. Both sides are going to be there available to pay just like they always did. So the payroll software is not really showing you whether you have appropriations if you have not gotten any appropriations entered in the software and you're trying to make a federal tax payment in the new year for December and you don't have any appropriations, when you try to post that, you're going to get insufficient unencumbered balance on the employer share only. Uh, it's just like having no appropriations. Uh, Linda is asking questions about the total val tax valuation. You want to talk to your county auditor. The question says, total assessed property tax valuation. Your county auditor will tell you, if you read that question to your county auditor, they will tell you what that number is. We, we don't get involved in that process. Uh, no, let's see. So you cannot submit your file to the Hinkle system until you close the year. 
and Alex is going to show you that process. So once we have gotten through what I just showed you, completing the December 31st bank reconciliation, you can see it has to be posted before you can close the year because here we are on page four finalizing that process. The bank rec has to be posted before you can close the year. Okay, we need to move on and I'm not sure if uh, the next speaker has gotten lost in the jungle. <laughs> oh, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm here, Trina. Excuse me. Let me go take a sip up. Hmm. He's been over there at Mary, Ellen, Mary Ann's hut eating coconut <laughs> cream pie, hasn't he? <laughs> mm, no, no, no. I, these sunflower seeds on this island are fantastic. I've been eating them all morning, afternoon. They really it seemed to enhance me. Um, you know, we're going to cover my section. Let's turn to the next section I'm covering is on page four and five. So we're at the bottom of page four, and then I'll cover all the way through the end of page five. So if you're following along with best practices, take a look below the December bank rec, where um, the next section is complete the AFR fund utility. And, man, these sunflower seeds are great. Uh, you, you know, you may remember from uh, – I just had a feeling it would work. I knew it. You may remember from the Gilligan's Island uh, Season 7, Episode 9, I'm sure you do, as great as uh, super fans of Gilligan's Island, that Gilligan had um, mind-reading abilities by eating the sunflower seeds. And by golly, it does work after all, because I know that you are all thinking, AFR Fun Utility, when should I move forward? Well, let me, let me uh, tell you the answer to that. And I know a lot of you... Um, if you're old-timers like me with the UAN, you have heard of this fun utility. Uh, you've used it before, and you're like, oh, really bringing that up again? Because years ago, every UAN customer had to use the AFR fund utility, and now not so much. Now, really, when you get to this step on page four, you have to think about, should I move forward with it, or do I need to even bother with the fund utility? Because one of those big requirements for everyone is no longer a big requirement for everyone. So when do you need to move forward? Well, the most obvious one for those of you who are filing ACBOA statements is you've got to fill it out. You've got to fill it out completely. Let's turn back to uh, Trina covered this um, a little bit earlier on the uh, tab 4C of the checklist. So if you're choosing ACBOA modified or ACBOA cash basis statement filing and all that stuff in the set below there you know that's all referring below the setting is referring to the fund utility and that and most of that is related to I shouldn't say most of it it's ACBOA filing so if we if you're filing regulatory like you saw before whew, it all just goes away it disappears ether and you know so very nice we we will go over the notes that is required from everyone but that's really not in the fund utility just on this checklist so let's turn back to our question when would you we move forward well yes if you're a boa filing that's a tiny percentage of our un clients and like trina said we're not going to go over that the steps for that, there's a lot of steps in the fund utility for that, but they're covered in Appendix 7 of the year-end procedures pretty thoroughly on the function, of, you know, how that functions in UAN. So, all right, so you small percentage of ACBOA filers, you'll move forward with the fund utility in a follow Appendix 7. Well, for everyone else, the you have two other considerations. One, do you have any custodial funds? Well, if you have a custodial fund, for each of those custodial funds, if you have more than one, there's one setting that we need to look at and determine an answer to. So just one for custodial. And we'll get into what that's all about in a moment. And then there's fund mapping, as Trina already mentioned. Now, this is not, this is uncommon. It's not like you map lots of funds or that you map any funds. It's just sometimes required of certain funds. Some of you may have had an auditor tell you you need to map this fund to another one when you do your year end. Um, others, you may, you may just have to make that determination for yourself. So really not much reason to move forward, but you should take a look at it and see if it's something that is um, 
relevant to you, and then you should use the fun utility. Okay, so where do you find the fun utility? Well, you can get the path right there from the year-end checklist in 4C. I've underlined it, and it's general reports and statements, year-end, a lot of AFRs there. Just look for AFR fund utility. And when you click that, it automatically opens this message. Now, I don't like to tell you to skip messages, but we'll meditate this on this in a little bit. Just like your little guy here. We'll chill, take a chill pill on that message. It's a very important one. But let's look at something else first. When you click OK, it's going to open up the fund utility. Now, this is going to list your actual funds. If you only have a general fund and one or two other funds, that's all it's going to list. Here's our sample from Buckeye Township. And for you newer fiscal officers who are wondering, what is a custodial fund and do I have one? Well, you can find out really easy just by looking at the fund utility listing because by looking at this third column, the category column. And we can see in our sample, of course, that we do have a custodial fund because I can see that it will be labeled under the category. The category is something... If it's a fund type that's custodial, it's going to list it there. That There's no customization of that category field. So we can say for sure we have a custodial fund, and we need to you know, review this information. So I, I will select it, click on Edit, and don't click on that Akboa um, button there. So Edit has two choices. For 97% of you, you're, you're filing regulatory. So don't confuse yourself by clicking Agboa, and you'll have all these other settings to consider, and it's too confusing, right? If you're only if you're Agboa. So we're going to choose regulatory. For the majority of of us, have that, and so it's a fairly simple screen. On the right side, we have a mapping section. We'll go over in a few minutes. On the left side, it's going to list the fund, the fund balance, its name, and then the category. So we see the, our category for our custodial fund. And then it's got this one setting. You've got to kind of have a 50-50 chance of getting it right. Fund assets and external investment pool. And so, huh? <laughs> What's that all about? Well, this is, our, this is a column heading on one specific annual financial report. And it's the combined statement, at least for regulatory, for proprietary and fiduciary funds. And basically, the software is asking you, should I report? Rep report this custodial fund balance under the column that's labeled external investment pool or the column that's labeled other custodial. And, um, you know, that's a good question. Our little guy here is wondering that too. Uh, I don't really know what the answer to that question is. And that's where this message comes into play. Yeah, it, you go ahead and push the LGS button. I'm not. I'm careful not to call this the panic button. There's no re reason to panic because you're in temporary mode and you're looking at this well ahead of time. And if you're not sure about this, well, you might want to first look at, if you're new, look at the history of how you reported this previously and, that, and maybe have some notes on that. And then if you don't have the answer, um, give LGS a ring. It just says right here on this message that in the year and procedures, you can find their contact information. We've got in this section, um, we've got their phone number and their email address, contact LGS at ohioauditor.gov, and they should be able to answer that question. Just describe what you've got there. All right, so that brings us to fund mapping. Uh, with fund mapping, it's another simple um, message here, but it's not mapping like this. No, 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 not a flag football playbook here. And you're saying, well, all right, that's, you know, this is where we play on the uh, UN island. You might say that's not too dangerous, but, you know, flag football. But, you know, Trina gets pretty competitive. And, you know, last time she, like, stomped on Tony Tony's foot, um, so he didn't score the goal, you know. So that big toe is still hurt, hurting from last year in the relay race. And here, here she goes stomping just to win the game. So it can be dangerous, but it doesn't look as dangerous as this. We've got a lot of fish in this UN island, and it's really not that scary. What mapping is, is when you link or you map a fund to another fund, a fund is consumed by another fund for annual financial purposes. 
So um, the big fish eating the little fish, right? Well, to map or not to map? That is your question you must answer. Do you have any funds that can map? And you know, I really do not know, but I can give you a few tips to think about, a few things to think about. We've got three of them here. As I mentioned, use, mapping is used to merge a fund into another fund, but only for annual financial reporting purposes. Another way of saying that is mapping does not change either the fund in UAN or change any other day-to-day -day report. So, you know, if you map a fund for the AFR purposes, it's not going to change your appropriation status. It's not going to change how the, function, the fund, either one of the funds, looks on your fund status or revenue ledger. It, it, it will only change how it's presented on the annual financial reporting purposes, uh, per report statements, that is. And then finally, you may not need to map any funds. It's, you know, can be uncommon for some folks not to ever have to do that, but some of you will. UN, once again, cannot answer whether you should map a fund. That's that LGS question. If you're not sure, look at your history. If that's reliable, if you feel good about that, look at um, and then contact LGS or your regional auditor if um, you're unsure about that. You think it might be the case. All right, a little quick note about something that I think could be a bit misleading. I, in fact, I would say this would be misleading to me if I looked over it closely. Uh, this mapping required column in the fund utility, you want to be cautious about that because, as you can see, we have no, a no, no to the answer. Is mapping required? No, all the way through. So I might assume by looking at this that, well, I don't have any funds to map because the software tells me it's not required. And that's not really the case. It may be required for you to get a good audit, but it's not required for you to close the year technically in UAN. So this goes back to an old uh, to pro, uh, our programming for this several years ago, where there's some very unique situations with certain funds. And there are certain funds with certain setup, without getting in all that detail, that just would if you were to close the year in UAN without mapping them, it would cause technical problems with your software going into new year. So they program that in to stop you from even being able to close the year in those very extremely rare situations. So 99% of the 0.99% of the time, everyone that looks at this is going to say, mapping required? Oh, the answer is no. Doesn't mean that you don't need to map a fund for good you know, financial statements. It just means you, it'll let you close the year without doing that mapping. All right, so we're going to use unclaimed monies fund um, for our example, like we did before. And we're going to map the unclaimed monies fund to the general fund. Now, I've been pounding the drum here on contact LGS about these procedural questions, UAN support. We can't tell you what to do here or there. We can't tell you to map that fund or the other fund. Well, OK, there's exception to every rule. Um, I have spoken with the, one of the higher ups at LGS, one of the chief. I'm not sure his title there, but off the top of my head. But he has told me specifically that mapping the unclaimed monies fund, any township that has an unclaimed money uh, custodial fund, it should be mapped to the general fund. So yes, this is LGS approved. And then we don't get to say that again, so let's just repeat that. Anyone who has an unclaimed monies fund, township specifically, should map that fund to the general fund for AFR purposes. So it's LGS approved. You can move forward with this. So, so it's a great example for us. So to demonstrate that, I'm going to select both funds so I can illustrate a few things here. So I'll select the general and the unclaimed monies. Once again, I'm going to be careful since I'm regulatory to select Edit Regulatory. So it's opened up both funds into the fund utility form, and the, the general shows up first. And I want you to make note of that um, general fund balance. It's, uh, you know, remember that we've already done our December 31st bank reconciliation. This is our final. Can't do any adjust, adjustments after that. 
if that's the final final, right? So um, this is our balance that's going to go over into the new year for the general fund, $984,760.37. All right, so just make a mental note of that. And then we're going to jump over here using the nav navigation errors to the second record, which is our unclaimed monies fund. And we'll use the mapping tool. Very easy. We just select map two, the unclaimed monies fund. We're in that one. Map two, and then we're going to pick the 1,000 general fund so we can map that unclaimed money to the general fund. All right. So now that we've got it mapped, well, I'll tell you here, UN Island, man, it we get a lot of storms, and obviously a lot of folks are stranded out here. It gets dangerous, and you got to look out for that lightning. Oh, it just obliterated all that work we spent considering the custodial fund of unclaimed monies. And you know what? It just gets zapped away because it doesn't matter. Because remember, the um, the uh, unclaimed monies fund is going to be consumed. It's going to uh, be uh, sent. That balance is going to be reported in the general fund. So our balance is $1,752.25. Since we're mapping it, that setting for custodial, in this our case, is irrelevant. It's going to be reported as the general, which is, of course, not a custodial fund. So to take a look at this, well, let's move back to the general fund. And now if you look at our balance, 986.512.62, that's exactly $1,752.25 more than it was just a few moments ago because we mapped, it now includes the unclaimed monies fund. So the unclaimed monies fund has been consumed by the general fund. It's being reported that way for AFR purposes. And we can see that clearly on our uh, fund mapping list, just right under that map to column. Uh, shows you the 1,000 fund. It's, it's mapped to the 1,000 fund. OK, so let's turn the page. And literally, if you're following along in the best practices, turn your uh, page over to page five. And at the top of page five, we've got a start item, which is complete manual input forms. And these aren't the only manually input forms we would do, but um, we kind of group them together because they go back. Um, they're all they're the well, she first uh, let show you where they're located here on the screen under general reports and statements year end. And these four reports are all listed at the bottom of the list under the year-end menu. So the reason we prefer to them as manual input is because regardless of what you do all throughout the year, none of your day-to-day -day transactions, your maintenance um, entries, any utility adjustment, none of that would ever carry over into these statements, but they are annual financial statements that the auditor state does require. So if they apply to you, you need to manually enter them in. And so it's just a once a year thing. So the first one I want to talk about is the cash reconciliation. And that is the first page of your annual financial statements. It's a pretty easy one. It'll open up a simple form like this. You pick the reporting year. And then you can see uh, various, a few little items listed here and your print buttons uh, below that. And the, um, it has a place for data entry for some of these fields. So let me back up there again, like, oops. So you got the bond coupon clearance account or payroll clearance account. If any of those apply to you, then you would enter them in before you print the report. A lot of people, the, the, it's not applicable. You can read our, uh, a little bit more about this in the year-end procedures, Appendix 2, got a page on this. But if it, a lot of people, you'll just leave this as zero. Some of you may have to fill in some of that information. And then once you fill that in, you can go ahead and print it out. And this is kind of uh, gives you a picture of what it looks like. You, like I say, print this out. Now, I don't mean mail it to UEN or to Auditor State. We don't want it. This is just a printout. So, you know, where are you on UEN? You don't send paperwork, right? You're going to be sending electronically one way or another a couple of methods that uh, Alex, I, I believe, is going to show you or, or Trina later in the day. 
So this will be a cover page for your public record. So any citizen who wants to come and take a look at this, they can. Um, you'll have a printout uh, that you can show them. And this will be the cover of your statements. All right, so let's move on. That's the easy one. Let's move on to the other three. These other three you should only complete if they apply. So m some of you may not have to do anything but the cash reconciliation printout uh, or statement. But these three, if they apply, then go ahead and, and select them. So a few points about these. Um, you'll print them just like the other for your records as part of your annual financial official records that you keep um, available for, for public record. You do not need to add them anywhere else in the software. So Alex is going to talk about notes later, the notes, the financial statements Trina mentioned. Uh, that's something you add into the software. These are not part of this. You're going to do data entry if they apply to you in here. And the last point there is the submission, which will explain how to do that uh, in one electronic format or another. It'll include whatever you input into these statement forms. So it's already taken care of. It'll all be wrapped up together. No need to uh, worry about um, the printout other than for keeping it at your office. All right. So cash at and assets not recorded. Well, we discussed this a little bit in Appendix 2 of the Year and Procedures. You just want to read over that appendix and determine whether um, this applies to your entity. Uh, for a lot of folks, it does not, but it may apply to yours. We're not going to get into it because it's not, um, I'm not going to demonstrate that because it's not extremely common, but it is something that could apply to you. The other, oh, there's a, I forgot about this. Uh, we, it, this is, you can see it's a simple screen. You would enter the account number, um, institution name, and description and an amount. So that's as far as I'll get into that for, since it is not super common, we'll move on to the other two, which I think applies to anyone who has ongoing debt. If you have ongoing debt, you're going to need to complete the schedule of debt service and the schedule of outstanding debt. And I want to know that the examples that I'm going to show you, I want you to know that the examples I'm going to show you today correspond exactly, they're the exact same examples that we have in Appendix 2 of the Year and Procedures for these two. So if you miss something, you, you'll refresh your memory by just looking back at the Year and Procedures, the exact same examples. All right, so we'll start with the schedule of outstanding debt. And, and these are both, uh, you know, just a little, they're, they're looking at things from a different angle. The schedule at standing debt is looking at each loan, each um, note, uh, you know, of each type of debt separately and saying, what's the status of that as of December 31st? Okay. And so you, you want to make sure you, you have that final status before you enter this in. You can, uh, so, we'll, so in our example at Buckeye Township, we kept it nice and simple. Um, and let me go back to that here. So I want to show you. So this is the list area. Make sure you select the report year. And then when you're ready to enter it in, click on the Add button. And it's going to open up, again, a very simple form. You're going to fill out the year that the debt was issued. So this is specific loan or any other type of debt. A description, the interest rate, the balance beginning of the fiscal year you're reporting. So in 2022, in this case, any debt that's been issued in this um fiscal year, any debt that's been retired in this fiscal year. So when I say issued in addition to the amount that, that came, came into the year with, and then um, any debts you retired or paid off in the uh, current year. So our examples, our first one is a truck and we purchased that truck. It was issued and we've got a loan for it that was issued in 2021. So we entered that in a meaningful description, obviously, that we purchased the truck for zoning. The interest rate, the balance as of 2022, January 1st, was 25000 We didn't increase the loan any bit in 2022, so nothing was issued. We retired or we paid off $5,000 of it, and so our end-of-year balance is 20000 And you can see that it totals up so far what we have on the right-hand side. So that's the first one. We save it, give us a little confirmation message. And then I've entered in the other debt that we have. That was issued in 2022. It's for stormwater improvements with interest rate in. 
we didn't start off with anything in January 1st. In fact, this was issued, we took out the loan in late November for $150,000. We haven't retired any of it. Our first payment um, is going to be in uh, 2023, so that's blank. So our balance is still the 150000 and the grand total on the right is 170000 for both loans. All right, so when we save that and close it, it'll bring up the list area of both of those. We'll select both of them and print them out for our records. Very simple report. Looks like that. Of course, if you have 10 different loans, you're just going to you know, input all of them, and, and it'll list out um, just like we see here. All right, so that's as... That's a schedule of outstanding debt. The schedule of debt service is a different story. That's not looking at the state of affairs, affairs as of December 31st. That's saying looking forward, you know, unless you pay off all your debt by December 31st, you're going to have some payments going forward, and a balance going forward in the years to come. So for this one, and this is kind of why we give it, put a start on this especially, is you can start preparing some of the information right away if you don't have like a uh, a debt repayment schedule, you know, uh, from your bank for your different loans. Then you'll want to find that or contact the bank and get that um, as soon as possible, so you can start preparing. And before you enter this in, especially if a lot a lot of we only have two examples here, it's fairly simple to summarize it, but. If you've got again like five different loans or diff, you know even more you know more than that, you will want to consolidate this on a spreadsheet. You want to so you got five loans. You're going to want to enter in. Um, let me let me click on the add button here, and you can see the fields that you need to fill out. You're going to fill out and summarize. You're not entering in each loan one at a time. You're entering the grand total of your principal and interest payments for all of your debt, for all of your loans go, going for that, for that year. And you're going to enter in 2023, 2024. If it goes out 30 years, you're going to enter in 30 years. Although the auditors do give you, um, after the first five years, the auditors give you an option of summarizing in five-year increments. But the first five years, you could consolidate the principal interest in, and enter that in for each year, one at a time. So let's do that for our debt. So you're, again, you would prepare this on a spreadsheet. So you have your totals ready, and then you type them in. So for 2023, our total for our, our truck loan and stormwater improvement loan is 15,000 in principal and 2,100 in interest, grand total below that, and then an ongoing total on the right. 2024, same thing. So that's year two. 2025, Third year, it keeps increasing on the right, right? Um, 2026, we got to our fourth year. And 2027 is our fifth year. Um, by that time, you can see the principal interest gone down to 10000 2000 That's because we we paid off the, we will have, if all things stays the same, we'll have paid off the uh, truck loan by then. So now we're just down to stormwater improvement repayments. And that's at our fifth year. So... Going forward, we have to actually have another 10 years after that for this uh, this loan, long-term loan. The auditor allows us to summarize in five-year increments. So for those five, that five, the fifth year of that increment ends on 2023. So I can just enter in uh, the grand total of those five years, 50,000, 10,000. I know I made it nice and easy, even numbers for us, our demonstration. And so if you've got another five years, 2037 is five years out again. And at that point, we will have paid off all of, all of our loans. And um, so we've got our schedule. If I save that and close it, it's going to list all the years uh, that I've entered. And I can click on print. And this is what it will look like. All right. So that's our manual input forms. We do have some other, like I mentioned, data entry forms. Uh, we don't call a manual input for some reason, but this one is a very rare um, form that you may have to fill out. But honestly, it's so rare, I'm not going to demonstrate anything more than this and show you where it's at. Reports and statements, year-end component units. And I'd say, I don't know, checked back this maybe a few years back, and it was maybe 
five, uh, maybe it's up to 10 uh, UN customers at the most that actually ha need, have found that they need to do this. Um, so I wouldn't say dismiss it altogether, you know, out of the 2,000 plus that we have. But I would look at the appendix, read that over. It refers you to an auditor state bulletin in that appendix. So you can read over the bulletin if you're still not sure after looking that over. And, you know, if you're not sure at all, then, again, contact LGS and they can, you can talk it over with them. But for most of you, you're not going to be completing the component units. All right, so that brings us to the middle of page five, and there are uh, we're li that lists out all of your um, AFR, your annual financial reporting statements. You can see from the right side of our screen that we have uh, it's located under general reports and statements year end, and then you're going to choose one or the other. If you file ACBOA, please don't choose don't please don't print the regulatory statements. You're just wasting paper. If you're filing regulatory, definitely don't print the ACBOA statements because you're going to get really confused and they'll be very incomplete. So only print the set that applies to you. On the left side of your screen, we see a little note about printing reports to complete your notes. Well, one of the reasons this is located, you know, that's referring to notes of the financial statements, which we'll show you how to add those in later. One of the reasons this this list is on page five is because you would not want to print these reports, these statements earlier. You want to make sure, one, that your bank reconciliation is complete and that you're not going to, you know, December 31st, you're not going to avoid that and do another adjustment. You feel confident your December 31st bank rec is complete and your fund utility, if you had to, like if you'd printed these reports before, let's say, mapping that uh, unclaimed monies fund, the general fund, well, then the reports would be wrong and you'd have to reprint the reports. So we're trying to save you some time by leaving this in the, in place at this point. Um, don't print them too early because you may have to reprint them again if you don't, if, if you do that. All right. And also the notes, you can, the third reason is that you can incorporate some of these information into your notes that some of the notes your financial statements are going to require that you get some of the final information from your other statements and this makes it a lot easier all right so if you're filing regulatory which most of you uh, historically have then you would go to that section under year-end reports and statements and pick AFR regulatory statements and you're going to click on the drop down menu there. You can see there's a whole lot of statements in this list. So we've got three points here. And the first point is that hit the drop down menu. It's not just one report. Sometimes we get folks who say, I, I printed them and they just printed the first one on the list. Okay, that's not it. There's several. Secondly, select the report and print. There's no items to choose. This gets a lot of the new folks out there. Because, you know, let's say you started in June this year and you're just, you know, we really hammered the point. Go to the fund status, go to the appropriation ledger, or maybe you just select the account codes you need and print. You know, you don't have to select everything if you don't need to select, if you don't need to print everything. And here, though, it throws people off because they go select the combining statement and then it's just a blank list. There's nothing there. Well, the auditor state knows what you need on this statement. You've gotten to the point where you've gotten all your transactions done. It's a standard report. There is nothing to select. It's just going to print what it should print. So just select the report and print, hit the print button. And then thirdly, if you get for either one of these reports um, a message when you do the combining or combined statement for proprietary and fiduciary funds, it says no data to report. Hit that don't panic button. You don't panic because it just means that it doesn't apply to your entity. If you're a newer fiscal officer and you're, you know, you're not really familiar with fiduciary, proprietary, it just means it doesn't apply to you. No harm. Just move on to the next statement and print that. All right. Now, if you're one of those few ACBOA statement filers, then it's the same principle, just different reports. They have a whole list of them and the same three thoughts there. So we'll leave it at that. Um, same three points. Regardless of which statements you print, make sure that you um, 
Well, make sure that you keep a file for your statements for public records that I mentioned already. Uh, this is one of those um, those little uh, graphics that isn't working out in our new um, presentation format, unfortunately. But that's supposed to crawl out and say, re retain your annual financial statements for public records. So I'm going to end my section on that. That will bring us to you know page six and open the floor here for any questions we might have. All right. So we've got, if I have no balance in a custodial fund, do I need to map it? Well, it can't hurt, certainly, um, especially if the uh, custodial, you know, if you have no balance, it's not going to cause any problem. It's just going to be absorbed into the general fund. So, um, I, you know, you can double check that with an auditor if you want, but I don't see, see why not. Technically, it's not going to cause a problem on our end. All right. Um, let's see. On the debt schedule, what if I've entered all of this in 2021? The screen's jumping on me a second. On 2021, and there is a way to bring the information over. Is there any way to, so I see what you're asking. Yeah, we get this a lot uh, each year. If, you know, if I did this in a previous year, um, and it is something that you do every year. If I entered all this information in 2021 and it hasn't, you know, I'm thinking, well, it hasn't changed. Well, no, uh, you know, it could change. This is why the auditor wants you to key this in. If, uh, you know, you saw in the screen, if the debt, um, you have an, some debt instruments, you have an option to issue additional debt on the same loan or different type of, you know, note or whatever. It depends on the type of debt. It could change from one year to another year, or you could take out another loan for something else. Uh, so in, with a schedule of debt service, well, that's a consolidation of all of them. So the auditor does not want you to be able to just copy it over from year to year because you could miss something that should be updated. And um, obviously, a lot of this can be changed. You could pay to off some debt earlier or, or some, you know, whatever. There's a lot of possibilities. So, nope, it's something that you just need to do. It's, our utilities are pretty easy to put it together. So I just, um, you know, leave it at that. Okay. Um, all right. Uh, question. Um, are there those reports on page five, the regulatory or the ACBO ones, um, are they the ones that I need to run for 2015? Well, you may not need to run them for 2015. We have a note in the year and procedures and I think in the best practices that um, the, you know, we only keep the our, our um, retention schedule for the software is seven years. We'll keep seven years of reports, wh at, whether annual financial statements or your day-to-day -day reports. So um, the if you've been on UEN for more than you know seven years or more, um, when you close the year completely, you go through the year-end closing process, not just opening temporary mode, it'll still be accessible then, but when you actually close the fiscal year 2022, then year 2020 or 2015 is, you know, beyond seven years after that, it will be removed um, and accessible in your software. So if you've got all the reports and statements that you need already, either in PDF format or in a file box somewhere, then there would be no need to reprint all that information. But if you have information that is missing that you need, well, now's your window of opportunity to print those 2015 statements or other um, UAN reports. Good question. All right, let's see, we've got a few left here. Um, would mapping be used to show whether an ARPA monies were spent? I do not know the answer. That would be a question for audit or LGS. Okay, I have a question from someone regarding they were um, you joined UAN this year, as of January 1st, and um, it's an OCBOA filer. So let's see. Then you had carryover purchase orders. So in UAN, uh, well, this is kind of a spit. You may want to give us a call, but that because there are, you know aren't only so many um, new new users and UAN brand new to UAN. But yeah, yeah, I won't get into the details of that, but. Um, it's, it will look differently because um, you didn't have 2021 entered in UEN, and we don't have 
a way of showing that carryover from 2021 to 2022. Uh, it will it will show up if you did your conversion accurately. So I'll leave it at that. It'll give us a call to discuss that in more detail. All right, Bob. All right. Yeah. Uh, I, think we're gonna, I think that's about all I uh, will answer now for the questions. And uh, Alex, you still uh, up in the coconut tree? Or are you ready to come down? Hey, I am ready. We have to talk about AFR all notes, true. closing out the year, checklist, all kinds of good stuff here. So they corrected me and said, uh, you know, that was the the uh, the uh, sunflower seed were from episode season two, episode nineteen. So, you know, the sunflower seeds have an effect on the mind. So, yeah, what can I say? In my world, is season seven. There's lots of seasons, but just thank you for the correction, though. <laughs> all right, Alex, it's all yours. All right, thanks, Bob. <clears throat> okay, so talking, uh, you're closing out the year and your AFR notes. You cannot submit and close out the year until you've entered your notes. So let's go through how to do that here. Um, on UAN Link, our website, we've got a video provided by local government services that goes over notes training, how to fill them out, what you should be doing. Very helpful. So again, it's on UAN Link under training, the year-end section, and look for the notes training by local government services. Let's talk about uh, budgetary notes, information export. You're going to find this report. Uh, I th believe Bob went over all these before, but this one in particular um, you want to note on. So under general reports, AFR regulatory statements, the budgetary notes, information export. This is going to be very useful when you're putting together your footnotes. It's going to help you a lot. So you're going to have all these saved, but you want to open up this one for your notes especially. We'll talk about what to add in on your financial statements. You want to download the Shell Word document, if you haven't, from the uh, LGS uh, group. And I'll show you on the website where you can find that. But once you've downloaded that, you'll edit the template. You're going to save that file down to your documents folder on your computer. And then when you're done with your notes, you're going to save that as a PDF, because that's what you're going to have to upload later. And we'll go through those a little bit more in depth in a minute. To download the template for your notes, you'll go to the Auditor of State website, and then you can reach that through UAN if you click on the Auditor of State's name on the top right corner. Um, otherwise, you can just go through uh, the web your normal way, Auditor of State's website, and you want to go to local government, then click on Reference Materials. From there, you'll go to Financial Statement Shells and Footnotes, and you'll click on the Regulatory, assuming you're filing that way. And then you're going to select your entity type. Here we've highlighted townships, and you'll click on notes. So uh, last I checked, and in this screenshot, the shells haven't been updated yet. They were updated mid-December last year, so you want to keep a lookout for when those new ones come out. They might even be out there now and make a liar of me. I haven't checked recently, um, but last week uh, they were still 2021s. So that'll be out soon. And uh, if you need an exact date, you'd want to contact LGS. But... Uh, those will be out shortly. All right, so now let's talk about uploading the AFR notes and documents. You'll go to General, Reports and Statements, Year End, and then to AFR Notes and Documents. You're going to click Add, and then Browse. So this is what I talked about before. Once you save down that footnote shell, that's a Word document. You're going to edit that present your notes, get everything correct, and then you want to save that down as a PDF. Once you have that done, here's where you're going to add it. So you'll click Browse. That'll take you to search for your computer. <clears throat> and if you save it down to your Documents folder, you'll see it on the menu bar on the left under this computer. And you want to select your notes documents for 2022 in case you have them all saved there. And then click Open. From there, you'll have this screen, and you want to hit Save. That'll get them saved down into UAN. And you'll get this screen next. So to verify the file was uh, successfully added, please display. So you're going to select the notes that we just uh, uploaded, and you're going to hit the display there. And 
you know, we've got a picture from uh, UAN Island. So you want to make sure that it's the correct notes document. Um, a lot of times things get uploaded that are not the notes document. You'd be surprised. So you want to make sure, and that's why we double check with display. So we'll go back. We'll repeat that process. You'll upload it, the correct document. And here you're going to hit display. And this is what their notes look like once they're saved down. Now, uh, once you've uploaded your notes, <clears throat> and I'll show you on the checklist where you're going to see how many files you've uploaded. But what you don't want to do is overload the information on your notes uploads. Uh, sometimes people think that they need to, they're a regulatory filer, and they need to save down all their reports as PDFs and save them and upload them just like I showed you how to do your notes document. That's not what you want to do. You only want to upload that notes document PDF in that area. That's all it's for. Everything else, the beauty of UIN, is the system will transmit all those reports that you need that are required for the reg regulatory filing to the Hinkle system. So don't overload that folder. It's just for the AFR notes PDF document. And just to touch on that, if you're not filing regulatory, you want to file, uh, follow the ACBOA instructions, or if you've been instructed by an auditor um, to file something extra in that area, that's fine. But it's going to be a rare case, and the large majority of people are only going to have that one AFR notes document. So moving on to closing out the year under the checklist, you're going to go to General, Maintenance, Year End, and then the Year End Checklist. Uh, I know Trina showed you this slide before, and we're going to click on where it says Current Year. All right, so this is our last chance to go over this checklist. You don't want to rush through this and make sure it's just all green and close out the year because really if you have a mistake here and you close out the year, there's no going back. So this is the time to slow down and really review what's going on on this checklist. So this is the area I was talking about before. This is your AFR notes uh, segment on 4C. Most regulatory filers only have the one notes file unless you're otherwise directed to upload something else, but the large majority will have the one. 4G, we have our carryover PO and BC. Uh, leaving last year's PO open reduces next year's appropriation budget. So that's a really big thing you have to remember. If you're leaving POs open, they are coming out of the budget of 2022 but they will reduce what you can budget in 2023. Chris touched on that. This is a real good time to review this area and make sure just what you need to carry over is in that box before you check, I acknowledge. If there's something extra, you can reduce it or close out that PO entirely. So you really wanna pay attention to what's there and the total on the top we have highlighted. So again, you wanna trust the work you've put in but you want to verify what you've done here. So if you have $500,000 or $5 million in total encumbrances up top, that's where you really want to say, is this what I need to be carrying over? Okay, carry over with holdings. Again, same situation. You want to verify that just your carry over with holdings for 2022 are here. And Trina touched on this, as did Chris earlier. And before you acknowledge that, and you're only going to carry over the withholdings that should be paid in the new year. So that's it. That should be in this box. Finally, we're going to go to closing out the year, assuming your whole checklist is turned nice and green like this one. And you'll click on the Finish tab on the bottom left. You'll then read the paragraph that comes up for I affirm the AFR submission. Make sure that you've read that over and followed all your procedures, the year-end procedures in full. And this really is the point of no return when you're closing out. So everything's done at this point. We're going to click close 2022. And we're going to close out the year. So as soon as you click that, you're going to get the database integrity. And, you know, that'll take some time for UAN to run. It'll run through the database. It's really making sure everything's good to wrap up for your final saves on this year. So <clears throat> once that's done, 
you're going to get the notice for closing mode, temporary mode for 2022. Once you close temporary mode, it is closed. Uh, you'll only be in 23 at that point. And, you know, this is where you get another pop-up. Important, read carefully. Any open purchase order, any open purchase orders or unpaid employee withholdings carried over to 2023 will reduce available resources for 2023. So you don't want to have anything carrying over that is an accident. You really want to double check these things. Once again, are you sure all 2022 transactions are complete? 2022 will now permanently close and this process is irreversible. So here you'll click OK if you're ready to proceed and you'll come to your first backup of three. Um, this is how you want to label a CD if you're saving it down. If you're putting on a thumb drive, there's really not a place to write, but uh, suggested labeling is for the CD uh, listed here below. You'll label it 2022, year end backup. And this is your first backup of three. This backup is going to be the final backup for year 2022, and you're going to save this for your records. So um, you'll proceed here, and you'll select CD, flash drive, um, however you normally save your backups, <clears throat> and you'll click start on the bottom right. You'll get this message, temporary mode closing. After that saves down, that's your last backup of 2022. Now you're going to save your first backup for 2023. And these are major restore points in case something goes wrong with the computer or you have uh, something unexpected happen where you need to recover your information. So second backup of three is your first save for 2023. So that'll be next year. Again, same process. CD, flash drive, you select your option. But also a good thing to note when saving a backup, you select your uh, device type and then you want to hit the browse button just to be sure that drive letter doesn't get switched by Windows. I've seen it happen plenty of times, so when I save backups, the best thing I do is select the type I'm saving, then hit browse, make sure the letter is the same, and then I save my backup. So you'd hit start there. And after the second backup saves, you'll see the third one. You'll now create your 2022 uh, ASO backup, so AOS backup. So this is what's going to be submitted for the year of 2022. Um, by far, the majority of our users do the internet connection, but we still do have some postal submissions. So if you're going to submit via CD in the mail, um, this is your suggestion to uh, mail it to us down below. Um, you want to label it 2022 AFR, so that way it gets recognized for what it is, and you put in your uh, entity information that way. You also want to include the UAN ID of your entity, so that way we can recognize it easily for um, extraction. But uh, like I said, most people do the internet submission, so we'll walk through there. And when you come to back uh, backup three of three, this is your submission again, you'll click internet submission instead of the familiar CD or thumb drive. So after selecting internet submission, you'll hit start and you'll get this message that it's submitting to AOS. Now the beauty of submitting over the internet um, even if you have to wait and go um, to a place that has a secure connection, but a better internet connection from where you normally are, is you can check on the status uh, later on that. And Trina will go over how to do that, but you'll get a confirmation of your submission once this is saved, and it'll tell you your status will be available on the website in uh, probably two to three days, I believe. So... After that, you've closed the year out, you submitted your information to the Hinkle system, and you are now done with 2022. When you log out and you'll log back in, you'll be in year 2023. Um, the last note here is the uh, prior year reports. Um, you want to make sure you have everything um, because you are completely closed out of 2022 now. All right, um, just before we go into the next section, do we have any questions on backing up uh, 2022, submitting 2022's information to uh, Hinkle and the checklist or AFR notes in general? So let me see what we've got here.
So first question we have, if file MDNA is to be included with the PDF for notes. So uh, yes, if you're an OCBOA filer, you'll have two things to put in there. Uh, that's your notes documents and the MDNA um, file also. So a good question there. Uh, what report is needed to print out for 2015? Uh, so that's the years you're losing. So um, you're going to want to go through that. That's uh, not really something you want to get from UIN. Anything you're required for your records retention. Um, so we have the rolling schedule where the year falls off as you advance to the next year. Uh, you're going to want to save down all the mandatory reports. So um, that's not really UIN. You want to check your records retention policy. But once you're done with 2022, uh, you need to know that you're losing those years there. Uh, okay. Best media type for backup, uh, CD or flash drive? Well, the thing about the CD is um, you, you're not going to erase over it. So we like that, but, you know, progress is also pushing everyone towards a flash drive. Flash drive is fine, but on a flash drive, you're going to have more space so you could save other things to it. Whereas to a CD, you're going to save it once, put it away in its case, and it'll be saved there permanently. Both would work fine, but, um, you know, CD... Uh, you're less likely to override or get rid of that file because you're putting other things on there, whereas you would on the flash drive. Okay, if you're ready to close the year February 1st and you have paid the withholdings due, for example, mid-January, 4-H checklist will still show payroll withholdings to carry over. Yes, that is correct because um, it is pulling from 2022's information because you're closing out that year. So that is correct. It, it would have been a carryover at that time. Does the file automatically go to Hinkle or does that require its own submission? Uh, if you submit through the internet, yes, it automatically goes through Hinkle. So if you do the internet submission through UAN, it goes to Hinkle and you're fully submitted that way. And that looks like all the questions we have for that segment. Again, if we didn't get to one, we will have a uh, section at the end of the year, at the end of the uh, presentation, and we can cover any of the questions you have. Uh, let's see. Got one more note here. Appendix 2 lays out the typical reports uh, that you're going to want to print out each year. Uh, so it follows, if you're missing any of those with 2015, uh, you want to print those for your records. So you want to check out Appendix 2 for that uh, prior question on what reports should you print out for 2015. Uh, Bob, with the assist there, thank you very much. And now I'll be turning it over to Trina. Thank you. Wow, I was lost in the jungle. I, I don't know what happened, but I took the wrong turn and ended up at that cave. Um, I just don't know how to, didn't know how to get back. And I figured sooner or later, it's an island. I'm going to hit the beach and can find my way. So <laughs> almost missed my section here. All right. So according to where we are on the best practices, if you've been following along, we are on the bottom of page six where it says steps after closing the year. So remember, if you are going to if you don't know whether the 15 reports have been printed, just like we've said every time we brought this up, at this point, you've lost the opportunity. So make sure you do that. Just get it done now so that it's not something on your plate before the year's closed. So that can be checked off. I know 15's out of the way. And then when we're sitting here, you're not going, I forgot. Okay, so it says... The first thing you do after closing the year is log into UAN and confirm it is in 2023. And how are you going to know that? There's no year selection. So we've had people in the past call us and say, I've closed the year three times and I'm still in temporary mode. Well, I'm not sure what it was they did, but they did not close the year. They haven't been through the three backups. It just, I'm not sure what they were doing, but the year does not close until you click close the year, do the three backups, and out the door it goes. And when you log in, there is no temp mode. This is a confirmation. There's no more temp mode. You really are going to log in, and you are in 2023. Now, the next thing you do is a verification. 
Uh, so uh, some questions were earlier, folks saying, well, my cash carryover, blah, blah, blah. Yes, now we're going to verify your cash carryover. So any cash you had December 31st is still your cash January 1st. And we are going to prove that. That's the first thing you do. Now, rarely, I'm, I'm not even sure we have this happen every year. It's more like once every three years, maybe we have an issue, but I don't think it's very common. But this is your very first verification. So after you close the year and log in, there's no temp mode. This is the first thing we're going to do. Print the cash summary by fund. So you can see it's accounting, reports and statements, fund reports, and from the drop-down list, cash summary by fund. Not a cash flow, cash summary by fund. It's the only one that's going to give you the right figures for this verification. Now, I'm going to print that for January. That's what it's going to default to first. Physically print it. Select your funds and print. And then you're going to change the year in the drop-down box to 2022, and it'll default to the whole year, which is fine. We're looking for the year end balance and select all your funds and print that. And then you're going to lay them side by side and you're going to make sure the December 2022 fund balances are identical to the January 2023 fund balances. Now you can't use other reports to do this because you'll, you'll grab the fund status. We get people that do this every year. They try to do this with the fund status. It's not going to work. We need you to use this exact report for these dates and you are going to be able to look at that and say yep not a penny difference between December 31st and January 1st and that's the way it needs to be all right the next thing you want to do is the certificate from the total amount from all sources available for expenditures and balances I'm not sure who named that thing 40 years ago <laughs> but that is a doozy of a name of that's the name at the top of that form. We call it the year-end balance certificate. And it's that form you fill out every year that certifies your final December fund cash balances and carryover encumbrance and estimated revenue for the new year. It's a form that gets filed with your county every year to say, this is my year-end, this is what I am asking for in an amended certificate and you complete this form in UAN. We still have folks that say, I didn't know UAN would do that. I think it's been over 10, 11, 12, 13 years that UAN has been producing this report, and we do this training every year. So that's always a little shocking. The software creates this report. Now, I know there are a couple of people that have told me their county uses their own form and they will not accept the UAN report. So we can't do anything about that. You could print this first because this is going to give you most of the figures they're asking for. They just ask for it in a different format. So I would use this as a starting point. You have to be in year 2023. So get, we get folks that do this all the time. Uh, for some reason, they log into work year 2022 before they close the year. You are you are reporting a whole year ago's fund balances. So logging into 2023 in temp mode to do this is never going to give you the right figures. You have to be in 23. You have to have final figures. This is why this document is so far down the list because if you do it early, you skip around and you hadn't finished certain things, you have certified the wrong numbers to the county auditor. So. Um, I've had someone tell me that their county auditor wants this document by January 15th, and I find that unusual because you actually have 60 days to finalize your year end. So why would your county require this before you are required to close the year? That's kind of a conversation you'd have to have with your county is I don't even know what these balances are yet. I have 60 days to close the year. Most people don't take the whole 60 days, but we got lots of new folks that have walked into a mess, they will have extra things to do to clean up before they can close the year. And they don't know what the fund balances are going to be January 15th because they're dealing with unreconciled balances for two years. So uh, it's going to take time. You get 60 days. Does everybody need the 60 days? No. So uh, you want to make sure you've completed what is required to give you the new num the correct figures. If you are in any doubt, Call the support line. We'll run you through some things to see if you can produce the correct numbers. If not, <laughs> there's no point in producing wrong numbers. So we got to be in 23. 
we have to be at this point in time, and we're going to go to budget, transactions, year and balance certificates, because the whole name of that document won't fit on the menu. <laughs> now, it's really simple. You're going to click the Add button. Now, look again. I'm going to nag. The year has to be 23. If you change that to 22, you are certifying last year's January 1st cash balances. This is the 2023 beginning of year certification. It already starts with the balances as of 12, uh, 31, 22. So look, it says that. The year has to be 23. Click the Add button, and it simply adds the worksheet. Now, thank you, little guy. These are like UAN minions, our own little minions. Uh, man, they can be annoying. So. I have to name the report. You could name it Fred. It'll still land in the batch, but just give it a sensible name, 2023. Now I have to look at my fund list because some of you I've talked to over the past several months, you've still got your 2020 CARES Act fund. And I'm afraid some of our uh, fiscal officers that have taken over recently in the last couple of months, the CARES Act fund still has money in it. Um, you can't really eliminate a fund that's got money in it because that still has to be dealt with. But if you've got the old CARES Act fund or a capital project fund that's already over with and you're never going to use that fund again, you would uncheck it. They've got to have zero balances. What you're looking at here is things that don't need to be certified on my amended certificate. And old zero balance funds don't. Uh, so I would uncheck those. Now in my example, the only thing I have to deal with, the only fund that is not carrying over to the new year um, is one of my uh, custodial funds that are not budgeted. And you're not just going to intuitively know that because custodial funds are not often used. It's the mayor's court, uh, the mayor's court fund where you run the mayor's court monthly processes through. Uh, that that process is out uh, each month. It's not a budgeted fund, but some of you have walked into systems that are marked, these are budgeted. And you have to do revenue budgets and appropriations because of the way they're set up in your system, and that's the policy that they followed for years. But if you go to general, maintenance, entity setup, we've been here several times today, and then on the system tab, you can see under budgetary, my system is set, custodial funds must not be budgeted. They don't require budgets. They are not needed on the amended certificate. It is not our money that gets uh, processed here. Unclaimed money does not get budgeted. Now, if somebody claims their money, I can still spend it. I just don't need budgets and POs. So custodial phones must not be budgeted is the setting in my system. Therefore, I know I am going to uncheck that unclaimed money fund. It would be the same if your mayor's court fund was a custodial fund that is not budgeted, you would uncheck it. So what it means is not necessary on the amended certificate because of the laws and structure that's required. So I don't need to certify it to the county. It doesn't mean it doesn't exist. All right. I just simply save that because if I did everything in order of the year in best practices, the year in balance is already there. The carryover encumbrance is already there. My estimated revenue for the new year is already there. All I had to do was add it and save it. Now, some of you live in counties that have other requirements. Follow your county's requirements. We can't tell you to oppose your county. That's not sensible. So there are 88 counties. Some of them have other procedures. Some of them have their own rules. Please follow your county's individual rules. So once this is in the batch, that's not finished. We have to do something with it. So I'm going to select it and click print because I have to have a physical copy for my records for audit. If I'm going to email that to the county, I would save as PDF as well. But I need my physical copy for my, my physical records that I'm required to keep for my entity. So I'm going to keep a copy for my records, and I'm going to send one to the county auditor. And that is going to generate my first amended certificate. And I hope you live in a county that that's timely. I know we've got folks, as uh, soon as they send that document within two days, bam, that's back again. It's emailed back to them sometimes the same day. That's wonderful with that fast turnaround. Your first amended certificate is going to give you the maximum amount 
your board is permitted to appropriate in the new year. And this document is often what triggers people to begin those finalizations of their permanent appropriations because now you know your limit has been certified. All right, do we have any questions about those items, specifically those items? So checking the fund, uh, cash summary by fund, verifying those amounts, year in balance certificate, the software will produce that for you. As long as you've done things in order, you are going to pull in the correct figures. There's no questions coming in. That's pretty straightforward. I'm going to go ahead and move forward. We're going to stop again in a, a couple of minutes for a question slide so I can take anything coming in uh, within these subjects. All right. Now, you're not finished. You think, well, I closed the year I submitted. I'm done. You're not done. There are annual requirements you don't want to forget about. Of course, submitting through UAN is required. So I'm talking specifically uh, to the disk mailers. So um, we've got a lot of townships in outlying areas, and they don't have strong enough internet to upload. They have to mail us a disk, and they know that's it's old school. They don't have a choice because they don't have strong enough internet. So you've got to get that disk to us within 60 days after 1231. That's going to be March 1st. And I need you to understand that your receive date is your filing date. So it could take the post office 60 days to get that to us. This happens every year. So it doesn't, uh, it doesn't, uh, you could have proof that you mailed it, but if we don't receive it, we can't do anything about that. I, if it were me in your shoes, I'd be sending that thing overnight, return receipt requested, or send it UPS so I could get a tracking number. And if you're mailing a disk, don't just stick it in one of those cardboard mailers that used to work because now we get a lot of disks in the mail crushed. Yep, crushed in bits. We can't, we can't get data off a crushed disk. So I think I'd save a small box for Christmas and I would put that disk in a cardboard mailer, put some padding in there, and send it with a tracking number, return receipt requested. So you keep track of when you put it in and then you know when to look on your e-services account. When you get that return receipt back, it says it was delivered to the Auditor of State's office. We then can uh, answer your questions. If you log into your e-services and it says it's not received, it's not received. So it might have been crushed. You might have not identified your entity on the disk, and we don't know whose crushed disk we have. But it's not received until it's actually received. And incomplete filings made on time are not complete. And you're like, what? What's an incomplete filing? You close the year without your notes. <laughs> so, yeah, the last, last year what we saw is when people tried to file with something other than notes, the Hinkle system rejected it as an incomplete filing and sent them an email, and we got copies of those. There is absolutely no point. If you don't have your notes finished, why are you closing the year? Uh, you you really are, uh, and especially like on January 3rd, there's just no point. Um, the the temp mode lets you keep January current, uh, and it lets you start posting into February. The only thing you can't do while 22 is still open is the January bank reconciliation, and that is not going to change because the December bank rec still could be uh, deleted at any time. So uh, folks that are cleaning up messes they've inherited are going to be going through a very long process to get that December bank rec posted. So you've got to get your completed annual financial report with notes. If you're filing OCBOA, notes and MDNA filed, and then it will be considered a complete uh, filing requirement. So if you file through internet online, you know, give it, it always says, I think, give three days uh, to check the uh, status. But I think, you know, if you filed at noon on one day, you could check by noon the next day. They process those files pretty darn quickly. Some days, hundreds of them come in at once. It's going to take a little longer to process all those files. But most days, you're getting it that uh, you'll be able to see on the Hinkle system. So you'll log into eServices 
Uh, there is a place to go for Hinkle system, and that's in the urine procedures, where to go. And we tested that with a fiscal officer that we still had the correct path because they change e-services all the time with that, and we don't know it. So the path is in your urine procedures, how to see. And remember, we've told you again and again, you're going to open up that PDF that shows your Hinkle filing, and it's only going to be your combining report and the notes. But we got the whole file. Audit will have the whole file. Hinkle will have the whole file. It's just that PDF just shows those two things. So the, the auditors, if you see those on the Hinkle system, then your entire file was received. So there's no worries about that. Now, what else do you have to do? Don't forget to publish an annual financial report is complete notice in your local paper. So it has to say, for example, we're from, we have our fake Buckeye Township, Franklin County. So my notice would say the annual financial report for 2022 for Buckeye Township, Franklin County is complete and can be viewed by you would put some kind of contact information for the fiscal officer. So in the old days, uh, we would actually have to put our phone number or the office address and office hours. So that's up to you. If you want to put the email address of the fiscal officer on there uh, by contacting the fiscal officer via email or phone, being the township's phone number, then you have completed that. You have shown that your community has a notice that the financial report is complete and can be viewed. How many people will do that? I don't think I had anybody ever respond to that. However, it doesn't matter whether they don't respond. We are required to notify the public. <laughs> Even if they don't care, you have to notify them. So don't forget that one. Audit will cite you if you can't prove you've done that. All right, folks that do Ohio Checkbook, once you get to this point, you now want to certify your year. Now, it is not an automatic event that just happens when you close your year and submit to UAN. We don't do anything with Ohio Checkbook. So look at your year in procedures. It has the complete instructions to follow each year. You will uh, log into our website. There is a process to start. We will send you an email confirming this is what you want us to do. You're going to make that confirmation, and once we receive it, we're going to send your file off to the Ohio Checkbook, but that's not the end. You then need to log into Ohio Checkbook and finalize the process to make that information public. So please read those instructions so you know. we got lots of people that think when they file their year end, it's automatically transferred over to the Ohio Checkbook, and it's not. You have to authorize it, you have to confirm it, and then you have to log into the Checkbook and finalize that release. All right, here's where we put print the 2022 year-end reports. Why do we put it here? Because at any time before you close the year, you could have made changes and it would have been too soon. So some people will know before they close the year, they're gonna print the 2020 year-end reports, but most of you, you want to get to this point. Now this is why it can sometimes be forgotten because right now, all you wanna do is get onto your year-end work. Please don't forget to print this list. Uh, so somebody asked earlier, what list would I use for the 2015 reports if I hadn't, or if I, if I was going to print those before I close the year? Why not just use the same list for 2022 for 2015 below, before you close the year? So that's what I would do if I if I found we didn't have 2015 records. I'd use this list at the end for 2015. Uh, but at this point, you want to be printing those for 2022 to get that under your belt. All right, do we have any questions? Okay, well, uh, Jean says her board will meet on December 28th to reorganize. Is this the problem, not to have the auditor certification of funds? Well, on December 28th, I don't know how you're going to know what your certification of funds is going to be because if you get a bank statement that says December 30th, it's got interest on it, you've given the wrong numbers to the county auditor. So this is... You can't certify your fund balances. Now, you could have an official certificate. The official certificate uh, will limit uh, what you can appropriate in the new year until you get your first amended. So you're not going to be able to certify those final fund balance and carryover encumbrances until you've closed uh, the year. Uh, it's just not possible on December 28th unless you have no interest. And I'm thinking... Who has no interest? <laughs> so I don't even think that's going to be possible uh, to do. 
um, unchecking a fund, so we're on the year-end balance certificate, unchecking a fund that is not budgeted only removes it from the year-end balance certificate. It doesn't do anything to remove a fund. So when we're, we've got a few more things to go through, and then Alex is going to go through how do you remove things from the software. So uh, we're, we're still going to cover that. We're not there yet. Alex is going to cover uh, how to remove things that are not uh, in the system. Um, how do we know if we're in the Ohio checkbook? Why don't you contact the Ohio checkbook? Uh, that would be a good way to find out because if you are if you are the new fiscal officer, you would need to know what they were doing. We couldn't help you with that. We don't know. Uh, what is the Ohio checkbook and what do we have to file? Nobody's going to make you file with the Ohio checkbook. Please read that section in uh, the year-end procedures to understand what that is. Um, it is uh, voluntary, uh, while it, although it is recommended. What format and or reports do you suggest for the documents the public can, can view? Well, the entire annual financial report. So when you are putting a notice in the paper that says the annual financial report for 2022 is complete and available to be viewed, then you want those, those four manual input forms. And again, if you didn't have assets, um, the assets not included, you wouldn't need that one, but everybody's going to have cash reconciliation. Everybody that has debts or capital leases is going to have both of those um, manual debt forms. So you would include those manual forms plus all the AFR reports. Uh, that is a complete annual financial report. Um, and those are the ones that should be viewed if somebody requests the annual financial report. <laughs> somebody let us know they have had one person contact them each year, each year after they publish the financials are ready. So yes, there are people interested in that. Good for you for being ready. Uh, somebody wants to know how to handle a debt refinance on outstanding debt. Talk to local government services. So please understand there are things UAN can't answer. We can tell you how to use the software once local government services has told you what to do. Uh, there are some things that need to be understood more fully. I, I, if you look at your cash summary by fund, so uh, Melinda's asking a, a question about uh, cash balances. Your cash from December 31st carries over to the new year. There's no question about it. Every penny of cash on the cash summary by fund, December 31st, will be your cash in the new year. It's not the same as budget. If you had carryover encumbrances, you need to look at the year in balance certificate. It will show you that the fund balance, the cash balance of the fund, is reduced by the carryover encumbrance adjusted by a couple of other uh, columns. It's, it's all in uh, the training that we do at other times of the year. So every penny of cash carries over your carryover encumbrance and unpaid advances would affect the actual resources available to appropriate. So um, we have um, the, a video on our website called um, How to Manage Your Current Year Operating Budget. And I think that uh, you would find that that starts with that very document, the certification of fund balances at the beginning of the year and what each of those columns means as you're moving forward. And I would recommend watching the beginning of that because that covers what happens to my cash certification if there's carryover encumbrances and moving forward, what does that mean to my budget? Okay, uh, let's go forward here. We've got a couple of other things. Uh, we do have some clients of UAN that have to do the 1095 and 1094 forms. If you are new and you don't know what those are, please log into the um, IRS website and go to Forms and Instructions and find the instructions for these forms and read them. It will tell you how to determine if you are an applicable large employer and a self-insured coverage employer. That's the only people that have to file this, and the IRS determines whether you are required to file them. We don't make that determination. So read the instructions, then you will know if it applies to you. 
If you have to do these forms, you're going to go to payroll reports and statements, external forms, 1095 and 1094 forms, and the instructions, step-by-step -step instructions are down at the bottom under FAQs. Uh, so these, we're just giving you the instructions how to use the UAN software to complete the forms. If you don't read the instructions from the IRS, then you're going to be spending a whole lot of time frustrated because you're putting in the wrong information and it won't let you move forward because you are contradicting yourself. Please read the IRS instructions and the software step-by-step -step instructions to understand how to use the software to complete these forms. Uh, if you want to watch a video, we still have a video on our website that will cover the use of uh, completing these forms in the software. Uh, you want to look at the IRS website and instructions to see what your deadlines are. We don't keep up with that and they could change them every year. So take a look at those IRS instructions to see if you have to. You can watch the video and there's a booklet that goes along with this presentation. Uh, just really quickly refresh your memory if you have to do this every year. It's not intuitive. Uh, so make sure you understand the process. All right, now that we're in the new year, <laughs> this part comes along. I get my first amended certificate back from the county auditor. Um, so I've got my amended certificate, I stick it in my file, and I'm done. No, no. Do you know uh, county auditor's office employees make mistakes too? We're all human. You need to compare that with your UAN software. Not only that, your county has the authority to tweak your numbers. <laughs> we had some folks whose county would not certify the second trench of their ARPA money in that in, last year because it wasn't included in the tax budget. Well, the tax budget was filed in July, and then the ARPA money came in in August and September. So you couldn't have put it on your on your budget, and that's the way some counties roll. They won't certify things. Uh, on the first amended certificate, they're going to make you wait till their policy says you can add it to an amended certificate. So you have to look and see if they certified your numbers. So um, when I get that amended certificate back in UAN, I go to accounting, reports and statements, budgetary reports, and I'm going to select all my funds, resources available for appropriations, the first report on that drop down list, and I'm going to print that puppy out and I'm going to check the far right column of the resources available for appropriation. And I'm going to compare it to the amended certificates far right column. Now I do realize there's some counties that round up to the nearest dollar. So if, you're, if your county rounds up, you're going to see differences up and down just based on that rounding. But if they're certifying to the penny, the far right column of both of those forms should be identical. If not, why not? Did your county's office just make a mistake typing in a number or did they choose to not certify money that you hadn't had issued on your first, that official certificate that was certified before year end? So you have to know your county's procedures. We can't tell you what those are about certifying new money after that official certificate is authorized. So you want to make sure your UAN software matches your amended certificate. If it doesn't match and it's just a typo to the county, you contact them, they'll fix it, send you a new one, ta-da. But if they are purposely not certifying revenue that they don't think they should certify yet, then you need to back those budgets out of your system. And if you need help with that, you call the support line. We'll walk you right through it. There is a way to make that amendment. All right, so then permanent appropriations. So throughout, we've got some, uh, when do I put in permanent appropriations? What do they do to the temporaries? Well, let's say I close the year on January 27th, okay? And I sent the certification off to the county. I got my amended certificate back before my February meeting. And we already have available our amended certificate, so I know exactly the total amount we could appropriate. It doesn't mean we will appropriate 100%, but I could. But I do know real numbers at this point. So we adopt our permanent appropriations in February. Now, remember, our temporaries were initially issued for the amount we thought we would need for the first quarter of the year. And now my, my permanents have been adopted before that. And all that means is your, your permanent appropriations 
are going in and covering up. So any purchase orders you have in place on the temporaries, when you put in your permanents, they are now encumbering the permanents. There is no horrible uh, process of I have to close those POs. You don't. So in the software, you're going to go to accounting, maintenance, appropriation budgets, click the add button, choose permanent, and of course now uh, we'll get a couple of people send in, what if we didn't adopt temporaries? Well, then you're going to add the permanents when they're adopted. It's as simple as that. So in this case, my example is we had temporaries as soon as we received our amended certificate because my county turns that around timely. We're going to adopt our temporary, our permanents and I'm going to add them in the software as permanent appropriations. So very simple. The form is just like when you're adding temporaries. When you choose permanents, you are going to choose a fund, put in all its permanent appropriations, the whole year's permanent appropriations, uh, put in the effective date, the date your board adopted them, and that's it. Now, you always want to check. <laughs> you guys get interrupted a hundred times a day. Uh, we can tell this because you're on the phone with us during support lines of people who are in your office and out of your office asking you questions. You have to go to the window and take care of a customer. Please check your numbers. So we get people calling up in July and August. And it's like, my appropriations aren't what we adopted. How come you didn't know that? months ago because you're busy you get interrupted a thousand times so you really want to have on your plate I'm gonna verify my appropriation budget so I recommend going back to that budgetary report and choosing from the drop-down list so the same accounting reports budgetary reports but this time from the drop-down list choose comparison of budget and appropriated because I want a bigger picture and the last three columns on the right are going to be important the rest of this year it's very important to verify. So what I'm going to look at is the final appropriation number because the, the column that says total estimated resources, that identical number matches my amended certificate. I have already verified that, remember? When the amended certificate came back, that column exactly matches. I have no worries about that. Now I'm verifying, did I put in the appropriations my board has adopted? If you got interrupted and you put in only half of the appropriations of a fund and you saved it, you're not going to match your legislation. You have to go in and put in the other half as uh, a, apply as correction just because the permanent appropriations weren't fully entered. So we need to know that this number exactly matches. The number of times we talk to somebody um, all year long that does not know if the appropriations you in UAN are what the board adopted is is uh, shocking, uh, folks. So you want to make sure right at the at the beginning of the year you know these numbers are right. Now the variance column is important to you. If you don't appropriate 100%, variance means that's your resources available for appropriation that are still available to be appropriated. They haven't been appropriated yet. So the amount on your amended certificate that has not been appropriated. Now. Unless you are under fiscal watch and fiscal emergency, there should be no negatives in the variance column. Negatives mean you appropriated more than you were allowed by your amended certificate, and that's a problem. So you should have positive numbers, meaning you did not appropriate 100% of your money. Okay, we've got some questions in here. Uh, do you have to inform the county of your permanent appropriations like you do the revenue? Uh, you you have to send a copy of your appropriations adopted by the board every single time you are changing the total of your appropriations. So a copy of the temporary appropriation legislation needs to go to the county auditor. A copy of your permanents needs to go to the county auditor. Anytime you change the total appropriations of a fund, you need to send a copy of that. Now, I have had some people that tell me their county does not need to see reallocations. So if you're moving appropriations from one account code to another within the general fund, it doesn't change the total. Most counties don't want a copy of that. They don't care unless it's changing the total. But some counties do want to see that. So you have to know your county's um, processes. But yes, every time new appropriations are adopted, a copy of that legislation goes to your county. Okay, uh, here's a good question. Uh, on the year-end reports that should be printed, are these for a complete year or just as of the last month? That is actually a very good question because every month 
you print a certain number of reports for each month, right? You do the bank rec, you print the reports, you take them to the meeting. Lots of people forget their December reports. Don't forget your December reports because you're going to take those to the January meeting just like you always have. So that was a really good question. You always want to do your December normal reports that you do every single month, but your uh, annual reports that we're recommending are for the whole year. And whether you take those to a meeting and give them to your governing board or not, those are records you should be keeping. I think we've covered what reports suggested for the public can view. Uh, the format of it, if somebody sends in a request to see a copy of your payments, you could always save that as a PDF and email it to them. Uh, if they want physical copies of things like a receipt, they're going to be coming in the office and paying for receipts. But if they want a receipt report, you could always save. There's a lot of reports that can save as PDF. Even all of those annual financial reports, can be saved as PDF so you could email them off, but you still need a physical copy for your public records. So um, I think we're seeing two different things. You have to keep records of your entity. There is just no question about that. There has to be records kept. But if somebody requests something, you can send them out as a PDF. Even if you've got a printed copy, you, you have to offer them the ability to do PDF. Uh, guys, if I'm running out of time, someone needs to speak up. <laughs> so I'm sure they'll keep an eye out on me. I've got some more questions to ask uh, that are being asked. And it looks like the uh, we have some people reporting they got the 2023.1 update email already. So just to give everybody a heads up there. Thanks, Alex. So the emails went out. Uh, don't stop watching the year in presentation because Alex is going to cover how to remove old things in the software so you don't have to look at those old funds and account codes. Um, and I'm going to let uh, Alex go on with that last section instead of stopping because um, people are putting in more questions that are about broader things and um, we can answer those once we've completed all the material. So Alex, are you ready to go to the next section? Let's do it. All right, take it over. All right, the show must go on, but this is everybody's favorite part. So how do you get rid of those pesky old bonds you're tired of looking at? We get a lot of questions in the middle of the year, how to remove these funds. And now in 2023 is new and fresh. It is the perfect time to remove those. So prerequisites to remove an old fund. We've got a couple to go over here. The fund must have a zero carryover balance into 2023 and have no transactions beginning of the year so perfect and if you're looking to remove it then you know it has a zero balance the fund cannot have any revenue or appropriation budget entries so if you want to remove the fund don't enter in a budget for 2023 the fund cannot be used in any 2023 created document and the fund needs to be remo removed from the year-end balance certificate to do that you go to budget transactions the year-end balance certificate, you're going to print and then delete that form. So those are your prerequisites. Now let's talk about how to actually do it. So first you want to remove your old accounts and we'll start with the revenue side. So if you go to accounting, maintenance, and then revenue accounts, you're going to change your status to all and then you're going to carefully select and remove all the revenue accounts associated with that old fund that you're looking to remove. We'll do the same for the appropriations accounts. So you go to accounting, maintenance, appropriation accounts, change the status to all, and carefully select and remove all the appropriation accounts associated with that old fund. Once that's done, it's time to actually remove the old fund. Same kind of place, so accounting, maintenance, then you're going to go to funds, change the status to all, then you're going to carefully select that one fund and remove it. And that is how easy it is to remove old funds. Guys, you've been a wonderful audience today. We appreciate the interaction and questions. I know it's been great for all the presenters here. I want to remind you to self-report your training. So on the Auditor of State's website, if you go to training, you're going to go to the Fiscal Integrity Act. You're going to log in and self-report. And now we will turn it back over for all remaining questions. So any topics? Okay, uh, so I'm going to go back to those questions that were being asked. <laughs> I did answer a couple of them, <laughs> uh, but nobody heard me. So 
Uh, I'm going to go back to the uh, pending folder. And I did answer, I was talking about, uh, Stephen sent a question, it's a very good question. And it's, there's a lot of confusion about temporary mode, carryover POs, permanent appropriations aren't going to be adopted until later when we're dealing with our temporaries. Stephen had a very good question. So listen carefully so you're not confusing. Stephen says we have blanket POs for vendors for the year or the power company, for example. And that's not a bad thing, except he knows when he rolls over and opens up temp mode and puts in what the board adopted for temporary appropriations, when he goes to duplicate those POs, the POs from last year were for the full year. They won't put in until the permanents were adopted. So maybe his entity, they didn't do temporaries, but he is definitely doing them this year. So all that means, Stephen, is you would need to um, you can duplicate them, but they're going to land in the batch with too much appropriation. And that's where you, you want to print. Uh, you put in those temporary appropriations, and if you print your appropriation status in 2023, you will see how much you have. And then as you're going through those duplicated POs, you're going to see the software is not going to let you post them. You're going to get the insufficient unencumbered balance. So you simply edit it and reduce the amount to the amount of your temporary appropriations and save it. Then it's going to post. And then when your permanents are adopted, you're going to, you could still use what's left on that temporary. It's just like a six of one, half dozen of the other people close the temporary POs. The POs open during temporaries. They're not actually temporary POs. You could keep spending against those POs. So the, what you, you've got a choice to do is close them, and add the new POs for the rest of the year. And again, put in your permanents, print the appropriation status. You now see the new unencumbered balance. Duplicate the POs, but this time you are duplicating uh, for the larger amount again, and then you will edit them in the batch to reduce. From this point, next year, you will have POs that were during temporary appropriations to duplicate. So one year of this process will give you those items. Now remember, uh, regular BCs, you can't have two open for the same time period. So if you're using regular BCs, uh, there's nothing wrong with that, but you would want to close the PO on the temporary before you open the PO on the permanent. Um, super BCs can be used for regular recurring items, but everything that you do on a BC is not necessarily a regular recurring item or professional service. So make sure you understand the requirements for you do that. So uh, if it is a super BC, you can have two on the same account code at the same time. So that was a very good question, Stephen. And lots of folks that are going to start doing temporary appropriations are going to be faced with that very same thing. They're going to have to reduce the amounts on those first POs. Uh, Rhonda, here's a good question. Is it all right and safe to remove the original coronavirus fund that has a zero balance, You're never going to use it again? Well, the only reason that somebody, lots of people have kept that on purpose is because then they got ARPA funds. Now, in the UAN software, if you had removed the first coronavirus series fund uh, in, in the series and then you got the ARPA fund, it would have given you the same fund number and they wouldn't have wanted that. So some people kept that original CARES Act coronavirus fund uh, as a placeholder. But uh, now I'm not sure that's necessary because most people that coronavirus relief fund has been audited. And <laughs> I hope we don't have any new coronavirus series grants. But that's why some people kept them as that just that little placeholder. You can, you can remove all the revenue and appropriation accounts if you want to keep that fund as a placeholder, but there's no reason to, um, if you had to add another coronavirus relief fund, fingers crossed we won't have to do that. Uh, we could add that first one back in as a placeholder and then move forward. So, uh, yes, it's all right and safe to remove a zero balance original CARES Act fund from your system. Okay, here's a good question. Can we talk about the paying of bills that are from the prior year but come in during the new year? Uh, these can be paid from the temps. Well, 
Steve, you're, if you if somebody makes a purchase in 2022, but the bill is not going to be paid in, until 23, you should be carrying over the purchase order. And in that case, it's not going to hit the 2023 temporary appropriations using them up. It's going to carry over and use uh, the 22 appropriations it was intended for. That's the whole reason that you carry over uh, appropriations. The whole point of it is I know someone made a purchase, therefore I have to carry over the purchase order. Um, okay, if I, a PO is a zero balance in 2022, can I just close it and it won't affect the duplication process? Um, POs show up in the duplication form whether they're zero or not. So you will see a history of POs in the duplicate form. You only select the ones you want to duplicate. So even though you've got a zero balance PO right now, it was originally added as an amount on it. And that's what you're going to see in the duplicate process. Uh, again, it's a don't duplicate something you don't need. For example, if your final loan payment was in 2022, why would you duplicate that PO in the new year? You don't. You only duplicate what you need. Uh, what funds are available to appropriate for temporary appropriation? Um, you're going to have to look at your official certificate certified by your, your county auditor. Uh, so if you filed a tax budget or somebody filed a tax budget, they sent, the county sent you an official certificate. That official certificate limits the amount you are allowed to appropriate in the new year before you get your first amended certificate. It's as simple as that. Um, what funds are allowed to carry over? What isn't? It isn't like that. What is allowed to carry over is what should carry over. Somebody purchased something based on a blanket certificate that was open in December or a particular PO. Let's say we get a contractor, uh, like the example we had for the uh, fire inspection, fire equipment inspectors. Uh, we thought we were going to have to pay $1,650 for the uh, inspection of all of our oxygen tanks. Well, to be honest, what happened is we got rid of all the old tanks and we bought new tanks. They weren't required to be inspected. And we only needed $450 to carry over. So we reduced the PO. You, there's a reason you're carrying over PO. You know you have a bill to pay. Uh, so... That's, that's the whole point of a carryover. There isn't, the regulations are different for each thing. Uh, Year-end balances. I think the sound was off when I, when I answered this question, and I didn't know the sound was not going through. Um, a resident came into the office and asked about the year-end balances carryover and increasing my appropriations. Uh, Melinda, I just highly recommend you go watch the video on our website, How to Manage Your Current Year Operating Budget, because um, I mean, we really need to bear down to the basics. This isn't about year end. You have to understand cash in fund accounting. Where does it start? Where does it come from? And I think the beginning of that video would help you understand um, how that works. And you could actually, if those videos are on our website, you can actually show a resident the website and they could watch that video if that's helpful at all. You have to be able to understand uh, what fund accounting is, what cash is, what encumbrances are, what budgets are. So it's, that's a very complicated question. I, I just can't answer everything uh, that could be known about carryover cash balances because it's going to depend if you have encumbrances. Somebody made a point, if you report to the Ohio checkbook every month, uh, you should not have to have a UAN annual file. Well, that's correct. Only the folks that are filing annually have to choose to file annually. Um, I just don't think that the monthly filers are going to be confused about that. It's the annual filers that at this point in the year when they close uh, the prior year, they're going to say, yeah, how did I handle that, uh, getting that over to the Ohio checkbook? Uh, and that's always in the year-end procedures. Is it possible to view the ACBOA statements before both posting the bank reconciliation just to get an idea of some budgetary numbers? Absolutely. Uh, that was a good question because um, you can look at them 
But if certain things aren't done, you will get a message that says these aren't final, but doesn't mean you can't still look at them. So the software would let you look at those reports before they are final numbers. Uh, the county sends the first amended certificate to you after you send them the year-end certified balance. Think about that. There is no way for the county to know that you what your actual cash balances are December 31st until you close the year and certify them. And that's that document, that year, what we call the year in balance certificate that has a much longer name. So yes, that's the document that, that goes to the county that then generates that first amended certificate. Money cannot be carried over as temporary appropriations. Temporary appropriations are a budget. Cash is carried over as cash. So budgets and cash are not the same thing. Uh, what forms need to be purchased other than the 1099? The 1099. If you have to do 1099s, you need to get those forms. Uh, the training department, what will the title be for the Fiscal Integrity Act reporting? Um, I know you guys can unmute yourself and answer that question. We never know the answer to that. What is going to be the name of this training? Okay, Phyllis, if you remove a fund before 2023, can that fund stay in the system? Well, let's talk about that. So, like, uh, let's say... Hi, Trina. Can you hear me? I can. This is our training department. Courtney? Hi, Trina. They will be able to search... Hi, Trina. They will be able to search 2022 UA end year end training, and it should pop up, and they can select it from there. Okay. Thanks very much. <laughs> Okay, Phyllis, ask the question, if I remove a fund uh, before 23, well, if you're in 22 and you've got funds that have had no activity, they don't have any budgets on them, they have no money in the balance, and they didn't as of January 1st, and they've not been used in any document, they can be re removed now. But there's too much that goes on that makes them used. So I would think it would be odd that you had funds that were not used <laughs> at this point in time. It's possible. Uh, but if you remove the fund, it doesn't change the fact that you will still be able to look at prior year reports. And I think that's, that's what the question was leading to. If I remove a fund in 2023, can I still get a prior year report in 2022 that showed its final activity? Yes, you can. Anything that was posted in a prior year is still going to be seen on those prior year reports, even though that fund has been removed in the in the new year. Now, here's a good question. So, Michelle asked the question, and this is a diligent fiscal officer. Everybody is, uh, they've got a cooperative relationship with all their workers. Nobody goes out and spends money without making sure a blanket certificate or POs in pace. She made sure her POs uh, were the exact carryover balance. She closed 2022 and Diagon if she didn't get a bill in the mail, somebody bought something without telling him and there's no carryover PO. Well, Michelle, when that happens, you're just going to do a then and now. So you have to look at your appropriate, then and now means back then when they should have told me about this and got a PO, there were appropriations in place. So you can't just do a then and now just because it, it's not there. Then and now means there really was appropriations available back then. They just didn't tell me about it. And so you would do a then and now in 2023. It'll use 2023's appropriations. And it's too late if, I mean, it shouldn't be more than your current year appropriations uh, for an account code. I mean, that's that's way too much spending. But, you know, I'm thinking that, you know, somebody's gone off to Lowe's and charged something on the credit card without telling you. So you didn't. Uh, carry over an encumbrance for that. So um, you have to use 23 appropriations. After 22 is closed, you can't do anything with 22 appropriations. You're going to have to use 23 appropriations in a then and now PO. And the then and now PO doesn't go back and grab 22 appropriations. All it's showing an auditor is somebody didn't do what they should have done and broke the law when it comes to encumbering. And I'm afraid the fiscal officers tend to get dinged for that when it's not you that did it. So that was a very good question. So if you've done all you can to make sure those uh, bills were accounted for, POs were carried over, and then something comes in late, all you can do is pay it uh, from your current year appropriations in the new year. 
Okay. I can't remember if the if the volume uh, the sound was off when this came about. Uh, can you talk about paying bills that are from a prior year but come in during the your the new year? Those are paid from temps. No, they're not. If a purchase was made in 22, there ought to be an encumbrance for it that is carrying over to pay the bill. And then if there wasn't, then I'm afraid you'd be doing that then and now, like I just said with Michelle. Then and now means, dang, somebody didn't have an appropriation place. Okay, some of these are very entity specific and will confuse way too many people. Uh, so we've got it. We're we're things we're putting in a follow up file. You might get an email uh, that says, "Here's the answer to your question," or we're going to need to talk to you to get some more specifics. So some of these I can't read out loud because they're too entity specific. Uh, here's a good one. Uh, Kathy says, can old investment accounts like Star Plus with zero balances be removed? Kathy, when you close the Star Plus account, you should have closed it in UAN. It will automatically not show up on the next bank reconciliation. And I've seen this when we're connecting to the computer for newbies. We're looking at their bank rec, and there's 15 CDs with zero balances. And they say, yeah, those things were closed years ago and the former fiscal officer was not closing them in UAN. When an investment closed at the bank, it needs to be closed in UAN. If it's a CD that's rolling over, there is a close item rollover process. So when something closes at the bank, it has to close in UAN, and then there's one, that last bank reconciliation, it shows up on, it's a zero balance, and it doesn't appear anymore and then as you go into the next year anything that has been closed in the prior year won't even show up in the new year so Kathy I think somebody left your system uh, not managed properly that was a good question because I keep seeing a lot of those um, um, what if you don't have enough money in 22's appropriations when you receive a bill to pay in 23? Well, that's a problem. That means somebody spent money without appropriations in place. Uh, I mean, that's a lot of things. Uh, that's That would be a good time to call <laughs> local government services and tell them what you've got. So could you reallocate appropriations? Blah, blah, blah. There's a lot of coulds and woulds, but what we really need to do is talk about reality when it happens rather than what ifs. So... You want to be letting your your uh, employees know that any expenditures they make, they have to make now. Uh, they've got to tell you what you're doing. Uh, we've got people that are confusing what the amended certificate is. The amended certificate is the total amount you are allowed to appropriate. So you send the certificate of fund balances and expenditures blah, 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 to the county auditor. They send you back the amended certificate. That shows you the total amount you are allowed to appropriate. It doesn't, it's not the same thing. So the operating budget each year has two components, the amount you are allowed to appropriate and the amount your board did appropriate. Um, some of the questions are really unclear what, what the end meaning should be. Now, any PO that is closed in 22, regardless of balance, will it affect the ability to duplicate that PO? Absolutely not. POs from the prior year will show up in the duplicate button. So let's say last year you contracted with Lawn Service USA to do all of your mowing because your employees, uh, you can't keep employees to do that anymore. You're going to contract it out to a landscaping company. And you weren't really happy with that company. And in, you've, they've already figured out who they're going to use in 2023, but it's not that company. You can still duplicate the PO and change the vendor. 
before you post it. You just wouldn't want to post it. So remember, when you hit duplicate, you are sending them to the batch where they are a starting point, not an ending point. You have to evaluate those POs in the batch before you post them. Oh, that was a good question, Cassie. I asked this same question of my first auditor, you know, back when the dinosaurs were roaming the earth. Uh, but it was a very good question. He told me at the time, what about utility bills that cross years? For example, electric bills, uh, when you get your January electric bill, how are you going to know whether it ends in December or ends in 2023? And how many kilowatt hours belong to each year? You can't know that. So what my auditor told me, and again, this is an up to evaluation up to interpretation of an individual auditor, but what he told me back in 1990 was, good question, this is the way I audit it. And it's not going to be the same for every auditor. He said, you pretty much pay 12 utility bills a year. Every single month you're paying an electric, a telephone, as long as you aren't paying 13 utility bills or 11 utility bills. I'm going to let that slide. So what he told me was, go ahead and close the utility POs in December and in January pay the new utility bills off the brand new PO in the new year. And while that made very good sense to me, I know some of you probably got dinged at audit because, again, that's up to interpretation of the auditor. And that auditor was telling me that, you know, this is the way he audits them. So some people carry over their utility uh, POs from the prior year, and other people close those after the last utility pay in, in uh, 22 and then open the new ones to pay the new year bills as they come in. Uh, you'll have to use your judgment on that because, again, that is open to interpretation. Uh, I don't see any more questions. That's it. You've been a wonderful audience. There were some really good questions. If you have uh, any questions, remember, you can call the support line. Don't forget to print out in your year-end uh, folder for the 2023-point unrelease the UAN support hours for the upcoming year. So you can see when we're using um, the extended hours, uh, because that means extra time uh, during the week and extra extended hours on the weekend. And you guys want to make sure you know when you can get us. We know that the year end is a difficult time. Don't hesitate to call us or email us with questions. Uh, the call volume has already gone up to super speed. Uh, so uh, the time we've had to spend an hour on the phone working out a problem is gone. We've got too many people waiting on hold. But we will do our best to get you on track. And then you call back the next time you have a question. If there's anything you want to re-watch in this presentation, remember this video is going to be on our website. Um, give us about a week to do that. And then you could just pull it up, go to the section on your uh, following the best practices. Remember, that was the order we did. You just follow that order, find that section, re-watch that. But don't forget your year-end procedures are the complete and total instructions. And a lot of your questions would be answered by looking at those. So I don't want you to spend three hours looking for the year and procedures. If you can't find it in 10 minutes, you call. We're here to help. So thank you, thank you, thank you for being an excellent audience, uh, your wonderful questions, and for being attentive for so long. Uh, the whole group is already off UAN Island, and uh, we'll see if we can't use that again sometime. <laughs> I think we're ready to close out. Uh, the webinar. All right. Thanks, Trina.